Okay, David here. Welcome back. Week in review. Sorry, I'm a little late. I caught up with something. So, uh, looks like everything's working. So, Dave, good to see you. Arnie, shalom. Uh, Michael, shalom. If you're around, uh, Michael, uh, I think we're on tomorrow, at three o'clock, to uh, finish up the morning chakra service. So, look forward to that tomorrow. If you're around and you want to hop on and join, I guess, Dave, if you want to, uh, Happen also a little later, so I had a lot you know, more to cover. So uh, I've, I've been doing a lot of research and you know, week in review. It's uh, you know tough uh, just uh, solo, so uh, didn't have that much to share. Let me do just a quick few links that I had to share. I had actually a substantial amount of research, so I feel good about pounding through a bunch of research and doing a lot of studying and. Uh, so let's just look real quick. Claire Kaw wrote uh, wrote a book, Secular Quranism, the New Moral and Legal System for the West and the Rest. So uh, I didn't purchase this yet. I was a little bit busy, but uh, you know, good for Claire. She put herself together and wrote like a hundred page book on secular Quranism. So hopefully, I'll uh, you get a hold of a copy of this and uh, look through. Maybe we'll interview Claire after but I, I was too busy this week to uh look into it so you know, anybody who knows claire and interested in this you know check out her book your rune shalom thanks for tuning in so uh roger waters big uh you know big news in uh you know the various uh, anti-semitism spheres and uh you know the concerts and, and the various things so Pink Floyd was definitely, The Wall was definitely one of my favorite albums. I listened to that tens, maybe even over a hundred times, many times driving in New York, uh, even like later as a kid, young kid. So ironic, uh, you know, The Wall, the commentary, uh, you know, Deborah Lipstadt even coming out officially now the, the United States government calling uh, Roger Walters anti-Semitic and hear his response. Um, Apple's new... Vision Pro, so uh, thirty five hundred dollars. The goggle pair that I guess you know, as opposed to like a, a full headset, this one would actually be like glasses you could see through, and it had a lot of interesting things. So Cold Fusion, I've been sharing that channel a little bit. They had a lot on uh, Chat uh, GP GP three, but you know, interesting thing. It looks like they have an eye tracker, so that you could see what's going on with i mean that they could read like a mouse uh like some sort of finger movement and then it would track your eyes so they're like different ways of operating it but it could literally know what you want to do on the screen like a mouse through an eye tracker and uh, you know the computer and various things thirty five hundred dollars so you know i'm not sure if it's publicly out for purchase or they just released the the model in various scanners so interesting technology so Mark Zuckerberg was on Facebook. I mean, was on Lex Friedman this week, uh, talking about that, uh, various things, and in, in his meta version, which uh, probably isn't as good. Like the meta version is more like uh, you're just like uh, virtual reality, as opposed to the Apple is more glasses that you, know, as opposed to having a monitor, would have some sort of visible on screen. And it seemed that uh, it had pretty good reviews. So uh, you know, we'll see. Maybe Duvid will get a pair in the next coming months if it makes sense i don't know if you'd stream from it um you know like a camera or whatever that uh you know it'd be interesting to see the new technology um i was watching this earlier um Mish mishua kaku was has a new book on quantum supremacy and uh insights on the latest of quantum uh, technology quantum computing um, although he seemed kind of like a salesman for the technology, so as opposed to just like kind of explaining things, it was it was kind of like a salesman saying about all this stuff that it would do. So uh, I did a stream, two streams this week. I did uh, tour the library chess books, which uh, I plan to try to give away. Most we discussed that last week. So anyone who wants to see my chess books could uh, check that out and. Uh, you know, leave open so when I get into chunking theory. So I have a lot of uh, 
interesting things. We, you know, we talk about chunking theory. I try to give a little talk about chunking theory, and uh, you know, then I'll go into that. Let me just uh, get this ready. So. Rabbi Wolfson, who I've mentioned many times that I studied under a student of the Lubavitch Rebbe, met with the uh, you Rabbi uh, with the the mayor Eric Adams of New York, and uh, about the yeshiva education. So big debate in uh, the requirements. So Eric Adams has held his promise uh, clear and has not required the yeshivas to institute the certain level of secular education in the schools. And uh, so Rabbi Wolfson, who's generally not a political rabbi, uh, I think he's 98 years old. I've mentioned many in my series of Hasidus, uh, Rabbi Wolfson quite a bit, and, and also with, uh, my series with Michael on the introduction to Hebrew prayer and to the prayers. So let me just... Uh, put that up also so this week's uh stream with michael the introduction to jewish prayers so uh some got relatively good viewership so we did the shimon Esrei, the silent prayer and so hopefully this uh next week we'll finish it up with uh the prayers uh the reading from the prayers we're reading from the torah we'll go halal and uh, in some of the conclusion prayers, Elena the Shabak and uh, and uh, and Kalkenu and uh, the other Kedusha, so uh, the Psalm of the Day, so a little more to look at. But uh, Eric Adams has honored his commitment to not force different standards on the yeshiva. So he met Rabbi Wilson, who uh, together with the leading rabbis thanked the mayor for following through on his commitment. So ironically, Naftali Muster. A, I'm so good to see you also. So um, if anyone wants to hop on and talk a few minutes also, I have a lot of stuff to get through, but if someone wants to talk and uh, say what they're up to, um, I'll put uh, the link in the chat. Um, so Naftali Muster of Yafid, who is the advocate of, you know, like forcing uh, yeshivas to have a higher secular uh, level of education. So ironically, his father and Rabbi Wilson are neighbors. Um, so just uh, like ironic, and even uh, Rabbi Wilson started a Munasis rule in Naftali Master's father's synagogue. So just a little interesting history there on 46, 41st Street and 16th Avenue for people who know Borough Park. But Rabbi Wilson, uh, you know, may live and be well, 98 years old, meeting with the mayor, being uh, you know chosen as the emissary of the rabbi and community leaders to meet with uh, the mayor. Um, this was an interesting book. I'm, I'm going through my, so you know, like I have a whole bunch of stuff on chess that I plan to go through. And so I'm just going to share this and I'm deleting it from my files. I read through it as interesting things. And this is, uh, Frontiers Magazine Psychology. And this was about, uh, mental imagery. And so, you know, very interesting things about how the brain processes images. So, uh, you know, interesting reading material. I thought maybe to go through in more depth. And it's also St uh, Stephen Kostlin, who I was talking about, like, like Jeffrey Epstein, the Harvard Center of uh, Evolutionary Crypsis. So uh, some interesting articles. This is from 2013. Um, also in the news this week was... Uh, Deep Mind, so Deep Mind uh, of uh, um, oh sorry, this is something else. So this was just God forbid Generation X in retirement funds. So God forbid Generation X has no money. Um, you know, shown that uh, a huge percent of people in Generation X are going into retirement and have less than ten thousand dollars saved. That uh, um. Close to half of Generation Xers have close to nothing saved for retirement, and uh, you know, will be entering retirement age in the next few decades. And with the current economy or wages, it might be unlikely that they're going to have. So, different factor. I'm not going to focus on it too much, but we can review. 
but uh, you know, interesting, just economic. Uh, so be wise, make good financial decisions, make that money, save the money, prepare for retirement, because you know America is in many ways headed for a disaster all over the place, and even financially. Uh, you know, the, and I've I've shared occasional things with like the generation, the boomers retiring. So I just saw this this week. It was interesting. Um, so Google DeepMind new algorithms to transform the foundations of computing. So the Alpha Zero programming uh, programmers of DeepMind have new technology for creation of algorithms. So they they've found new methods of creating more powerful algorithms. So you're hearing a lot about chat GPT and the various uh, um, AI technology. So, you know, I've been talking about it, you know, with Alpha Zero related to the chess program and uh, Alpha Fold. And so they have various programs that uh, DeepMind is working on. And in many ways, the DeepMind is probably the most powerful of all of them. Um, you know, it's also Google related. Um, you know, the chat GPT is the one that most people are using. However, your new fields in sorting mechanisms. So I'm not going to go too much into detail what a sorting algorithm is or why this new sorting algorithm is more powerful than the previous ones. Uh, but you know, for data processing and data searching, that uh, you know, like Google's algorithm in general, that uh, there's a new algorithm on the market, and it was found by DeepMind as more powerful than previous ones. Hey, Memes, good to see you. Um, want to hop on and uh, talk? You could feel free, memes. It's been a while. I'm not sure what you're up to. So it's uh, over two months now streaming without Jennifer. Um, you know, so we'll see what she's up to. But uh, Duvid, we can review solo now for over two months. So you might find this first part interesting, memes. I'm going to talk about chunking theory, and chunking theory is really interesting. I'll relate it back to what I talk about in the cognitive revolution. Um, so, you know, the last few weeks I covered a lot of various history, and I was talking about the cognitive revolution and, you know, Chomsky and the question, was there actually a cognitive revolution? And, you know, there are two cognitive revolutions, and Kuhn and, you know, Dave Douglas joined and were talking about uh, – you know, Lakatos and the various um, uh, things. So uh, theories of the philosophy of science and Kuhn and the scientific revolutions. So this phraseology of the cognitive revolution, like it was a Kuhnian revolution. And so it's kind of disputed, was the cognitive revolution really a revolution in a Kuhnian sense? Um, but you said, like, what actually changed? What were the main developments? And, you know, some of the precursors related to you know, the revolution, so to say, overturning behavioralism. So there, you know, it seems like it may be somewhat political to diminish behavioralism. One thing, overemphasizing how dominant behavioralism was for there to be a revolution, and then to say that behavioralism had been disproven. And so you say, okay, behavioralism was maybe, especially like Skinner in terms of linguistics, that behavioralism was unlikely to explain language in terms of just a stimulus response of, uh, you know, like Pavlovian conditioning that people would learn language. And that's where you had Chomsky with, uh, you know, the birth of uh, linguistics and mental ease. And, but like the complete overturning of, of behavioralism is more of a stretch because behavioralism is still useful and wasn't really disproven. It may be just disproven Skinner's attempt to explain language production or all phenomenon through behavioralism as opposed through cognitive mechanisms. So the cognitive revolution, kind of a misnomer, at least in a Kuhnian sense, but the, you know, the, the main part of the cognitive revolution that it came together with the advent of AI uh, computational techno uh, computer technology and also Shannon's information theory and the application of information theory and uh, computer modeling to the mind. And so when we talk about chunking, chunking is extremely important, although like chunking isn't up there. Like when people think of the cognitive revolution, you know, like Miller is one of the names. And I mentioned like Miller and the historian and he works at Harvard 
probably even more important than Chomsky himself in you know what we consider now the cognitive revolution in Miller 1956 the the short term memory the the uh, magic number seven plus or minus two um, is the 1956 paper and then Miller becomes head of the department of the cognitive psychology at Harvard and uh, it was the big name in the advent of what we call cognitive psychology and chunking theory comes later, like in like, I think 1973 with uh, Herbert and Simon. And uh, you know, so Alan Newell, who presented paper in 1956 and also the father of the cognitive revolution. Um, so chunking theory is one of the initial attempts to model the mind, more specifically memory. So there was language. And we talk about like now, you know, the Chomsky S uh, understanding of how language works. So I have a lot of interesting thought on chunking theory. And so we're going to go in depth into that. And uh, however, first, let me read an interesting paper. And if memes is still here, you will probably find this pretty interesting. So if anyone's familiar with um, Vitaly Ginsburg, and Vitaly Ginsburg won the Nobel Prize in 2003 for superconductivity. And he was a pretty big scientist. He knew a lot of scientists. Like, he lived pretty old. He, like, passed away in 2009 in his 90s. So, you know, he was born in the 1920s. He knew some of the big names, um, like Niels Bohr and uh, has quite a few books in literature. But uh, in somewhat like uh, what um, her, uh, what uh, Hilbert had done, and I covered on my science of uh, on my philosophy of science series, and talked about in week in review pretty often. Hilbert and the the, pro the axiomization project and his main pro uh, problems in mathematics. So Ginsburg, at his speech for the acceptance of his 2003 Nobel Prize tries to talk about the main problems that need to still be solved in physics. And he wrote a book, I'm looking at his book right now, that he talks about writing. So this is Ginsburg published based on his speech, Nobel lecture on superconductivity and superfluidity, what I have and have not managed to do, as well as the physical minimum at the beginning of the 21st century. So um, he talks about some of his achievements that he ended up winning the Nobel Prize for in terms of things like superconductivity and high high temperature superconductivity, because I guess they first discovered superconductivity at much lower temperatures. And then, um, so that's his main area of research, what he, what he made big discoveries in. But he also had thoughts on the general theory of physics. So here's the end of his speech in after the Nobel Prize that was published. So um, Vitaly Ginsburg, who I, I think moved from Russia to America, uh, the physical minimum, what problems of physics and astrophysics seem now to be especially important and interesting at the beginning of the 21st century. I encounter the viewpoint that my work in the area of superconductivity and superfluidity belongs to the remote past. There's no question that the work of Ginsburg and Landau performed back in the 1950s stands out, but it is clear from the foregoing, I have been occupied with the field of physics since 1943 until the present time. In this case, it seems to me several questions have been posed and the problems addressed which have not been solved and which deserve attention. Of course, at present, the most urgent problems in the area of superconductivity are the elucidation of the mechanism and several features of high temperature superconductivity and the development of room temperature superconductivity. More precisely, what is wanted in the latter case is to identify the potentialities and formation conditions of room temperature superconductors. I'm keenly aware that I will not be able to accomplish anything in the last two directions. I would like only to witness as many new findings as possible. This is why in recent years I've been placing progressively stronger emphasis as far as physics is concerned on an educational program which I conventionally call the physics minimum. 
the physical minimum. As far as I know, many young scientists attend Nobel lectures, and therefore I decided to enlarge on this physical minimum. I believe that this will be of great interest to young people than to hear what is going on uh, before they were born. Physics has developed rapidly and fruitfully, especially in the past century. Its space has changed radically even with a, within a human lifespan. I myself was already 16 when the neutron and positron were discovered in 1932. And what would modern physics be without neutrons and positrons? As a result of so rapid a development, physics and the adjacent realms of study have erroneously, enormously expanded both as regards to their basic concerns and the body of information. In the recent past, it was possibly guided with the requirement to know something about everything and to know everything about something. But now it seems to me that this is no longer possible. As the same, At the same time, I'm startled and dispirited when young physicists and sometimes not so young ones restrict themselves to the knowledge in their area and are not informed even in a general way about the state of physics as a whole and its hottest areas. The situation cannot be justified by alleging the absence of a pivot in contemporary physics or its boundlessness. Quite the contrary, physics does not. Uh, physics does have its pivot, which is represented by fundamental concepts and laws formulated in theoretical physics. It is possible on the basics of theoretical physics study during one student's days to understand all modern physics, or more precisely, to understand how matter stand everywhere in physics and be aware of the research situation. Every physicist naturally the this equally applies to other scientists, but I restrict myself to the physicist here should simultaneously know, apart from the theoretical physics, a wealth of facts from different branches of physics and to be familiar with the newest notable accomplishments. We in Russia like to quote a certain uh, Pruchkov, a fictional character who said uh, pompously in particular that there's no way of comprehending the incomprehensible. So one has to choose something. And so I took this path. I have uh, addressed the question, what should a physicist know something about? By making a list of the top problems of the day, any such list is admittedly subjective. It is also clear that it will vary with time. Lastly, it is clear that subjects not included in the list can in no way be regarded as unimportant or uninteresting. It is simply that many of them presently seem less pressing to me. Those who know interesting subjects beyond the list have no reason to be offended and should only supplement to make their own versions of it. I only suggest some enumeration of the questions that, in my view, every physicist should have at least a superficial idea of. This is not as difficult as it might seem at first glance. Uh, the time to be spent for the purposes, I believe, no longer than the time a good student spends preparing for an examination, say, on electrodynamics. Acquaintance with all subjects included in the list is what I call the physical minimum. Of course, this minimum is the echo of the theoretical minimum produced by Landau in the 1930s. The correspondence volume of the course of theoretical physics by Landau and Lipschitz ranks, in my view, highest among the many excellent textbooks on electrodynamics. But a beginner needs help to get acquainted with the physical minimum. Working out this list, as well as commenting on it, is the first step towards this goal. In 1995, the Russian edition of my book's Reflections on the Problems and Personalities of the 20th Century Physics, I managed to work out a rather detailed commentary, but in the English translation, some parts were already out of date, which I failed to compensate for in full measure. Inserted at the beginning of the book, Ginsburg is an article also concerned with the physical minimum. Several additional remarks were introduced in the English translation of the book, which will hopefully be published soon. Should the proposal for a physical minimum meet with support, perhaps new books on the subject will appear. Unfortunately, I cannot set myself to this task, as he's already in his 80s at this point. So what is the physical minimum that a physicist should know about? Here's my list for the beginning of the 21st century. One, controlled nuclear fusion. Two, high temperature and room temperature superconductivity. Three, metallic hydrogen, other exotic substances. Four, two-dimensional electron liquid, the anonymous Hall effect and other effects. Five, some questions of solid state physics, heterostructures and semiconductors, quantum wells and dots, metal dielectric transitions, charge and spin density waves, uh, mesoscopics. Six, second order and related phase transitions, some examples of such transitions, cooling in particular, laser cooling to super, flow te super low temperatures, Bose-Einstein condensation and gases. Seven, surface physics clusters. Eight, liquid crystals, ferroelectrics, uh, uh, ferrotronics. Nine, Fuller-Ennis 
nanotubes, 10, the behavior of matter in super strong magnetic fields, 11, nonlinear physics, turbulence, solutions, chaos, strains, attractors, 12, X-ray lasers, gamma ray lasers, super high power lasers, 11, super heavy elements, exotic nuclei, 14, mass spectrum, quarks and gluons, quantum uh, chromodynamics, quark gluon plasma, 15, unified theory of weak and electromagnetic interactions, uh, bosons, leptons, 16, the standard model, grand unification, super unification, proton decay, neutrino mass, magnetic monopoles, 17, fundamental length, particle interaction at high and super high energies, colliders, 18, non-conservation of CP invariants, 19, nonlinear phenomenon in a vacuum and super strong magnetic fields, phase transitions in a vacuum, 20, strings, M theory, 21, experimental verification of the general theory of relativity, 22, gravitational waves and their detection, 23, the cosmological problem, inflation, uh, the term and quint quintessence relationship between cosmology and high energy physics, 24, neutron stars and pulsars, supernova stars, 25, black holes, cosmic streams, 26, quasars and galactic nuclei formation of galaxies, 27, the problem of dark matter and its detection, 28, the origin of super high energy cosmic rays, 29, gamma ray burst hypernovae, 30, neutrino physics and ast astronomy, neutrino oscillations. The singing out of 30 particular problems as constituting the minimum is, of course, absolutely subjective. Moreover, some of them might be subdivided. In my first such list published in 1971, there were 17 problems. Subsequently, their number grew. Some were the new subjects that might be added would be in the fields of quantum computers and advances in optics, but I cannot do this with adequate comprehension. Any such list undoubtedly will evolve with time as it reflects the development of physics. In my first list, quarks were given only three lines in the enumeration of the attempts to explain the mass spectrum. This did not testify to my perspicacity. However, at the time, in 1970, quarks were only five or six years old of the corresponding hypothesis, and the fate of the concept of the quark was indeed vague. Now the situation is quite different. True, the heaviest T quark was discovered only in 1994. Uh, that earlier list naturally contains no fuller, fullerenes, which were discovered in 1985, and no gamma ray burst. High temperature superconductors were synthesized in 1986 and 7, but do not appear in the list because this problem has been discussed since 1964. Generally, much has been done in physics over the past 30 to 35 years, but I believe not very much that warrants new additions to the list. In any case, two earlier lists, as well as that presented above, characterize to a certain extent the development in the state of physical and astronomical problems from 1970 and 71 to the present day. It should be added that there are three great problems of modern physics that are also to be included in the physics minimum, included in the sense that they should be singled out in some way and specially discussed and their development should be reviewed. This is discussed in some length in the book about science, myself, and others. The great problems are, first, the increase in entropy, time inversibility, and the time arrow. Second is the problem of interpretation of non-relativistic quantum mechanics and the possibility of learning something new, even in the field of its application. I personally doubt this possibility, but believe that one's eyes should remain open. And the third is the questions of the emergence of life, the feasibility of explaining the origins of life, and thought on the basis of physics alone. On the face of it, how could it be otherwise? But until the questions are elucidated, one cannot be quite sure of anything. I think that the problem of the origin of life will unreservedly be solved only after life in a test tube is created. Until then, this will be an open question. <coughs> one more concluding remark. In the past century, and even nowadays, one could encounter the opinion that in physics, nearly everything has been done. There allegedly are only dim cloudlets in the sky or theory, which will soon be eliminated and give rise to the theory of everything. I consider these views as some kind of blindness, the entire history of physics, as well as the state of present day physics, and in particular astrophysics testifies to the opposite. In my view, we are facing a boundless sea of unresolved problems. If only remains for me to envy the younger members of the audience who will witness a great many new, important, and interesting things. So Ginsburg passed away six years later, and you're kind of talking about revolution and Kuhn and the philosophy of science. Um, you know, so this will be, oh, sorry, I didn't uh, share that properly. So that was what I was just reading from. 
So here is the main article I wanted to read. So that was just uh, you know Ginsburg in his own words. So you know the reason I was mentioning that was because it's going to be the direction of we can review and some of the research that we'll be sharing over the next few uh, weeks and months. So I'm going to get up in physics and we talk about Kuhn and revolution. And so this was Ginsburg in 2003, uh, you know, a list that he had been doing for decades, going back to the 1971, about the main problems in physics. So we talked about Kuhn and the natural order of like discovery and trying to move forward in uh, normal scientific discovery. Uh, so what are the main fields of physics where there's still discoveries to be made? However, he mentioned three other great problems and three these three other great problems are really issues that have never been resolved from the beginning of quantum physics, even from the beginning of philosophy. Like the physics was never able to solve these questions and remain the decisive issues of physics and physics understanding to this day. So I have a lot of information on chunking theory, but uh, you know, just to tie it back to someone who I was covering the last few weeks and future direction, I thought I'd read a little bit of this and then it's going to be all chunking from here on in. So this is actually a relatively long article. We'll see. I might even read the whole thing in this uh, a little bit. He talks about the multiple world hypothesis and the extended Everett concept. He was talking about Ginsburg's three problems and the possible solutions. And so this one focuses on Everett's multi-world solution to um, the measurement problem as opposed to the mainstream Co Copenhagen interpretation. So this is by Mensky in uh, 2007. Quantum measurements, the phenomenon of life, and the time arrow, three great problems of physics and Ginsburg's terminology and their interrelation. Relations existing among the three great problems of physics as enumerated by Ginsburg, interpretation of quantum mechanics, the time arrow, and reductionism, reducing the phenomenon of life to physics, are discussed and shown to substantially depend on how the first of them is solved, which interpretation of quantum mechanics is adopted, the Copenhagen interpretation, the Everett multi-many worlds interpretation, and extended Everett concept proposed by the author are considered. So this would go back two weeks ago when I did the deep dive into quantum theories of consciousness, but also general to Kuhnian um, revolutions in science and the current state of physics and the unknowns in physics. At the end of Vitaly Ginsburg's list of the most important problems in physics, we see three problems that are not included on the major list. Listed separately, they are termed by Ginsburg as the three great problems. These are the interpretation of quantum mechanics, the time arrow, the irreversibility of time appearing despite the reversibility of the main dynamic equations, and reductionism, the possibility of reducing the phenomenon of life to physics. Perhaps these are the most challenging problems faced by physicists and, at the same time, the most interesting ones or at least the most exciting. Much has been written concerning these problems, and certainly many significant results have been achieved. It is definitely impossible to give a complete overview of the three great problems. In this short presentation, I only discuss the subject from a single viewpoint, which can be characterized as follows. I will start the analysis of the first of the three great problems, which is the interpretation of quantum mechanics. I will try to show how the relationship among the three great problems look depending on the way the first one is solved by the interpretation of quantum mechanics or another. Whenever one speaks about the interpretation of quantum mechanics, the question is always closely related to quantum measurements, since it is the description of measurements of quantum systems that evokes the problem of interpretation of quantum mechanics. One can therefore reformulate the first great problem as the problem of quantum measurement theory. This theory, among, along with the interpretation of quantum mechanics, is now intensively discussed all over the world, in particular in connection with quantum informatics. The reason is that the applied field of research called quantum information science is based on the same principles as quantum measurement theory, the principles that are closely related to the interpretation of quantum mechanics due to the importance of quantum informatics application. The last decades have seen a revival of interest in the interpretation of quantum mechanics and the rapid advancement of the relevant field of research. At the center of modern study 
in this field is the interpretation of quantum mechanics suggested by Hugh Everett in 1957 and often referred to as the many worlds interpretation. At the same time, the Copenhagen interpretation, the oldest and best verified, has received wide recognition among physicists. It was developed by Niels Bohr in the course of intensive and diff difficult kind discussions with other founders of quantum mechanics, in particular with Albert Einstein. The two interpretations are qualitatively different with other numerous interpretations are just versions of these two and differ from them only in details. In my physics uh, Uspeki paper 2000, I made an attempt to further develop Everett's interpretation. Research in this area was continued later. The resulted extended Everett concept in contrast to the original interpretation by Everett leads to new predictions that relate to the work of consciousness. Moreover, these predictions find experimental confirmation. Below in the analysis of the three great problems, I will rely on the Copenhagen interpretation, Everett's interpretation, and extended Everett concept, EEC. In fact, these concepts are the three ways to solve the first of the three great problems. After briefly characterizing each of the three different approaches to the conceptual problem of, of quantum mechanics, I will trace how the remaining two of the three great problems and the relationship among all three look in view of the different approaches. In other words, interpretation of quantum mechanics will be the starting point for the discussion of first the phenomenon of life and the question of whether it can be explained in the framework of quantum physics, and second the time arrow problem question why, despite the reversibility of quantum mechanical evolution, there is still irreversibility in quantum mechanics. Ginsburg's problems. One of the Distinguishing features of Ginsburg's scientific style is what I would call a systematic approach to science. The systematic approach reveals itself in the work of on the list of the most important problems in physics. In addition to solving specific problems, he has constantly analyzed physics as a whole as well as science as a whole and has always looked for the points of growth in physics and in science in general. They are certainly very important since the future of science grows from current problems. It, today's problems uh, may tomorrow become the center and essence of all physics and a source of new achievement. In any case, this is true for the great problems against which scientists have struggled for many decades, not losing interest. On the other hand, not considering the achieved progress is the final solution. Thus, the three great problems, which Ginberg mentions at the end of his list, can be formulated as the following question. Interpretation of quantum mechanics, what happens during measurement, the phenomenon of life in reductionism, what is life from the viewpoint of physics, the time arrow, where does irreversibility come from? The first problem is called the problem of interpretation of quantum mechanics, but is, the, is in fact is an attempt to find out what happens during measurement. Why during measurement? Because conceptual problems, paradoxes of quantum mechanics present themselves when we try to analyze the process called measurement in terms of quantum mechanics. In classical physics, the description of measurement is very simple, in fact, trivial. Of course, only in principle, when purely technical issues related to the measurement device are ignored. However, it turns out that the quantum mechanical description of measurement causes paradox. It is not at all evident what measuring a quantum system means and what happens in such a measurement. The second problem is the phenomenon of life and reductionism. What is life from the viewpoint of physics? Can what explain the phenomenon of life based on the laws of physics? There is no evident answer to this question. In any case, the numerous attempts to derive the phenomenon of life from physics together with other natural sciences have enjoyed no success so far. The third great problem, according to Ginsburg, is the origin of the time arrow. Where does the irreversibility come from? In quantum mechanics, which is the most fundamental science, all equations are reversible in time. How then does irreversibility occur appear? As I've already mentioned, I will start the analysis by choosing one interpretation of quantum mechanics or another and discuss the other two problems and especially the relationship among all three problems from the viewpoint of the chosen interpretation. In this connection, it is important to note that various interpretations of quantum mechanics are, in fact, various levels of describing quantum measurement. Sometimes one says, let us find which interpretation is the correct one. In my opinion, this is the wrong question. Various interpretations are different. Descriptions of the same process, the quantum measurement. All descriptions are correct but they decode the process on various levels, uncovering the mechanism of measurement to a greater or lesser extent. Starting from the famous paper of Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, it has become more and more evident 
that to give an interpretation of quantum mechanics means to explain how reality is understood in quantum mechanics, or in other words, what the quantum reality is. Accepting one interpretation or another means explaining the quantum reality in one way or another. This, however, can be done on various levels. More primitive levels, including the Copenhagen interpretation, are rather easy for understanding and convenient in practice, but the description of the essence of quantum reality is not sufficiently exact. Interpretations of higher level, including Everett's, express this essence more precisely, but are more arduous for understanding and produce more difficulties than help for practicing researcher in quantum physics, for instance, existence for solving typical quantum mechanical problems. This explains why Everett's interpretation was accepted with such difficulty. Nevertheless, it has come into great demand over the last decades, in particular due to the development of quantum information science. A more exact interpretation does not cancel a less exact one since different interpretations do not influence the mathematical base of quantum mechanics calculations and predictions for specific experiments are made according to the same recipes regardless of the interpretation. As a consequence, calculations do not require complicated interpretation. Like efforts one, the Copenhagen interpretation is quite sufficient, but if one takes into account the fact that the Copenhagen interpretation has logical defects, then for more exact reasoning, one has to turn to other interpretations and first of all to Everett's. However, as we will see, moving to more profound interpretations of quantum mechanics not only restores the logical completeness of this science, but also allows one to explain important facts relating to the work of the consciousness that have found no explanation up to now. Relations among the three great problems at various levels of measurement description. Let us begin with some reasoning leaping ahead. We will briefly characterize the relationship among the three great problems without dwelling on the proofs of these relationships. The reasoning can be illustrated uh, with this uh, diagram. Description of the quantum measurement on a higher level reveals a richer structure, the relationship between the three great problems of so the time arrow, uh, consciousness and life and quantum measurement. And uh, so you see the extended Everett interpretation relates the time arrow to consciousness and light, consciousness and life uh, to quantum measurement through Everett's interpretation, quantum measurement to the time arrow through Copenhagen interpretation. Quantum measurement and the time arrow, what is the relationship between them? It is very simple. The relationship was discussed long ago. It is evident even in the framework of the Copenhagen interpretation. The point is that if a measurement is performed in a quantum system, then some jump occurs an irreversible change in the state of the system. This change is called the state reduction of the wave function collapse. Such an irreversible change in the state resulting from the measurement occurs only in quantum physics. A measurement in classical physics does not lead to irreversibility, although irreversibility may emerge in classical physics for other reasons. Before the measurement, other the, only the probability of various measurement results can be predicted, even if the state of the system is fully known. During the measurement, a single result is chosen from the set of all possible alternative measurement results. In this case, the state of the system is irreversibly changed, and the measurement, the system cannot return to the state in which all measurement outcomes are possible. This way, the measurement brings irreversibility to quantum mechanics, which is absent in a usual evolution which no measurement involved. The reasoning is a valid framework of the Copenhagen interpretation. However, if we consider a more complicated interpretation, Everett's interpretation, then it turns out that the observer's consciousness should be included in the measurement. Without it, the measurement description is not complete. Thus, new relationships among the three problems occur. First of all, a relationship appears between quantum measurement and consciousness. The relationship is hardly expected from the usual physics viewpoint. Indeed, consciousness is a phenomenon of living creatures. This notion is simply absent in the world of abiotic physical systems that is the subject of physics. By introducing the consciousness of the observer into the measurement theory, Everett's interpretation of quantum mechanics establishes a direct relationship between quantum measurement and the phenomenon of life. This seems to be completely foreign to physics, at least in its simple version, which one could expect to describe measurement. Therefore, it turns out that quantum mechanics and the phenomenon of life are closely related, and the measurement theory in quantum mechanics proves to be not so simple. In addition, in Everett's interpretation, the irreversibility of measurement arises only in the picture drawn by the observer's consciousness. Hence, measurement leads to the time arrow only if the role of consciousness is taken into account. If we pass to the extended Everett concepts, 
Then another arrow, arrow appears, another relationship among the above three problems, connection of the time arrow with consciousness and life. Indeed, in the framework of the EEC, one can understand how a decrease in entropy can occur in life while the rule of abiotic systems and entropy increases. For life, self-organizational is typical. Life develops and its evolution is directed not towards greater chaos, uh, entropy increase, but towards greater order, entropy decreasing. In the living world, the time arrow also exists, but the entropy behavior with respect to the time arrow is strange. The entropy decreases. This is caused by the fact that the very existence of a living creature depends on what will happen in the future, the notion of aim. The basic aim is survival, is inherent in living world, and hence the related feeling of time running. The future is different from the past and present, which separates the future from the past. Summarizing and leaping ahead, since we have not proved anything so far, we will see that solving the first problem leads to a deeper understanding of the other two, according to the following scheme. Quantum measurement, the role of the observer's consciousness, phenomenon of consciousness and phenomenon of life, quantum reality, reversibility of the quantum world, and subjective feeling of time running. Copenhagen re interpretation, reduction of the state. What is the Copenhagen interpretation? How does it describe a measurement in a quantum system? Briefly, this can be formulated in the following way. Let us state that the quantum system before the measurement uh, be the superposition state where the components correspond to various measurement results that can be obtained with a given instrument. Then after the measurement of the system is brought into a single definite state, one of those forming the superposition, this effect selection of one of the components and the disappearance of all the other ones is called the reduction of state or the wave function collapse. This change in the state of the quantum system is stepwise and irreversible. The measurement causes a jump from the superposition state into the state given by a single component of the superposition. The reduction postulate means that the measurement of a quantum system leads to irreversible change in its state. Quantum measurement leads to irreversibility. Creation of the time arrow. Thus, in the framework of the Copenhagen interpretation, a measurement of quantum system is an irreversible process. Measurements are not only ones that are specially organized, but also those that occur spontaneously due to the environment or, or thermostat, introduce irreversibility into quantum mechanics. Hence, the first relation between the great problem is established. Measurement brings the time arrow into quantum mechanics in a theory whose equations are symmetric with respect to the time reversal. Irreversibility appears. This kind of irreversibility has been intensely discussed in the literature, and a review can be found in the monograph. In the Copenhagen interpretation, the state reduction was postulated. A mathematically strict formulation of this postulate was given first by Van Neumann, and therefore the reduction postulate is called the Van Neumann postulate. If one postulates that the measurement causes reduction, one of the superpositions components is selected with the corresponding probability, then calculations based on this postulate will not lead to errors. In this sense, such a postulate makes a quantum mechanics efficient. If the reduction postulate is rejected, a problem appears. We understand very well how a closed system behaves, but if such a system is measured and still exists after the measurement, then the question arises, what is the state of the system after the measurement? Indeed, to find out what happens with the system later during a time interval after the measurement, we need to know the state immediately after the measurement. If this question is answered the same way as in the reduction postulate, then calculations provide predictions that are confirmed experimentally. In this sense, the reduction postulate leaves no doubt. The genius of Niels Bohr allowed him in particular to develop such a simple formulation of quantum mechanics, the Copenhagen interpretation, that could effectively, efficiently solve quantum mechanical problems despite the conceptual gaps that, as many researchers understood, still remained in the science. Decoherence. A. Ben, thanks for showing up. Decoherence, reduction is impossible. However, the reduction postulate itself can be doubted, and it was doubted from the very beginning, but these doubts became more solid after the development of the decoherence theory. The decoherence theory describes the measurement process without invoking any special postulate like the reduction one, and only within a framework of quantum mechanics where evolution is described always described by the time reversible Schrodinger equation here. To move to this description of measurement, it is sufficient to recall that a measurement is the interaction of the measured system with another system, which we call the measuring instrument. This system, second system can be considered to be the environment of the system under measurement. Interaction of the system under measurement with its environment can be described 
in the framework of standard quantum mechanics based on the Schrodinger equation and not involving the reduction postulate. In this case, one should try in the framework of standard quantum mechanics and without the reduction postulate to answer the question, what happens when a measurement is performed on a quantum system? This turns out to be possible. And appropriate consideration shows that entanglement or quantum correlation appears between the system under measurement and its environment and the state of the measured system taken separately is crucially changed as a result of the measurement. One says that the case, the measured system undergoes decoherence. Why is this change in the state of the measured system called decoherence? Because the system subjected to measurement interacting with a measurement instrument loses quantum coherence. The information about the relative phases of separate wave function components is lost as a result if the state of the system before the measurement was a pure one and was described by wave function. After the measurement, it becomes mixed and is described by a density matrix. Most probably the physical essence of measurement was already clear to the founders of quantum mechanics, but at the time it was neither stressed nor formulated in detail. Therefore, as much later than the science, the decoherence theory was rediscovered by the scientific community. The phenomenon called decoherence became widely known starting from 1982 when the paper of Zorak appeared. After that, decoherence was extensively discussed in the literature and its understanding gradually deepened. It turned out that physicists have been constantly facing this problem while studying various systems and their interactions, but it was not considered to be a special class of quantum mechanical processes. Zorak described this class of processes from the viewpoint of quantum measurement theory and thus revealed its special role. After that, physicists started to actively study the decoherence effect. In the course of these studies, it developed that decoherence had been understood and very well described as early as 1970 by Dieter Zett, a German physicist. However, neither the paper nor the later ones by Zett and his disciples were noted by the scientific community. In 1979, decoherence was described by the authors of the present paper in the framework of a completely different phenomenological approach based on Feynman's path integrals. Still, it was only many years later that various ways of describing this process were brought together and compared and all works were understood as relating to the same class phenomenon, which was called decoherence. The very term decoherence was introduced in a paper by Murray Gelman and Hartle only in 1990. The modern state of decoherence theory is well described in the framework of various models in the book by Zett and his students. Wells' description from the viewpoint of different phenomenological approaches can be found in the book. In these approaches, the environment is not considered explicitly and its influence on the system is taken into account phenomenologically. Due to the linearity of quantum mechanics, the state reduction is impossible. During a measurement, there occurs only entanglement or quantum correlation between the measured system and the instrument leading to the decoherence of the measured system. Let us discuss in more detail what happens during a measurement of a quantum system. How can one consider measurement in the framework of conventional quantum mechanics. This is illustrated um, similarly in our previous reasoning. We assume that before the measurement, the system resides in a superposition state, but now we take into account not only the system under measurement, but also the measuring instrument or the environment of the system. Let the state of the environment before its interaction with the system, before the measurement, be described by a vector. Then the set state of the whole system whose subsystem are both the measured system and the environment before the measurement is given by another vector. Now that is considered the interaction between the measured system and the environment, ask the following question. What happens after the interaction? How does the state of the system and the environment change? It turns out that under some natural assumptions about the interaction, the conventional quantum mechanics makes the state of the total system change in the following way. With uh, the state of the measuring instrument that is interpreted by the experimental experimentalist. We see now that the state vector of the system under measurement and the state vector of the measuring instrument do not exist separately. Instead, there is only the state of the total system in which the measured system and the measuring instrument are correlated. This non-factorable state, which cannot be factored into the product of the state vector and the system and the state vector of the instrument is called entangled. In such a state, there is a quantum correlation between the system and the instrument. The correlation can be formulated in the conditional mood. If the system resides in a state, then in the instrument in another state. However, one should realize that this conventional phrase does not reflect 
the specific features of quantum correlation, distinguishing it from correlations feasible in classical systems. It is important for us that in this description, all components that were present in the superposition before the measurement are still retained after the measurement. The disappearance of all components except one, which was to occur according to the reduction postulate did not happen here. Thus, the usual quantum mechanical treatment of the measurement event shows that all superposition components survived the measurement. All that happens is the phenomenon termed entanglement or quantum correlation between the system under measurement and the instrument and the environment. It is important that I, later I will discuss it from another viewpoint, the total system, the measured system, and the environment reside in superposition state after the measurement. This circumstance is highlighted in the bottom line. It is not the structure of each component in the superposition that is important, but the fact that all superposition components survive the measurement. Let us summarize our reasoning where measurement is considered as interaction. If a superposition exists at some stage, it will be further retained, and this follows from the linearity of quantum mechanical evolution. Each term in the superposition may change somehow, but all terms will still be present, none of them becoming zero. There's no reduction selection of a single component and the disappearance of the other ones. This is dictated by the quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics excludes reduction. Everett's many worlds interpretation, there's no reduction. Thus, if we trust quantum mechanics, consider the evolution of the system to always be described by the Schrodinger equation, then reduction should be somehow excluded. How can one do it? The answer is given by interpretation of quantum mechanics proposed by Hugh Everett in 1957. The logic upholding Everett's interpretation is very simple. Let us start from quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics dictates that no reduction is possible. Relying on quantum mechanics, we accept the statement there is no reduction. All components of a quantum superposition survive during the evolution, including the measurement process. However, if one accepts the simple logic, it's necessary to explain how it happens that the observer sees just a single measurement result corresponding to just a single component of the superposition. A measurement can lead to different results, which exclude each other in the consciousness of the observer. The alternatives, all alternatives are still present in the superposition, and Everett's interpretation assumes that after the measurement, they're still kept in the description of the state. How can one understand this? How can one combine this with everyday experience and the experimentalist who always observe just a single measurement result and not a superposition result, only a single alternative and not a superposition of alternatives as in the bottom line of the scheme. It should be noted now an important role in the reasoning is played by the observer or more precisely the observer's consciousness and the interpretation of the fact that all superposition components are retained can involve this notion, the observer's consciousness. It is important that the picture formed in the consciousness of the observer is a purely classical one. This is a picture of a classical world and is always only a single one among the alternative pictures of the classical world that is present in the consciousness of the observer. In terms of a measurement procedure, different pictures of the classical world correspond to different positions of the measuring instrument pointer, and the observer always sees just a single position of the pointer. In Everett's interpretation, once you explain how this can agree with the fact that superposition contains all alternatives corresponding to various pictures of the classical world. To overcome this controversy, the following statement is assumed in Everett's interpretation. All superposition components exist and describe different alternatives, alternative measurement results, or alternative classical, quasi-classical states, uh, states of the quantum world, but consciousness separates the alternatives. Consciousness perceives these alternatives separately. If a person observes one of the alternatives, uh, he cannot see the other ones at the same time. Separation of the alternatives by the consciousness is a formulation of Everett's interpretation that is convenient for our purposes. There's also other formulations, for instance, the one where different classical worlds exist, Everett's worlds, which correspond to all possible alternatives. According to this formulation, each of the other, each of the observers exist in each of Everett's world. In other words, an observer has twins in each of Everett's worlds. This formulation is very widely spread because of its explicitness, but actually it sometimes causes misunderstanding as it contains a certain inaccuracy. One should speak not of different classical worlds, but of different classical states in a single world and about the superposition of these states. Everett's interpretation of reductionism disappears of all alternatives but one, does not happen, but consciousness separates classical alternatives by perceiving them separately. If we accept the statement about the alternatives being separated by the consciousness, then in the description of the picture in the observer's consciousness, the same effect occurs as 
predicted by the reduction postulate. Subjectively, the observer will see, recognize only one of the alternative classical pictures of the world. However, now we have managed to combine it with a linear quantum mechanics. All alternatives ex exist in reality, but they are separated in the consciousness. Consciousness, similarly to the state of the material world, also consists of something like multiple components, which subjectively seem to be mutually exclusive. These components reflect the alternatives. According to Everett's interpretation, irreversibility appears in a quantum measurement due to the perception of a measurement result. What new result does it provide for the relations among the three great problems? How do these relations change if one moves to Everett's interpretation in which all alternatives are assumed to be equally real but separated in the consciousness? The relationship among the three great problems remain almost the same as in the case of the Copenhagen interpretation with the only exception being a single nuance. Now one should say that the time arrow does not objectively exist in the quantum world, but only appears in the consciousness of the observer. In reality, in the objectively existing world, all superposition components, all alternatives are retained, stay equally real, and the evolution of their superposition is quite reversible. However, consciousness perceives these alternatives separately, and the consciousness this leads to a picture of an irreversible process, <laughs> namely the choice of a single alternative and the disappearance of the other. An observer seeing one of the alternatives does not see the other one subjectively. It does not differ from the picture where one of the alternatives is selected and the others disappear from the state reduction picture. However, now in Everett's, in view of Everett's interpretation, one has to conclude that the state reduction is just an illusion appearing in the observer's consciousness. In other words, it is a specific feature of the consciousness. Everett's Extended Everett concept, EEC. Now let's move to the extended Everett concept, which allows one to consider quantum measurement and get a higher level that leads to a number of very interesting consequences. This step takes that takes us beyond Everett's concept is to identify consciousness with the separation of the alternatives. Let us explain this. Let us start from Everett's concept in the formulation used. All alternatives exist. There is no reduction, but consciousness separates them. By thinking a little deeper, one can see that, in fact, the two central notions of this formulation are not defined and cannot be defined at present. Using the notion of separating the alternatives, we actually do not fully understand what it means to have to accept just a vague intuitive idea of its meaning. Similarly, while operating on the notion of consciousness, we do not actually understand what consciousness is. Physicists cannot explain the separation of alternatives in the framework of quantum mechanics and hence cannot fully clarify this notion, nor can psychologists, physiologists, and philosophers who actively work on the problem of consciousness inwardness solve the problem. Apparently, the phenomenon of consciousness is somehow related to the work of the brain, but it cannot be fully explained by the brain functioning. It is rather the other way around. The process happening in the consciousness, subjective feelings direct and coordinate the work of the brain. The extended effort concept suggests identification of these two poorly defined notions the consciousness and the separation of alternatives. It assumes that consciousness is identified as the separation of alternatives. After this identification, first, there remains just one notion instead of two, and second, this notion can now be illustrated from two viewpoints, the physical one and the psychological one. The separation of alternatives, not very clear in physics, is illustrated by what we know about consciousness, while consciousness, which is not very clear in psychology, gets illustrated due to what physicists know about the separation of alternatives. In fact, one cannot expect more than that. In any science, initial notions stay vague until it becomes clear how these notions work and how all other notions arising in theory are related to each other. By making the notion consciousness equaling the separation of alternatives common to quantum physics and psychology, we take a step towards its more exact definition of no less importance and maybe even more convincing is the fact that combining these two notions leads to the explanation of some phenomenon that are well known, but up to now not explained. We will speak about this later. Both Everett's interpretation and the EEC give, on one hand, a description of the quantum world represented by superposition and alternatives, and on the other hand, a description of the same world as perceived by consciousness. This is the same quantum world by which separated separated alternatives. Alternatives constitute different projections of the quantum world. If evolution is described in the framework of quantum mechanics, all of these projections are essential and are only present altogether as a superposition. 
in the description of the picture existing in consciousness, the alternatives are separated, and each of them has a meaning, but the sum is meaningless. Everett says consciousness separates the alternatives, but in the framework of the EC, we say it slightly differently. It is the separation of alternatives that is consciousness. At first sight, this identification seems to change nothing essential in the measurement picture, but this is not so. Now, after identifying consciousness with the separation of alternatives, one can pose the following question, which in fact does not relate to physics anymore, but is outside of its scope. What happens when consciousness is turned off? Indeed, states of turned off or dim consciousness are known, these being sleep, trance, meditation, or what Jung called the unconsciousness. What happens in transferring to such states from the viewpoint of the concept we consider? Physics cannot answer the question, but if we assume that separation of alternatives are identified as consciousness, then the answer is possible under the identification. Turning off consciousness means turning off the separation of alternatives. It is logical to conclude when consciousness becomes dimmed, the separation of alternatives becomes incomplete. Partitions between alternatives become transparent immediately. An important conclusion follows. If consciousness is dimmed or weakened, then while perceiving some alternative in at the same time scans the neighboring alternative and not only the neighboring one. Hence, the subject in the state of dim consciousness perceiving some classical alternative can at the same time look into other alternatives. If consciousness and separation of the alternatives are identified, then dim consciousness, in particular the state of sleep or trance, means an incomplete separation of alternatives in which consciousness looks into other alternatives and can single out the most favorable ones among them. To this must be added the assumption that a subject observing some alternative while separating them can modify the probability of observing one alternative or another in the nearest future. In the framework of EC, this assumption becomes natural because separation of alternatives after identifying it with consciousness can be considered in two ways, as a specific description of what happens in the quantum world and as a mental phenomenon. The quantum world is based on objective laws, but mentality is objective. It is controlled, at least partially, by the subject. Therefore, it is natural to define two probability distributions in the set of alternatives, the objective one regulating the choice of an alternative in the world of abiotic physical systems, and the subjective one defining which alternative will be chosen by the subject. This question is discussed uh, in more detail in other places. The assumptions of the EEC are quite counterintuitive and not typical for physics. However, analysis shows that the logical structure of the theory is simpler under these assumptions than the Copenhagen interpretation or in Everett's interpretation in its original form. But most important is that with these assumptions, we become able to explain many things that we face every day, but that have had no explanation up to now. For instance, the free will. What is free will? A person wants to leave the room and leaves it or wants to stay there and stays. Um, he wants to get up from the chair and gets up or stay seated if uh, if they want. It seems simple, but do we understand how it happens, how the decision is made? We will not find the answer by analyzing the work of the brain. The command to muscles comes from the brain, but how is one of several alternative commands chosen by the neuron that first makes the choices? Physiology cannot explain this. The assumption adopted by in the EC explains this in a natural way. All Alternative behavior scenarios are present as superposition components, but the subject can compare them with each other and increase the observational probability for the alternatives that seem more attractive. In addition to the free will, this reasoning can explain such a strange fact as absolute necessity of sleep. Everyone is so used to the phenomenon of sleep that we never think about this fact, but biologists and physicians cannot explain why sleep is absolutely necessary, why a person deprived of sleep for three weeks will certainly die. The answer that sleep gives rest to an organism does not necessarily explain the absolute necessity. The extended Everett concept explains the phenomenon a person deprived of sleep has no opportunity to look into other alternatives and choose the best one, leading to maintain, maintaining health and survival. Besides these two, there are other fundamental phenomena that find natural explanations in the framework of EC. Among them, for instance, there is the instantaneous and uncontrollable creative spark leading to a discovery. There are also phenomena probably existing in reality, uh, consisting in observing events that naturally occur only with extremely small probability. The extended Everett concept's relation among the three problems. If one accepts the extended Everett concept, identifies consciousness with the separation of alternatives, that the relationship between the three great problems are again slightly modified, and in this case they become especially diverse. These relations are 
present in figure eight. In the framework of the extended Everett concept, the relationship between the three great problems becomes deeper, reversible quantum world, leading to phenomena of life and sensing a time flow, um, leading to maintaining life and the entropy reduction of life's life sphere. So according to EC, there is a field where only pure quantum theory operates. In this theory, evolution is always described by a linear law, for instance, the Schrodinger equation, and is reversible. This quantum theory is correct for the description of abiotic matter. The reversible quantum world is represented by the world of abiotic matter. No notion of measurement is necessary in this world. Measurement is only the interaction of the system with its environment, and all interaction in the reversible quantum world are correctly described by the usual linear quantum mechanical equations. It was the description of measurement that was discussed earlier in connection with the decoherence phenomenon. In the framework of the EC, one can speak of measurement in connection with the notion of the observer and, most important, the observer's consciousness. Thus, quantum theory gains the notion of consciousness and, hence, the phenomenon of life, the upper arrow. Uh, as a result, the theory gains new opportunities, which allow one to explain important and so far unexplained features of this phenomenon. Let's briefly dwell on this subject. First of all, the existence of consciousness or separation of alternatives enables one to explain the phenomenon of life. The key role here is played by the classical nature of the alternatives by identifying the separation of alternatives with consciousness with some attributes of living matter. The EC explains the classical nature of the alternatives, which cannot be explained otherwise. Indeed, separation of alternatives is consciousness and attribute of living matter. Therefore, it is legitimate to pose the question to what components of quantum state of the world will be separated and what will be the alternatives in the interest of life? The answer is obvious. The alternatives should be classical, quasi-classical, so that consciousness in the regime of separation of the alternatives receives the picture of a locally predictable world, such as the world in which the evolution of some spatial domain cannot be substan cannot substantially depend on the states of remote do domains. If instead of classical alternatives, essentially non-classical ones were used involving the features of quantum non-locality, then each such alternative would give a picture of an unpredictable world in which the strategy of survival could not be worked out. Only classical alternatives provide the predictability of the world sensed subjectively and hence ensure the very possibility of life. Further, if one takes into account that consciousness can be in the boundary state in which it is almost completely turned off, the alternatives are not completely separated. It becomes possible to explain how life is maintained and the health of a living creature is preserved. Here, the main role is played by sleep, during which the dim consciousness penetrates into other realities. The subject compares alternatives and is enabled to choose the one that is most favorable for life and health. Sleep is absolutely necessary for life, namely due to the fact that it helps to choose the strategy for survival. Maintaining life is impossible without sleep. The second line of relationship between the three great problems connects the problem of measurement and the problem of the time arrow. Considering consciousness or separation of alternatives, we necessarily come to the conclusion that the picture created by the consciousness contains something that is absent in the quantum world. The quantum world is reversible, while consciousness creates the sensing of time flow and the distinction between the present, past, and future. The present is distinguished by the fact that at this moment, the subject is choosing the alternative that will be in the nearest future perceived by his consciousness in the quantum world of abiotic matter, which evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. The notions of present, past, and future are simply absent. As one of the aspects of the picture appearing in consciousness, the time flow singles out the time arrow. With respect to the time arrow, entropy increases. However, entropy decreases in the sphere occupied by life. Living matter develops and becomes self-organized. This is also explained in the framework of the EEC. Identification of consciousness with the separation alternative gives generates a new notion of quantum consciousness, which is a general subject of the study, hence the bridge between the natural sciences and humanities, between matter and spirit. Briefly, this is because consciousness in the boundary state perceives various alternatives, analyzes them, and modifies the probabilities preferring the ones that are more favorable for life. The last of these means that the subject perceiving some alternative is more probable to perceive in the following instant of time, one of the alternatives that are most favorable for him. The special choice of alternatives providing survival means that the dynamics of life observed by consciousness are determined not by the cause, but by the goal. And this of course means a decrease in entropy in the life sphere. Identification of consciousness 
with the separation of alternatives actually generates a new notion of quantum consciousness, which has a unique property. Consciousness understood in this way enters as a necessary element, both quantum physics and psychology. This way, direct contact between these two sciences is established. Continuing this analysis, we see that quantum consciousness forms the bridge between the natural science and the sphere of the humanities, including non-scientific forms like religion. Eventually, one can say that quantum consciousness builds the bridge between matter and spirit. This is indeed a bridge over chasm. There are many important relations between the material and the spiritual spheres. However, quantum consciousness apparently makes a more solid contact between them. Each of these spheres needs the other one for the sake of being conceptually close. Conclusions. The following conclusion can be drawn from the above analysis. The question of what happens during measurement should be answered in the framework of physics as follows. In any case, reduction does not occur. What proceeds in the entanglement of the measured system with its environment and, as a consequence, the measured system of decoherence. This is derived strictly in the framework of quantum mechanics. From a somewhat broader viewpoint, the answer to the same question is during measurement, the observer's consciousness perceives the measurement result, which is equivalent to separating the alternatives. The question of what life is from the viewpoint of physics should be answered in the following ways. Since consciousness is identified with the separate and of alternatives, quantum consciousness, namely the concept of consciousness resulting from this analysis erects a bridge between physics and life. Life cannot be explained by only physical processes which obey the laws of physics. At the same time, one cannot say that there's no relation exists between the phenomena of life and the laws of physics. This relation exists and is important, but it is not a direct relation. From the extended effort concept, it follows that quantum consciousness throws a bridge between quantum physics and life. Physics cannot be cannot do without such an important notion as consciousness, the most important component of the phenomena of life. Well, life cannot be explained without invoking quantum physics. And finally, the last question is, where does irreversibility come from? Based on the extended effort concept, we come to the conclusion that the objective quantum world is reversible, while irreversibility arises in the picture of this world created by consciousness. Consciousness builds its life in a picture of the world where the time arrow exists. This is a qualitative difference between past, present, and future, and the future is locally predictable. This is, of course, not accidental, since the survival strategy is only possible in such a world, namely the very existence of life. This possibility is realized by increasing the probability of the subject observing favorable alternatives and means an entropy reduction in the sphere of life. Okay, so I dedicated a lot of time to reading that whole article by Mensky, Quantum Measurements, the Phenomena of Life and the Time Arrow, Three Great Problems of Physics and Ginsburg's Terminology and Their Interrelation. Because um, yeah, I, I am going to do the deep dive into um, chunking, but I wanted to tie this back with the last few weeks, the quantum revolution, quantum consciousness, uh, Kuhnian philosophy of science, revolutions, uh, you know, Ginsburg, the current state of physics, the main problems uh, facing us now. So a lot of information there, um, and also the multiple truth hypothesis, because this now will have completed all of the main pillars of the multiple truth hypothesis. And, you know, being that quantum mechanics, quantum physics, the Everett multiple world hypothesis uh, is part of it, it's extremely complicated. And, you know, also the philosophy I covered, monism, a deep dive into monism. And chunking, in many ways, is also somewhat a form of monism, because you're looking at, like, the monad, the singular unit that builds up in, like, neutralistic monism, where you're looking at possibly something as information as the neutral aspect that gives rise to the material and physical, and that would most be seen in classical physics. So a lot of information there, and you know, direction for the next few weeks or months on Week in Review, you would be looking more into the current state of physics. And Ginsburg herself was saying, you know, the, the, the previous dictum, you should know a lot about one thing and a little about everything, which is almost too difficult these days. Even just to know a little bit about everything is too difficult because there's too many things to know a little bit about. And like the sub-branches, all these fields of physics, uh, semiconductors, superconductivity, computers, artificial intelligence, 
quantum mechanics. Um, there's just so many fields. It's very difficult in the, you know, the old days of having like an undergraduate education, the solid background in the mathematical tools and the, you know, the various fields of physics. Then you can have a basic understanding of all fields and then like, you know, biology and chemistry and psychology and history and all these various fields. It's very difficult. You know, even like Duvid, the speed reader who spends like, you know, basically all day, every day, just studying. I don't even know if I know like a little bit about everything. Cause like, I, I still hear about new things that I haven't heard about. And a lot, you know, like Duvid, who's been, you know, thank God privileged to basically spend my whole adult life just studying. And I studied a lot of different things, you know, like rabbinic spirituality, uh, you know, degree in sciences, engineering, expos, and all these various things. I still relatively frequently hear about things I never heard about or will come across like scientific uh, papers and it's like, wow, I don't know anything about this. And there, there's prerequisite uh, material. Um, but, you know, let alone like, you know, like my father, a very educated man of uh, very accomplished uh, you know, reader who spends lots of time, but he works full time and doesn't actually have that much time to read and study and investigate constantly. Like I tell him about things he hasn't heard about. Uh, because he hasn't had time to investigate it. And so, uh, you know, hopefully the multiple truth hypothesis is moving forward. And, you know, people have been following Week in Review for a longer period of time. We'll see how this is coming together. And chunking theory is going to be important also. Chunking theory could also be, you know, it's going to be related to the alternatives that like you choose between alternatives, those alternatives are chunk and chunks to some extent, like chunking theory is important. And, and like, I'm gonna go very into chunking theory, but chunking theory could be understood. Like what is the chunk? And we're gonna talk about chunks and none of the authors I'm reading today are gonna mention this, but you say, well, what is the chunk? A chunk could be considered the monad. And so have that in your mind when reading about this, although I'm gonna give a traditional mainstream view towards chunking without going into monism. But I think they're related. And when you think of like a chunk, well, what is the chunk? A chunk is maybe the monad, maybe the neutral aspect of the monad that gives rise to both the physical. And then we're talking like chunking in terms of mental processes and cognitive psychology. Uh, we're talking at two times possibly like a chunk, like a neuro mechanism, like uh, integrated information theory, IIT, or we're talking about just information theory and like a chunk as a chunk of information that only has neurological plausibility. So chunking theory develops as cognitive psychology, not neuroscience. Although chunking theory has substantial amount of neuro correlates and neuro plausibility. So they're going to be an important aspect. So a lot to get through. So um, just a handful of people watching, but anyone watching, appreciate you tuning in. Hopefully people will gain from this and, you know, timestamp it. So here in my Brambles of a Chess Coach, I have my things on chess and the science of expertise. And so when I, I started with the multiple truth hypothesis and I mentioned the studies in chess and I'm going to show my essays because I have uh, two relevant essays. I'm only going to read one of them today, uh, you know, but the, the candidate moves. But a lot of this is related to chess research and chunking theory comes from chess studies. So my first stream... I bring up De Groot, and De Groot somewhat is the father of chunking theory before Miller, although you know De Groot didn't come up with chunking theory, but he did the experiments on chess expertise that led to chunking theory. And in this paper, I looked at Chase and Simon's 1973 paper, Perception Chess, which in many ways is the foundation of chunking theory. And... Uh, 1973, and I covered a little bit like alpha zero and even showed some slides about the various things, alpha beta pruning. 
And um, then I went into expert performance. What is the scientific evidence said? And there I read basically one PhD thesis from Roy Roaring on expert chess performance, the production-based theory of chess skill, which covered some of the theories of chunking, which I'm going to go into more detail today, and then chess expertise and intelligence. It was a little bit uh, you know, different on chess studies related to mental phenomenon in general. And then the last one I did was on decision-making and a little bit trying to bring it back to the heart realm of consciousness. So these were streams I did um, two and a half years ago. So, you know, like, do it first, like my multiple truth hypothesis streams. So, you know, when I first started streaming my multiple truth hypothesis, and uh, that was about the same time, two and a half years ago. Um, and, you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll share those links also. So my first multiple truth hypothesis stream I did before my chess streams. And so that was um, in the summer, so almost three years ago. My first stream on the multiple truth hypothesis was almost three years ago. And there, you know, I gave an overview. I read this one paper of Chamberlain in 1890 on geology method of multiple working hypothesis. And I talked about the various pillars of the multiple truth hypothesis, the relation philosophical background, scientific realism. Um, and like then I was just getting started in my research. That was before COVID-19. And COVID-19, you know, like, you know, like in, in a blessing in disguise in some way, God forbid all the suffering that was caused, but allowed me to do a huge amount of research that I never thought I would be able to do. Like my father just never had time to, you know, read through all these studies. He was always working. So COVID-19 gave me an opportunity to go much deeper into um, this research. And then I did a little bit. I talked about the multiverse and I read through some like Max Tegmark and Parallel Universe and uh, the holographic universe and um, truth discovery functions. I was just getting started with some of this stuff. Um, and then um, when Alpha Fold came out, and this was after the chess streams um, the same year, uh, 2020, just before COVID-19, December 6, 2020, when Alpha Fold came out, I did a little bit related to the uh, multiple truth hypothesis in relationship to alpha fold. So here is an important thing. I don't have time to talk about it today because there's just so much to uh, go through. But um, here is my blog post on um Kotov's candidate moves analysis trees and general decisions decision making and um this is a little bit related and, and, and you know it's an important read so anyone following this that hasn't read that I encourage them to read that um I will start my chunking theory uh deep dive into chunking with the essay that I wrote and I think I published it about a year and a half ago on Lee Chess, and I took it down, so I just added it in January. And so here, memory techniques and chunking theory. Chunking theory is not well known, but a very powerful idea. Memory in general is a mystery. However, many aspects of memory are, are understood as memory is one of the most important mental, mental faculties. From ancient history till today, a good memory has been recognized as a crucial aspect of success. Many of the greatest minds share thoughts about memory. Many develop techniques to improve memory, as performance in most activities can be enhanced through improved memory. Related to memory and general mental function, chess has been referred to as Drosophilia of artificial intelligence, sometimes extended to human cognitive research, in a similar way to the fruit fly has been the mainstay of genetics research. Many of the students... Studies of chunking theory have been conducted on chess players due to the simultaneous simplicity and complexity of chess, allowing researchers and theorists 
to use chess to test mental functions. I will give a brief overview of the history of memory techniques from ancient times, uh, the history of the basis and basis of chunking theory, and the power of chunking theory, especially how chunking theory is at the center of all memory techniques. So I'll read the part on memory, even though it's not specifically related to today, but it's just a little bit. I'll read the part on memory. There is recorded memory techniques are mnemonics or a mental device that chunks multiple pieces of information into one piece of information that can be easily recalled from a single mnemonic. The mnemonics have been utilized in all cultures from the earliest times as a method to help remember important information. Another ancient technique still popular today is the method of Loki attributed to pre-Socratic Simony. Simonides of Sios and the famous tragic story of the collapsed banquet hall. Simonides, having stepped outside, was later able to remember who was inside by mentally visualizing traveling table to table to recreate who was at each table. Roman Cicero and Quintilian, writing on the importance of memory to rhetoric, uh, mentioned the method of loci, mnemonics, and other visualization techniques to help facilitate recall by attaching memories to mental images. Both, quote, Rhetorica ad herenium of unknown origins that describe the natural and artificial memory, positing the ability to train the mind to increase artificial memory through various techniques. Plato and Aristotle wrote on memory, Plato understanding memory to be awakening pre-existing forms, and Aristotle a more rational approach. In future essays, I plan to return to a more detailed history and explanation of memory, including a more detailed history, historical review of memory techniques. God forbid something I still haven't done. From the time of the ancient Greeks and Romans till the modern era, there was not much advancement in understanding memory. Without being able to explain the working mechanisms of the mind, dualistic models dominated models of the mind. In the late 1800s, the field of psychometrics grew with Darwin and Galton as scientists started to measure and test the output of mind, including memory. But the main progress in understanding memory did not occur until the 1950s. Researchers and theoreticians with psychometrics actively started studying the output of mind. Chess performance was a popular field for cognitive research attempting to explain performance differences. In the 1950s, famous promoter of speed reading technique, Evelyn Woods and others started to popularize memory and mental techniques to enhance the performance of the mind. Shortly after researchers started making advancements in scientific understanding of memory, largely through the developments of chunking theory. In 1953, Bowsfield wrote occurrences of clusters in the recall of randomly arranged associates, first noticing the role of chunking in memory. But the main breakthrough comes in 1956 with George Miller's magic number seven plus or minus two and the development of the concept of short-term memory, specifically that short-term memory being limited to about seven items. The limitation on short-term memory can be overcome through chunking together units of memory. Since 1956, chunking has been a well-known concept among cognitive psychologists, but not reaching general popularity. Chess being one of the main testing grounds of psychometrics, the Drosophila of AI, we will return to future essays to discuss artificial intelligence and computers and cognitive research. Chess was used for many of the first studies in chunking theory in 1973, Chase and Simon, perception of chess, used chunking theory to explain the difference between performance of chess players. Today, Chase and Simon's perception of chess is an important research paper explaining cognitive performance. In future essays, I plan to delve deeper into the famous chess studies, but today just want to introduce chunking theory. Although largely developed in chess studies, chunking theory has much wider implications for memory and thought in general. Chunking is broadly defined as a process by which individual pieces of an information set are broken down and then regrouped together as a meaningful whole. The chunks by which the information is grouped are meant to improve short-term retention of the material, thus bypassing the limited capacity of working memory and allowing working memory to be more efficient. In future essays, I plan on a thorough history of chunking theory and a review of the current models of how the mind chunks information and the neural correlates of chunking theory. Then I will show the relationship of chunking theory to the multiple truth hypothesis and how chunking theory can help understand the heart problem of consciousness. Chunking theory will prove to be a great benefit as just with the basics of chunking theory, we can understand the secret to basically all mental techniques. As Cicero noted in ancient Rome with the method of loci, that visual memories are the strongest form of memory, and to aid memory, one should chunk concepts with an image. As modern neuroscience estimates that 40% of brain activity is used for visual processing, also mnemonics are, are pure chunking, where one chunk 
can be unlocked into the pieces of information coded within the mnemonic. Stay tuned for more on chunking theory and some of the most famous studies related to chess and how we can use chunking as a practical mental technique that can immediately produce results in improving mental functioning. I also plan to show how chunking theory can help explain many psychological theories like cognitive dissonance as chunking theory is the main pillar and precursor knowledge to understanding the multiple truth hypothesis. Okay, so that was my essay on chunking theory, pretty good basic introduction. So modern research, you know, chess international master, I've mentioned in some of my other studies, Fernand Gobet, I'll be reading some of his papers. And I'm not going to go too much into chess today because um, you know, there's just a lot to get through and time is limited. And you know, so hopefully you know, some people will be more interested and uh, you'll read through some of this material on their own. So this essay I'm not going to read. So this is by Fernand Grobey and Herbert Simon at uh, Simon was at Carnegie Mellon, Templates in Chess Memory, A Mechanism for Recalling Several Boards. And I showed in my books on cognitive psychology chess, uh, the recent book on blindfold chess. Um, but this is a good essay, so anyone watching this wants to look at that. Here, I'll just read the abstract. Um, it's something I covered in one of my earlier lectures on the multiple truth hypothesis related to AI and truth discovery, the efficiency using chunking to optimize an alpha beta search. The efficiency of the alpha beta algorithm is largely dependent on the order in which branches are searched. A well ordered search can give a considerable reduction in the number of nodes processed by pruning ineffectual paths. This paper describes CLAMP, an acronym for chunk learning and move prompting, which uses chunk knowledge to order the moves on a chessboard in their likelihood to be played. Test results show despite Clamp having no knowledge of the rules of chess, ordering moves by using chunk knowledge gives an approximate 50% decrease in the number of nodes searched when compared to random ordering of the same moves. This poker, uh, paper focuses on the alpha beta function within chess playing program, but as Clamp has no knowledge of the rules of the game, the same method could be applied to optimize searching in other domains. So encourage people to read through that. That's related to chess. So um, your know, time is limited. There's a lot of information to get through. So you're just putting those out there. People are more studious and encourage people to look, look into it. So I have a lot of articles to read. I'm going to be doing a lot of research on Fernand Gobet. I've showed his book on expertise. So Fernand Gobet is professor of psychology. I think now he's located in London. He's been in Switzerland and in, in, uh, uh, Swedish and like, like Eric Erickson and is one of the biggest experts on chunking theory and the science of expertise in general, which is a topic I plan on getting to more. And, you know, so first I have to do the deep dive into chunking theory before we get into expertise because um, expertise is also based on chunks and chunking theory. So I'm not going to be talking that much about chess today. You know, although chunking arises from studies in chess and, you know, the DeGroote and, and people could watch those uh, earlier streams if they want to know more about it. But chunking now is widely used across many fields, including computer programming. And last week where I was talking about the cognitive revolution, the importance of chunking in relation to the cognitive revolution is the bottling of the human mind. So, you know, Miller and Chomsky and Newell and uh, um, you were programmer, you know, they're programmers and we're just learning about the power of computer programming to model the mind and memory was partially based on these models. So chunking theory has a psychological theory of a mechanism of how the mind works um, most of it is not based on, neur on uh, neur neurology. Most of it is based on pure understanding of psychological mechanisms and computer modeling. And so now with AI and 
high level programming. So you have chunking as a method that the computer uses and machine learning. So chunking could be important like alpha beta pruning and various things that are beyond the scope of today. But just suffice it to say that chunking is extremely important to a lot of related fields. I will only be focusing on cognitive psychology today, although we talk about quite a few fields in, you know, besides for memory, uh, although they're all related to memory. It's saying that memory plays an important part of all cognitive functions. Um, but uh, chunking is also used by the computer. And because it's only neuroplausible, it's not actually based on neural mechanisms. Um, most of the studies in chunking theory are based on psychometrics. Although these days, most of them also will have computer programs that model. So there'll be a idea of how the mind might chunk that would be put into a computer program. The computer program would model how the mind might perform these chunking functions. And then that would be compared to tests that measure psychometric data. And the, although chess is still one of the most common forms of psychometric tests on chunking, um, there's so many, so to say, more important than just the game of chess, like linguistics, language formation, or, or you know, really everything these days could be divided into chunking. So let's start with uh, just a basic paper, this Fernand Gobet, Kelly, and, and Peter Lane. And so you know, Fernand Gobet is basically the biggest name in chunking theory. So we'll read through this short paper, what is in the name, the multiple meanings of chunk and chunking. The term chunk denoting a unit and the related term chunking denoting a mechanism to construct that unit are familiar terms within psychology and cognitive science. The Oxford English Dictionary provides several definitions for chunk. First, a thick, more or less cuboidal lump out of anything or colloquially a large or substantial amount. The Merriam-Webster di di Dictionary provides a similar definition. Oxford Dictionary alone gives a computer-related meaning, a section of information or data. It is in this context a chunk as a section of information that the word is used within psychology and cognitive science. In these fields, a chunk typically refers to a single unit built from several smaller elements and chunking to the process of creating a chunk. Gobe defines a chunk as a collection of elements having strong associations with one another, but weak associations with elements within other chunks. However, in different contexts and with different authors, these two terms are used with a variety of meaning, which are very often conflated, leading to considerable confusion. Table one provides a taxonomy of the main meanings of chunk and chunking, which will be used to structure this article. The multiplicity of the meanings of the term chunk and chunking in the literature raises a number of questions. Do these meanings refer to the same things? Do they simply reflect Differences in the empirical domain studied are the same mechanisms involved. Is learning underpinned by the same processes? As we shall see, these meanings sometimes differ in considerable ways when referring to conscious versus unconscious mechanisms or labeling declarative versus procedural knowledge structures. But researchers often cite them together if they refer to the same theoretical objects. Thus, there is a danger that while researchers in different fields think they refer to the same theoretical concepts, they actually differ have different structures and mechanisms in mind. This inevitably results in lack of communication or even worse, miscommunication. The aim of this article is to explicitly not to review the extensive literature on chunking, which would be impossible in such a for short format, but to highlight some of the main meanings of the term chunk and chunking, to discuss their commonalities and differences, and to argue that progress in our understanding of chunking will be difficult until research recognize these different meanings and are more precise in the way they refer to them. So there's table one, taxonomy of the meaning of chunking. So you have memory, deliberate and automatic chunking, and perception of motor action, deliberate and automatic chunking, cognitive architectures, and uh, different uh, theories based on computer models, and other meanings in computer science, linguistics, and education. Psychology and cognitive science. Gobit distinguishes between two main meanings of chunking with regard to memory, deliberate chunking and automatic chunking. Deliberate chunking is conscious, explicit, intermittent, goal-directed, and strategically intended to structure the material to memorize. The meaning is mostly 
used in literature on short-term memory, also known as working memory, as in the meaning used by Miller's 1956, uh, when he provides the example of recoding binary digits in the decimal system. Conversely, automatic chunking is unconscious, implicit, and continuous. It deals with processes occurring in long-term memory, and in this kind of chunking hypothesized to occur with experts when developing familiarity with a domain, for example, chess. It is also mean, meaning used in several computational models such as competitive chunking, EPOM, and CREST. Deliberate chunking can be further divided into several meanings, which often occur together. First meaning is grouping, uh, for example, AABBAAA would be chunked into three groups of three A's, three B's, and three A's. A second meaning used, for example, in CIRMAC 1975 is equivalent to categorizing. A third meaning is recoding, for which Miller's discussion of reco recoding binary digits into decimal digits is a good example. A finding meaning concerns using prior knowledge to reliably memorize material. For example, 1939 can be coded as the start of World War II. Practically, there are important differences between the two types of chunking. Deliberate chunking leads to chunks that are fairly easy to identify since they are explicitly defined by the chunker and can be readily illustrated or explained. By contrast, identifying chunks created by automatic chunking is more problematic and various methods have been designed for that purpose, such as pauses in speech and eye movements in chess. The two meanings are rarely distinguished in the literature. Many articles start with the first meaning and then mention the second meaning or vice versa without an indication that the different concepts are meant. A moment of thought shows this is confusing since three states of affairs are possible. First, both deliberate and automatic chunking are present. This is the case, for example, in many mnemonics where the information is consciously chunked so that long-term memory trace is created. Second, deliberate chunking is used in the absence of automatic chunking. For example, one might use a mnemonic to briefly memorize a phone number without any long-term memory trace being created. Third, automatic chunking is used in the absence of deliberate chunking. This is presumably the case in many implicit learning tasks. Expertise acquisition in most fields and first language acquisition. For completeness sake, one can mention the final case where memory is used, but neither form of chunking is involved. This would be the case, for example, when one rehearses a phone number mechanically for a few seconds without any long-term memory encoding. The notion of compression, where a set of elements is recorded more economically, is also present in both deliberate and automatic chunking. Gradients of compression exist, however. With automatic chunking, a set of elements of arbitrary length is recoded as a single unit rather than storing all the elements in short-term memory. Only a pointer is stored that denotes a chunk in long-term memory. Perception and motor control. In the literature on perception, chunking is sometimes used with the meaning of implicit and automatic grouping of perceptual information, thus following the Gestalt laws of perception. Objects are grouped together based on proximity, similarity, symmetry, continuity, and closure. Note that in the meaning, there is no notion of memory short storage. The literature on motor action defines chunking as the learning of complex movement sequence consisting of movement components and has been studied in numerous domains. These include learning movement sequences, typing, drawing, drawing uh, uh, performed on discrete sequences of production tasks, playing the piano, speech production, and sports. Typically, it is argued that motor chunks are organized hierarchically and the production of motor response associated with them is unconscious and automatic. However, some research has also investigated how consciously dividing the sequence of movements to learn might lead to better skill acquisition. Finally, in line with the literature on memory, Verway and colleagues have proposed a dual processor model which distinguishes between chunks represented in explicit format and automatic chunks. Cognitive architectures. The concept of a chunk is used in three leading cognitive architectures in act R. A chunk is defined as a unit of declarative knowledge. Procedural knowledge is encoded as productions. Chunk contained in is a field which indicates the category to which they belong, for example, numeric, textual, or visual, and additional fields encoding the knowledge within the chunk. Chunks have a level of activation that is a function of how recently and frequently they have been used in SOAR, all knowledge is encoded in procedural knowledge, and a chunk is a production, a condition action pair, thereby, therefore, chunking in this context is the mechanism by which production is created. Thus, confusingly, a chunk 
is a unit of declarative knowledge, and act AR in a unit of procedural knowledge in SOAR. With CREST, a chunk refers to a node in long-term memory. Chunking refers to a creation of such nodes, either by adding a node of the network by discrimination or by adding information to an existing node by familiarization. The usage follows the tradition by the EPAM models. Thus, it can be seen that in these three cognitive architectures, the concept of a chunk has a totally different meanings. Other use of the term chunk, although the dictionary definition refers to the computing related meaning of chunk as a section of information or data, the term appears to be applied colloquially in computer science rather than formally. Two distinct meanings may be identified. For example, chunks as collections of information sent from one point to another, such as a distributed computing, and chunks as collection of information stored within a file. A good example of chunks used in distributed computing is the Google file system. Files are divided into chunks of a fixed size to facilitate their storage and move between different computers. Called chunk servers, separation into chunk provides redundancy and makes it easier to balance the work done by tens of thousands of computers. The PGN image file uses chunks to divide the information contained within a picture into sections. For example, a header chunk holds information on the width height of the image and number of colors and so on. And another chunk holds the color palette for the image. The image data may be a single or multiple chunks. Each chunk of image data must fit into the working buffer of the image encoding algorithm. Chunk types are also used for user-defined extensions of the PGN format, holding specialist image information such as copyright information, text comments. And computational linguistics, chunking, also known as light parsing and shallow parsing, refers to a technique whereby a sentence is analyzed in terms of its constituents, noun, noun, noun groups, verbs, etc., without specifying the internal structure of the role in the sentence. Finally, in education, chunking refers to an elementary method of division where successive subtractions are carried out. Conclusions. As described in this article, the term chunk and chunking have multiple meanings. Some Times the distinction is obvious, for example, when memory chunks and action chunks are mentioned. At other times, the distinction is unclear, most notably when deliberate chunking and automatic chunking are mentioned with no respect, with respect to memory. Finally, there are instances where mentioning diverse kinds of chunks as if they were referring to the same structures or mechanisms makes little sense, as in the case of act R, SOAR, and deliberate chunking are mentioned together without further qualification. The different meanings we have discussed in this article raise the question, of whether different terms should be used. Well, polysemy, the use of the term with many different meanings, is common in everyday language in science. It is far from an ideal state of affairs. Conversely, while well, also common in science, syn synonymity, the use of different terms with the same meaning, is also problematic. Ensuring the term chunk has a single meaning, at least in the context of cognitive psychology and cognitive science, would be particularly important for architects of computer chunking models who require unambiguous definitions of a concept to facilitate the development processes. In ideal world, this could be achieved by constructing an ontology. Not only would this allow for precise system specifications, but it would also allow architects from diverse academic backgrounds, such as computer science, psychology, and biology to communicate without ambiguity. Perhaps even more importantly, given that software development can be open source and hence open to development by architects from different nationalities, who may not share a common tongue, a precise meaning of chunk and other associated terms would facilitate effective system development and reduce potential friction between computation mold modelers. Unfortunately, policing linguistic use is difficult, if possible at all, in science where ideas, theories, and methods are in constant flux. In fact, attempts to unify definitions of basic concepts in psychology have met with little success. Thus, ambiguity may be a price to pay for the evolutionary nature of science, and this paper has limited itself to providing a taxonomy of the meanings of the term chunk and chunking. This being said, before any understanding is met, it is important to first define the objects of research. In this respect, carefully specifying the intended meaning of the term as central as chunk and chunking is desirable for making progress in understanding of human cognition. Okay, so there you have Fernand Gobey, the main thinker in modern chunking theory, just what is a chunk and what is chunking, and going over the different meanings of chunking. It's also interesting to see how chunking could be considered in part of uh, behavioralistic models of stimulus response, where, you know, it's chunking deliberate, or there's forms where you say that where, where um, 
non-intentional subconscious chunking is done most likely in a form of stimulus response, which would be a form of behavioralism. Okay, so let's look at another Fernand Gobit article and just to get out some of this basic information and uh, some of this will be redundant and this one I'm, I'm gonna skip you know, sections of and here's, uh, these are both from popular art, popular psychology magazines. Chunking Mechanisms in Human Learning, Gobe Lane, Crocker, Cheng, Jones, Oliver, and Pine. Pioneering work in the 1940s and 50s suggested that the concept of chunking might be important in many processes of perception, learning, and cognition in humans and animals. We summarize here the major source of evidence for chunking mechanisms and consider how such mechanisms have been implemented in computational models and learning process. We distinguish two forms of chunking, the first deliberate, under strategic control and goal-oriented, and the second automatic, continuous, and linked to perceptual processes. Recent work with discrimination network computation models of long and short-term memory has produced a diverse range of applications of perceptual chunking. We focus on recent successes in verbal learning, expert memory, language acquisition, and learning multiple representation to illustrate the implementations of using chunking mechanisms within contemporary models of human learning. Recent work in perception, learning, and cognition has uncovered substantial evidence for a unified information processing mechanism known as chunking. Such a mechanism was initially proposed by DeGroote based on studies of problem solving and by Miller based on studies of perception and memory. Miller's key contribution was to propose an information measure for cognitive systems based upon the concept of a chunk, where each chunk collects a number of pieces of information from the environment into a single unit. The use of chunks explains how greater knowledge can lead to an increased ability to extract information from the environment. In spite of constant cognitive limitations, since Miller's work, researchers in cognitive science have established chunking as one of the key mechanisms of human cognition and have shown how chunks link the external environment and internal cognitive processes. This article summarizes the major sources of evidence for chunking within humans and illustrates how chunking has been incorporated into computational models of human learning, defining and observing chunks. The literature on chunking encompasses many different areas of research, and the concept of a chunk has consequently diversified its meaning. The literature itself can be divided into two broad areas based how and when chunking is assumed to occur. The first assumes a deliberate conscious control of chunking, goal-oriented chunking, and the second a more automatic and continuous process of chunking during perception, perceptual chunking. And despite the surface variety among descriptions, a common definition of a chunk is possible. A chunk is a collection of elements having strong associations with one another, but weak associations with elements within other chunks. In this article, we address some questions of how chunks might be represented within a cognitive system and what effect they will have on that system's behavior. Some of the clearest evidence for perceptual chunking is found in how primitive stimuli are grouped into larger concept groups, such as letters into words. Methodologically, a number of approaches have been taken to identify the presence of chunk and to pinpoint the underlying mechanisms by which chunks are created, stored, retrieved, and used. In this brief overview, we focus on the specific family of computational models, EPAM and CREST, that have been closely associated with perceptual chunking. The importance of these models for investigating chunking mechanisms in human learning is threefold. First, the strong similarities between models lead to a consistent theoretical framework being applied in multiple domains. The parsimony strengthens the claim that chunking underlies many aspects of human learning. Second, detailed computational models provide the only realistic form for identifying and assessing the major factors in learning from large, noisy, and changeable sources of information. Third, the use of computational models enables chunks to be predicted instead of simply used to explain behavior post hoc. Some of the clearest evidence for perceptual chunking is found in how primitive stimuli are grouped into larger conceptual groups, such as the manner by which letters are grouped into words, sentences, and even paragraphs. This grouping leads to memory and behavioral effects in which the latencies, the output of items comprising a chunk are shorter than when those items comprise a number of smaller chunks. We illustrate uh, this type of chunking effects in the chess domain, as well as a more complex problem-solving domain involving multiple presentations in physics. A further line of evidence considers the detailed construction and retrieval of perceptual chunks within memory. The manner of which chunks are construed affects the type of generalizations made and so predicts typical errors 
or successes. So I'm going to skip the part about chess because I covered that in my previous streams on the multiple truth hypothesis. We described some research in language learning where the mechanism of chunk combination and generalization are used to predict typical errors in linguistic development of children. Box 2 similar illustrates how specific mechanisms of chunk retrieval and learning capture details of learning curve within a verbal learning experiment. EPAM, shortly after Miller's 1956 paper, Fagenbaum and Simon began to develop a pure and direct implementation of chunking mechanisms known as EPAM, elementary perceiver and memorizer. Learning is simulated by the growth of a discrimination network where internal nodes for the presence of perceptual features and leaf nodes are stored images. The internal representations of external objects, the learning mechanisms detailed below, support the addition of information to leaf nodes and the addition of new tests. Although seemingly a simple model, EPAM has replicated a large number of empirical results in verbal learning and expertise research. Just a limited time, I'm not going to read the box, but anyone listening along, I encourage them to click the link and read the box. Components. The original version of EPAM consisted of a finite short-term memory discrimination network and attention mechanisms. Although the core mechanisms are most apparent in the later version, EPAM 3, the discrimination network consists of a hierarchical sequence of tests with each test located in the internal node of the network. The leaf nodes in the network contain an internal representation of the external object and image and might index further procedural or semantic information in long-term memory. EPAM assumes but does not implement mechanisms for extracting features from its input stimuli. Information flows through EPAM as follows. First, the stimulus is perceived and converted into a set of features. Second, these features are sorted by the test of discrimination network to retrieve a pointer to a node within long-term memory. This pointer is then stored within short-term memory. Third, depending on the internal comparison process, learning may or may not occur within the network. Finally, an action may be taken by the system or else the next stimulus is retrieved from the environment. Note that some mechanisms such as eye movement and learning can operate in parallel. Mechanisms of learning. The extent of what the system's knowledge about a given stimulus is indicated by the leaf node reached after sorting the stimulus through the discrimination network. Learning occurs by comparing the information held in the leaf node with that in the stimulus. If there is a perfect match, no learning occurs. If the image is a subset of the stimulus, additional features are added to the image. Finally, if there is a mismatch, the network is augmented, the leaf node becomes an internal node. With a test for the mismatch and the stimulus of the old image are used as the basis of the new leaf nodes. Time parameters. One of the strongest features of EPAM is that it includes approximate but absolute parameters that allow quantitative predictions to be made about the rate of learning and information retrieval. Some of these parameters characterize capacity limits, but most quantifying the time required for key cognitive processes transversing a node during sorting takes about 10 milliseconds, creating a new node takes about 10 seconds, and adding information to an extant node takes about two seconds. These parameters have been derived from both empirical data and architectural considerations. Domains of application. EPAM has applications to various phenomena in verbal learning. EPAM has also been used to explain the role of context in letter perception, the role of strategies in concept formation, and the acquisition of chess expertise. In particular, the EPAM mechanism for the acquisition of chess expertise led to the development of the chunking theory itself, which had a substantial impact on research into expertise in general. The main limitations of early versions of EPAM include the slow storage of knowledge into long-term memory and the lack of specific mechanisms for creating semantic knowledge. The former assumption seems valid enough for domains where the individuals have a low level of expertise, such as verbal learning. However, research in expert behavior has shown that experts can rapidly store material in their domain of expertise. The next section describes from Crest, which is one of the two recent extensions to EPAM designed to remedy these shortcomings. Crest, chunk hierarchy and retrieval structures features a number of additions to EPAM's basic learning mechanism, providing a greater degree of self-organization and adaption to complex data. This section summarizes some of the new mechanisms within Crest before describing some applications. The general organization of Crest is similar to the earlier versions of EPAM. In addition, all the major mechanisms of EPAM have been retained within Crest. Information in long-term memory is indexed through a discrimination network. 
long-term memory occurs through the process of discrimination and familiarization. Information must first be stored within short-term memory before it can be compared or used, and all time parameters for the learning and retrieval mechanisms are retained. One small difference is that every node within Crest's discrimination network can contain an image. The major changes are in the forms of additional mechanisms for creating lateral links between nodes and for elaborating information within chunks to form more complex schemata. These changes improve the richness of semantic mechanisms without affecting important properties of the previous simulations. Lateral links. A lateral link is the semantic association between two nodes within the discrimination network. Some examples illustrated learning a lateral link can only occur when the system's short-term memory contains a pointer to the relevant nodes within the discrimination network. This constraint ensures that the link between nodes are based only on spatial temporal continuity, thus preserving an essentially prop of perceptual chunks. The nodes within short-term memory are then compared using a similarity function which compares the images or descendant test at the nodes. Broadly speaking, lateral links can be divided into two categories. One category is where the two nodes match the similarity function, and the second category is where they do not. Applications of Crest have used several kinds of lateral link, including similarity links to connect nodes whose images are similar, generative links to connect nodes whose descendant tests are similar production links to form condition action rules and equivalent links to link multiple representations of the same object. Schemata. Crest also proposes mechanisms for the creation of retrieval structures, which are stable structures of retrieval cues. Various forms of specific and generic retrieval structures are described in the literature. The specific retrieval structures that are used in Crest are known as templates and are created automatically during pattern recognition. Templates are created when an internal node meets specific criteria relating to its connectivity, connectivity with other nodes within semantic memory. The figure illustrates a simple example. The template provides a form of slotted schemata with a box with both fixed and variable information and can be referenced within short-term memory as a single chunk. Templates allow specific details of a stimulus to be plugged into appropriate slots, an operation requiring only about 250 milliseconds facilitating rapid recall. And it is the presence of templates that can occur for much of the expert's superior memory skills. Application. Crest has been used in several domains to explore the role and impact of perceptual chunking. In most of these applications, the model learns from naturalistic input and its performance is directly compared with that of human subjects. We focus here on expert behavior in chess, the acquisition of multiple representations in physics, and the acquisition of syntactic categories in language learning. Other applications of Crest include the Piaget and balance beam task, the acquisition of vocabulary, and expert knowledge of computer programs. Expert memory for chess positions. Crest's first application was through chess expertise, continuing earlier research by Berenfeld, uh, Gil Martin and Simon. Crest learns a discrimination network by scanning its simulated eye across positions taken from a large database of master's game. Pieces within the visual field are passed to the discrimination network for learning and information across successive fixations, fixations are combined in short-term memory. Several sets of empirical data have been accounted for by Crest, including the recall of random positions, the role of presentation time, and the effect of various board modifications and eye movements during the first seconds in which a position is presented. These key assumptions account for most of these results. Slow encoding time, unless templates are accessed, limited short-term memory capacity and learning mechanisms that pick up patterns that often recur in game positions. Various proposals for using chunking mechanisms and actual chess playing have also been made. Learning multiple representations in physics. In a similar way to its application in chess, it is possible to apply chunking theory to more general areas of education, as has been proposed by Glazier and others. Our own research group has tackled the learning of electric circuits, a topic often taught in introductory physics courses. In particular, we were interested in how students learn to combine and use multiple representations of electric circuits, producing one form of representation based on the other. As illustrated, the production of the diagrammatic solution can be subdivided based on the latencies in the drawing actions into similar stages. These stages 
are consistent across different subjects and correspond with the model's prediction based on the identification of familiar chunks in the given problem. These results show that the chunking effect arises during complex problem solving and are analogous to those found in the pure recall of chunks in chess and alphabetic citation. Such results have immediate potential for application in the development of educational curricula where the model can be used as a subject in silico for investigating the effectiveness of different presentation content and ordering. Acquisition and synthetic categories. We have developed a variant of Crest called Mosaic that stimulates early acquisition of synthetic categories in children uh, aged two and three years old. Mosaic learns in a similar manner to Crest, taking input from maternal utterances recorded in a play situation where Mosaic differs from the other applications of Crest is in its use of an auditory input and its ability to construct generative links which facilitate the generation of novel utterances. Words associated by generative links form group which approximate more formal synthetic categories. Mosaic can be used to predict the kinds of errors made in combining chunks acquired during early language experience. The patterns of errors within Mosaic conforms to that found in young children, demonstrating that the chunking mechanism within Mosaic and therefore within Crest conform to similar learning mechanisms in humans. Other work has confirmed that these ideas also apply to vocabulary acquisition. Other computational approaches to chunking. Various computational approaches to chunking accept the idea of chunking either as a central or incidental feature. Chunking arises naturally within symbolic models of cognition where elements of information are combined into a single unit. In this article, we have emphasized the use of discrimination network to index long-term memory using the epam crest family of models, although other such families exist. An alternative approach relies on the production rule representation for long-term memory. The two major examples of this are SOUR and ACT-R, which differ in the amount of information contained within their rules and in what information may be incorporated into learning new rules. Within SOUR, chunks are the production action rules themselves, which include explicit goals in their description. Learning new chunks takes advantage of the dependency and sub-goals observed during the problem solving. Within ACT-R, chunks include all types of declarative knowledge, which can take various forms. Note that the epam crest class of models most clearly exemplify the notion of perceptual chunking, whereas the second class incorporates more features relevant to goal-oriented chunking. In recent years, though, both the ACTAR and SOAR communities have added perceptual and motor extensions to the architectures, providing a basis for including perceptual chunking within their models. An unrealized goal for epam crest type models has been include goal-oriented chunking. Non-symbolic computational models represent a further alternative. The essential idea behind these models, including many connectionist networks, is that information should be distributed across multiple units and that no unit should be dedicated to a specific function. This almost by definition rules out chunking mechanisms, although simplified forms are possible. For example, Elman has argued for the value of stage learning cycles in work or language. Learning with simple recurrent networks the idea that the complex recursive grammar is too hard for the simple recurrent networks to learn all at once. And so simple recurrent networks are first trained to identify the local dependencies within the grammar and later to extend these to longer dependencies. In this case, the local dependencies can be interpreted as chunks. Further non-symbolic algorithms can that could similarly be interpreted as learning chunks include Cohen networks and the adaptive resonance theory. Conclusion. The article has described and summarized chunking mechanisms in human learning, focusing on the epam crest families of computational models and their applications. We have identified two broad classes of chunking, goal-oriented and perceptual chunking. From the diversity of available empirical evidence, the general notion of chunking appears to be robust and important in contemporary cognitive sciences. The lesson to be taken away from epam crest examples we have described is that perceptual chunking is a valuable element in distributional accounts in many areas, such as verbal learning, expertise, problem solving, and language acquisition. Future work is likely to see better integration between the goal-oriented and perceptual forms of chunking, leading to more comprehensive application in cognitive theories. Quanta questions for future research. What is the neurophysiological plausibility of computational models based on chunking mechanisms? How can chunking mechanisms be linked to directly to sensors and effectors? And what impact will this have on primitive elements on which chunks are based? How can perceptual and goal-oriented chunking mechanisms best be integrated? Can a theory based purely on chunking mechanisms lay any claim towards being a universal theory of cognition? 
Is language acquisition just like the acquisition of any other type of knowledge? Can the modeling work be extended to include chunking mechanisms in non-human primates and other animals? Okay, Ricardo, thanks for tuning in. Ludvin, Lambie, good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, Ricardo, uh, Jennifer no longer had Sundays available, so uh, Duva took Week in Review solo. Church of Entropy, for a period we were switching the days around, and uh, so I just decided to take Week in Review solo on Sunday. So uh, Week in Review solo with Duvid. The link is uh, um, attached. If you want to hop on, Ricardo, I'll take a break from reading these studies, and we could talk a little bit. You know, Ethan Ralph, if uh, Ricardo's listening, Ethan Ralph reached out to me and said he wanted to book me for a debate, and I said, yeah, sure. JQ, always happy to defend the Jews. So we'll see if that happens. But uh, yeah, so we can review solo Duvid Sunday nights. I've mostly just been reading papers. I've had a few guests, um, a handful of new people, John Wolf, uh, Elliot. But uh, yeah, if you want to pop on and chat, the link is um, attached. Okay, so let's keep it going reading these papers. Um We'll take it in a slightly different direction. I'm going to come back more to uh, Fernand Gobe and Chess and some of the other studies. But I want to see like the multiplicity of chunking theory. So you know, like first with the Gobe, I uh, you know, just the overview of what is what is a chunk, what is chunking, what are the main ideas of chunking theory, what's some of the evidence, and uh, I'm not going to go too much into the psychometrics and like how they devise studies of psychometric and programming to test this stuff. But I, I will share some of the articles. So I think I mentioned this one in Week in Review. This is from 2018. Why life speeds up chunking in the passage of time, of autobiographical time. University of Kansas, Lando, Arndt, Swanson, and Boltman. Why life speeds up, chunking in the passage of autobiographical time. Time seems to speed up as one ages, and it affects how people find meaning in life and plan their future. What creates this perception? We examine the role of chunking, mentally bundling individual movements of experience under broad categories. With age, people group experiences into progressively bigger chunks. Consequently, fewer things seem to have occurred in a given period, so it seems to have passed further, faster in retrospect. Supporting this account, three studies show that people led to chunk versus not chunk their past year perceived it is passing faster. The effect of chunking emerged reliably across converging operations and specifically accelerated in the chunk period, not other periods. Furthermore, chunking increased the appeal of nostalgia, suggesting that the process that accelerated time instigates a compensatory urge to reflect on momentous occasions of one life, implicating for the self across time. Implications for the self across time are discussed. Each year seems to pass faster than the year before. I cannot believe I worked here 10 years already. The semesters flew by much too quick. Uh, where did the summer go? Life is passing by like a ball rolling down a hill. Time often seems to pick up in momentum, going faster and faster as we get older. As children and adolescents, the summer of school year stretched on for eternity. Now in adult life, six weeks fly by almost on notice. And we are astonished, astonished how quickly the years have passed. These are non-trivial perceptions. The way people experience the time, passage of time is bound up with their sense of life's meaning, and the perception that time is rapidly slipping away has repercussions for goal engagement and life satisfaction, among other outcomes. What causes this phenomenon? Although temporal perception relies on many cognitive and affective processes, one process term chunking may play a decisive role in the subjective acceleration of autobiographical time. This article reports initial experimental tests of this possibility. Life speeds up and it matters. Across the globe, adults from all walks of life perceive their time is passing faster than it once did. For example, compared to adolescents and young adults, middle-aged adults reported that their last 10 years passed more quickly. This perception matters for several reasons. One, For one, people are motivated to believe that their lives are meaningful and that they have or eventually will contribute something of lasting worth to society. Threats to these beliefs are illicit 
anxiety, the perception that life is flying by, makes it, makes it difficult to regard oneself as a significant tr contributor to the meaningful cultural drama. It also raises the specter of one's inevitable death, further shaking faith in one's lasting value. Temporal perception also impacts self-regulation. People's choice of which goals to pursue depends on subjective sense of how much time they have left and what they can feasibly accomplish within that span. Events that shorten short and future temporal perspective, which include illness, unemployment, unemployment and relocation, change how people of all ages choose to spend their time. Rather than invest in long-term plans that span many years, they focus on the immediate rewards of close friends and family. One implication is that life's quickening pace may decrease investment goals and take many years to achieve, such as professional training or starting a family. Explaining why life appears to speed up may also help illuminate the self's nature and functioning. Of course, this perception is likely to be multiply determined, so it is worth mentioning some contributing factors before preventing, presenting the current account. One is the decreasing value of a given interval of time in the context of one's entire lifetime. For a 10-year-old, a year is one-tenth of one's life, but for a 70-year-old, it is merely a 70th. Perhaps this smaller ratio equates to less value, and the less relative value attached to a given interval, the faster it seems to have passed by. Another factor is the fear of death. Elderly individuals with high death anxiety have a more pronounced sense of time slipping away, yet this does not account for the fact that time speeds up most in mid-adulthood and not in the later phases of life when the anticipation of one's uh, life ends would seem to be more salient. Also relevant are feelings of control over patterns and cycles in everyday routines. According to the self-determination theory, people are motivated to explore their environment, master new challenges, and integrate these experiences into a core sense of who they are. However, when social situations thwart those tendencies, people see their actions as less self-determined, controlled, and set up by, for by external forces. It is possible that when people are younger, the social environment better promotes their self-determined action. They view their activities as originating more in their own authentic desires. As the years and responsibilities add up, they view their actions as increasingly controlled by external demands, running frantically on the hamster wheel of commitments and deadlines. Sped up by technological and organizational advances, their time is consumed by tasks they must do because time is not their own. They feel as if they, though they have no time. Although these and other factors deserve attention, the purpose of the current research is to gain a better understanding of chunking and its influence on autobiographical time perception. Chunking autobiographical time. The philosopher Douglas Hofstadter speculated that the acceleration of time is the result of lifelong process of chunking, packaging small experiences into bigger units. Our, objective, our subjective experience unfolds continuously from moment to moment, but that is not how we organize autobiographical memory. Instead, we bundle individual moments of lived experience into categories. For example, a person looking back on an afternoon consumed with going to the market, the post office and the bank might compress this multiplicity of actions and events into one generic chunk. In the early phases of life, we had yet to accumulate many chunks or schematic categories, so we experienced moments more completely. Every day offered novel, rich experiences, the first family vacation, the first move to a new house, the first encounter with a scary dog, and so on. Looking back, these periods seem full. Many things stand out in memory as happening, and thus long later in adulthood, as we learn about the world and others and ourselves, we organize time using more and more general chunks, work, chores, family, entertainment, sleep, repeat. We lump more and more moments under these chunks so that few truly new things happen that demand a separate slot in memory. This has the benefit of conserving mental energy and helping us adapt to our surroundings, but the downside is that we notice fewer experiences in a given period of time than we did before, making the period seem shorter. To illustrate, imagine an elderly man and his granddaughter walking through the park. Afterwards, both were asked to make a retrospective judgment on the walk's duration. The granddaughter's time was packed with different and unfamiliar experiences. She took curious note of a strange new bug and sad-looking man asleep on a bench. And when she touched the grass, she was surprised by how cold it felt. Each of these stimulating moments acquires a special significance and takes up a separate place in her memory. Because she remembers so many things happening, time appears to stretch out, and the walk seems to have lasted a long time. The elderly man experiences surrounding an activity in a different way. A well-worn chunk spring to mind, walk in the park. Under that chunk, he claps dozens of impressions, sensations, and vent, so he retains them with less specificity. 
aspects of experience that fell outside of the trunk received little to no consideration. In his memory, only one thing happened, essentially, so the walk seems brief. The idea of chunking is not new in psychology. It has been recognized, for example, as a technique for improving working memory, Miller, 1956. Yet, to the best of our knowledge, no prior research has tested whether chunking accelerates the perceived passage of autobiographical time. Some evidence supports this possibility indirectly. Laboratory experiments show that more recalled events or contextual changes introduced during a period, the longer it seemed to have lasted. Conversely, a couple minutes spent in a routine task are remembered as short or in duration that the time period engaged in a non-routine task. Related studies show that stimuli that are more engaging and trigger higher arousing emotions, whether positive or negative, are remembered as lasting longer than neutral stimuli. For example, presentations of erotic images seem to last longer than bland images. Also, images that appear to be moving towards the self are estimated to take more time than that same images moving away, suggesting the approaching stimuli are automatically interpreted as potential danger, and with the presumed captivation, are judged to progress more slowly. These findings are consistent with the current claim that highly chunk periods offer fewer less stimulating experiences that can be recalled, and thus appears to have passed faster in retrospect. Still, this cognitive research tends to measure time estimations on the scale of seconds and minutes, not the larger autobiographical scale of current interest. In one exception, Avne Babad and Ritov showed that in two field studies of routine influence time perception, in one study, club med vacationers rated how quickly time passed during the beginning, middle, and end of their three or four day holiday. The researchers reasoned that people settle into vacation routine. They should feel that their first day or two of vacation stretched out, whereas subsequent days get shorter and shorter. This is exactly what they found. Chunking and forming a routine are related but distinct processes. On the one hand, habitual or unstimulating experiences are more likely than distinctive experiences to be bundled together into chunks. On the other hand, chunking does not necessarily involve being engaged in a repetitive pattern of predictable actions and events. More centrally, it is a process of reinterpreting the number of things that occurred during the remembered period. Routine is associated with feelings of monotony and even boredom, whereas chunking may be an emotionally cooler process of collapsing experiences into an abstract category so as to take up less space in memory. These points call for direct test of chunking influences. So I'm going to skip the study part to encourage people to read through that. And, you know, just because I read the part at the beginning about the collapse of the wave function and Everett and consciousness, the, you know, the Copenhagen interpretation, people could think of the connection here possibly to quantum mechanics. So I'll read the general discussion overview of the findings. The novelist Carl Nosgaard reflects on how his experience as a boy differed from that of his father. While my days were jam-packed with meaning, when each step opened a new opportunity and when every opportunity filled me to the brim in a way which is now actively incomprehensible, the meaning of his days were not concentrated in individual events but spread over such large areas that it was not possible to comprehend them in anything other than abstract terms. Family was one such term, career another. Few or no unforeseen opportunities at all can be presented them, themselves in the course of his days. He must always have known in broad outline what they would bring and how he would react. This is when time begins to pick up speed. It no longer meets any obstacle. Everything is set. Time races through our lives. The days pass by in flash. In a flash, and before we know what is happening, we are 40, 50, 60. The current research provides experimental evidence for an old answer to an even older question. Why does life speed up as we get older? Although many processes combine to create this perception, the current account builds on the scholarly theorizing of Hofstadter, James, and others that propose that chunking plays a decisive role. As Nosgaard reflects, time accelerates when it is not concentrated in individual events but spread over large areas. Over the lifespan, we learn more about the world and ourselves, which enables us to organize experiences into progressively broader, more abstract categories. As a result, when we look back on a given period, we recall fewer things happening. Consequently, the period seems to have flown by. This account was supported in three studies. After thinking about their past year in terms of broad, familiar categories of experience, people perceived that period is passing faster than did participants in comparison condition. This effect emerged across two 
operationalizations of chunking, computerized and paper pencil procedures, and laboratory and field settings attesting to its robustness and generalizability. Also, chunking effectiveness were distinct from the effects of alternative ways to reinterpret the same period, counterfactual thinking, or chunking over periods of autobiographical time. Furthermore, chunking a given period accelerated that period specifically and did not generally influence judgments of the passage of other recollected periods. The current findings are consistent with the cognitive research on time passage judgments, but go further to isolate the chunking process and measure judgments on, at the autobiographical scale of years rather than seconds and minutes spent in artificial laboratory-based tasks. It is worth noting the indications used here are meant to stimulate a chunking process that we suspect takes place spontaneously. Research would thus benefit from trying to capture some of the naturalistic ways people chunk their lived experiences. Nevertheless, this current results point to the conclusion that chunking is a major factor in a person's perception of the passage of autobiographical time. Of course, the present findings, while providing a novel initial evidence, are likely just the tip of a proverbial iceberg and invites questions to be addressed by future research. Many of these pertain to what might be expected from any burgeoning research program, that is, studies are needed to further inform the internal validity of chunking as an operative process of, in temporal acceleration to examine the meditational mechanism underlying the effect, as well as its moderation, and to examine the downstream consequences it might precipitate. We briefly comment on each. Further testing chunking's parameter. Although the present studies contrasting chunking in Reductions from a specific period with an alternative control of the same period in parallel chunking. Inductions for other periods, further comparison conditions are needed to identify the parameter of the effect. For example, it remains to be seen whether the effect of chunking on accelerating time is the result of familiarity-based categorizations. To be sure, time passes more quickly when one is engaging in routine and familiar activity, yet the current analysis suggesting that chunking is not reducible to routine. As long as experiences are grouped under broad chunks, even those that are unfamiliar or idiosyncratic, then the respective period should seem faster in retrospect. Evidence supporting this claim comes from unpublished study in our laboratory. When participants were asked to chunk last year's experience into those that involved law enforcement or not, likely an unfamiliar categorization for most people, they perceived that year as passing faster compared to participants who did not chunk in this manner. Although preliminary this finding points to importance of chunking beyond just as the recollection of familiar routine. In a related possibility, chunking observed effect may stem from the other processes associated with simply dwelling in what's past, such as cognitive fluency. Study one casts doubt on this interpretation because altogether, although all participants dwell in their past year, those who thought about how typical this year's events were felt that the year passed faster than those who generated counterfactual events. More direct tests came from unpublished studies in our laboratory. In one, participants who categorized this past year's events into two activity-based categories perceived this year as passing faster than those who were grouped in the same category of events into 14 activity-based categories. Presumably, participants in given 14 categories to choose from reflected on the year as much as or more than those given just two broad categories, hence the effect is unlikely to be due to mere reflection. More likely, the larger number of categories better preserve the distinctiveness of each remembered event, thus attenuating the accelerating influence on broader categorizations. In another study, participants who had chunked the year's events into two broad activity categories perceived this year as passing faster than those asked to judge the same number of events as globally positive or negative. This latter task involved an equivalent degree of overall reflection of the same period and using the same number of labels as in the key chunking condition. Our interpretation is that activity-based chunking task flattens the distinctive shape of the individual events, whereas assigning events at a global valence does not. These findings are consistent with the proposed account of chunking's unique influence in time perception, yet are difficult to explain in terms of mere reflection, cognitive fluency, or related mechanisms. Mechanisms. The question then becomes, what exactly does chunking accelerate? Why exactly does chunking accelerate autobiographical time? The present analysis suggested that it does so because after chunking, fewer things seem to have occurred in a given period. Recall the hypothetical example of the elderly man and his granddaughter, whereas her afternoon featured an introduction 
two previously unencountered insect, a vestige of a person sleeping in a sorrow in a bench, and the touch of cool blades of grass, his afternoon featured but a walk in the park. Hence, the reduction in the quality of experience may lead to the sense that time passes more rapidly from a subjective viewpoint, perhaps because with fewer experiences, there is less cognitive effort expanded towards attention and memory of the period in question. Of course, this mechanistic account remains speculative. Future work should test it directly with meditational designs and measurement, moderation. It is also likely that various conditions can mitigate or exasperate people's propensity to chunk. For example, individual and situational variation in need for structured knowledge or elevated needs for epistemic closure should lead people to seize on simple interpretations of their experiences, that is, interpretations that are easily labeled and filed under large chunks. A strong desire for accurate knowledge, in contrast, should decrease the appeal of clear cut interpretations and thus prevent runaway chunking. In a similar vein, individual differences such as self-complexity, whereby an individual has a sense of many distinct selves doing different types of activity with different relationship partners in different settings may predispose resistance to chunking and other possible antidotes mindfulness, whether dispositionally high or situationally induced, when the individual resides more fully in the moment, he may also better appreciate the uniqueness of those moments once they have passed, making it less likely those moments are similarly compressed into generic chunk. Further future research should examine pathways to be a more mindful relation to one's experience, such as meditation and engaging with art, these experiences have the potential to resensitize us to the satisfactions of simple things and perhaps counteract life's quickening pace. Downstream consequences. From the current perspective, chunking is not a quirk of temporal perception. It is ramifications for identity, self-regulation, and psychology of well-being. Indeed, studies two and three provide preliminary insights on in how chunking may impact other autobiographical phenomena with wide research and downstream consequences. In both studies, participants who were led to chunk their past year relative to those who chunked days indicated greater value on the emotion of nostalgia, such as finding ads to previous research showing that nostalgia increase when people are faced with limited time horizons. Although chunking does not limit temporal horizons per se, it does appear to speed up an individual's sense of how swiftly time flows. Nostalgia must, may thus emerge in part as a way of putting the brakes on this temporal acceleration allowing people to maintain the meaningfulness, coherence, and continuity of individual autobiographical experiences. A connection between chunking and nostalgia hints at how chunking may reverberate to impact different aspects of psychological well-being and quality of life. Despite being originally conceptualized as psychological malady, the last decade of research has shown that nostalgia is a vital psychological resource whose ripples fill life with a sense of social connectedness continuity, self-determination, esteem, and inspiration. Thus, it may be informative to consider how chunking impacts these and other self-relevant outcomes. Yet it is important to acknowledge the effects of chunking on nostalgia may well be complex. On the one hand, if chunking accelerates life by compressing individual experiences into broad categories, it should prompt a compensatory sense of the importance of nostalgia and urge to reflex nostalgically in one's temporally expansive past. The hypothesis led Studies two and three to focus on participants' valuing of nostalgia and the results were consistent with the, this reasoning. On the other hand, by accelerating or glossing over the intricacy of distinct life experiences, chunking may disrupt focus on the distinctive moments that are candidates for sentimental reflection and thus decrease the experience of nostalgia. Broadly consistent with this is evidence of contrasting lifespan trajectories for autobiographical time perception and engagement with nostalgia. The sense that one's life is speeding up most pronounced in the middle adulthood, whereas nostalgia tends to be lower in middle adulthood. This contrast makes sense if nostalgia puts the brakes on temporal acceleration. The present study did not examine the experience of nostalgia and thus the disassociate between chunking induced nostalgic desire in the experience is only speculative awaiting future research. Use caution when slowing down. Why study the process behind life's apparent acceleration? The current studies were partly inspired by the notion perceiving life as rapidly slipping away is psychologically harmful, unpleasant, demotivating, and possibly even hostile to the sense that life is meaningful. Empirical evidence resonates, as do several anecdotal observations for common complaints that a vacation vanished in the blink of an eye. 
to the romanticizing of a child's apparent oblivionness to time and their ability to harvest a cornucopia of experience from any given afternoon, and to the profusion of self-help campaigns promising to correct our hard relationship with time by intentionally slowing down how we work, eat, and have sex. Still, slow-moving time can itself be harmful. A prime example is the experience of boredom. In some cases, boredom is worse than unpleasant. It poses a profound existential threat. Feeling bored can make the current situation seem purposeless and life seem meaningless, motivating people to alleviate oppression, oppressive boredom by finding ways to rejuvenate, re-inject life with meaning. Although boredom is a multifaceted state involving dimensions other than time, it is demonstratively tied to the perception that time is moving too slowly, often resulting from repetition or lack of simulate, stimulation. Your current author recently experienced this while recovering from an injury. As I sat motionless on my couch for four weeks, the hours and minutes slowed to an excruciating pace. Each moment was like a stranger staring at me, and I stared back in disgust, waiting for sleep to deaden my consciousness. As is raised a question, are these two existential threats, too fast time and too slow time, psychologically distinct, or do they result from a shared process? It is possible that both stem from chunking. The difference may lie in temporal perspective. When one chunks right perspectively, lumping past experiences into well-worn categories, time and life seem to rapidly slip away. This is what we see in the current studies, for example, but when one chunks synchronously, that is concurrent with the experience being chunked, time seems to drag. Each moment feels like a hollow echo of the preceding moment. That explains why one can alleviate boredom by finding something in the current situation that yields distinctive detail or value, thereby dissolving the overbearing chunk that forces each present moment to still conformity. This possibility fits Williams James' observation that the sameness of experience has divergent effects on estimates of length of time depending on perspective. In general, a time filled with varied and interesting experiences seems, seems short in passing, but long as we look back. On the other hand, a tract of time empty of experiences seems long in passing, but in retrospect short. A week of travel and sightseeing may subtend an angle more like three weeks in the memory, and a month of sickness hardly yields more memories than a day. The length in retrospect depends obviously on the multitudinous of the memories which the time affords. Many objects, events, changes, many subdivisions immediately widen the view as we look back. Emptiness, monotony, familiarity, familiarity make it shrivel up. Tracing too fast time and too slow time to a common source has the advantage of explaining why people reach for similar strategies to compensate for both existential threats. Perhaps the most interesting of these is nostalgia. In the current studies, we saw that people were motivated to encourage engaged nostalgia after chunking accelerated their past year and complementary research by Tilburg. Nostalgia reestablished life's meaningfulness when people felt bored with the activity at hand. Specifically, induced boredom instigated a search for meaning in life, which mediated the effect of boredom on nostalgia. Also, nostalgic engagement effectively restored meaningfulness in the face of boredom. Bridging these findings, it's possible that nostalgia's existential utility lies in lifting out one out of stale experiential categories by evoking momentous occasions, and this way keeping the present flowing at a stimulating pace and stoking the past with the distinctive memories that makes life seem full. Further research could test whether retrospective versus synchronous chunking has diverging effects on perceptions of autobiographical time. They're just some of the many distractions along which future research might proceed by providing initial evidence for a role of chunking in a subjective autobiographical time perception. This present studies provide an empirical foundation for classic theorizing as well as generative intuition for future discovery. So that was one of the key articles I wanted to read. So a lot of information there, a lot of things that I want to talk more about. So yeah, KL, um, I'll look into that a different time. Beauty and Consolation, a Dutch journalist. So thanks for linking that. Um, you join my Discord too. Join my Discord and share share that in my Discord if you're interested. Um, so you know, like I first started with the quantum mechanics and the collapse of the wave function. So it'd be interesting to try to combine chunking possibly chunking in general, that chunking is a form of the collapse of the wave function. So it's just a hypothesis what I was thinking about while reading it, the connection between chunking and the collapse of the wave function, and that would be 
why chunking creates an irreversibility of time. Every time you chunk, it creates some sort of irreversibility of time and a collapse of the wave function. That would be an interesting idea. Also, some of my research on narrative identity in relation to chunking. Chunking and narrative identity is a form of chunking. My story that has formed my identity, I believe who I am is part of a story or how I perceive others, and those are chunks. And when the narrative isn't written yet, time flows slower, as where when you feel yourself as part of an understood story, that would be another interesting area of research. This recent, like 2018, so like Dufit, you know, forwarding my research to where I'm at the point of coming up with new ideas and have done, of having done the due diligence to, uh, you know, know the research on it. So you feel like I'm making a lot of progress, probably another six month, another six months of like these long weekend reviews and readings to really, you know, get a good feel of, you know, the due diligence to push forward. And also music, like I mentioned, you know, like the hero's journey, where a lot of the hero's journey is removing yourself from society and working really hard. So, you know, this long period of like sickness, but also the long period of hard work. A lot of times like the song, like the Eye of the Tiger and Rocky. So like the movie Rocky, I don't know if it's like an hour and a half, two hours. Um, Time-wise, the majority of the movie is his training sequence. However, the whole training sequence, which encompasses the majority of the time is narrowed into like a two minute clip, two, three minute clip of eye of the tiger over like two, three months of training. And then you have the long fight and like, you know, the beginning of the buildup. And so like a lot of movies, you have the, the training sequence and the training sequence has a song and the song represents that whole period of time. And then, you know, the fight, you know, Rocky, the fight, you know, like it's 20 minutes at the end, like the, the of the movie. And so time slows down in those sequences. So a lot of the movies um, express this element of time slowing down and then the use of a song to represent the period where time flows by quicker. And like the William James, the comment that time flows slower in the period. So at the time, for the person, like the training sequence of the months of training, time feels like it's going really slowly. But when you look back, it feels like it could all be chunked into one training sequence as opposed to the actual event where time feels like it's going by really slowly. Um, but in the future, it might be uh, chunked. So you have definitely stuff to look into more. Okay, so a lot to cover, a lot of research, a lot of information here. Okay, so let's look at the relation to linguistics. Yeah, I mean, maybe Descartes, you know, embed training, you know, so to say, like, time slowed down for the period. And at that point, it was, like, excruciating. Maybe he thought really hard about these concepts. And... So, you know, a lot more research into it. Okay, so I want to look at chunking in relation to linguistics in a newer form. You know, like where I mentioned the cognitive revolution and Chomsky and like the mentalese and these syntactical structures and kind of like um, the new method of uh, chat GPT where you have syntactical structures and then there's a word choice as opposed to new theories of language learning as opposed to having rules and uh, structures and then filling words into rules and structures to say that it's more a form of chunking and that rules and structures are secondary, maybe templates or operate within chunking. So these are more recent theories in linguistics. It was 25 years ago that Michael Lewis published The Lexical Approach, 
1993, prompting a radical rethink of the way we view language and by extension of the way we teach it in contrast to the then prevailing structural account in which language was viewed as comprising grammatical structures to which single words are slotted. Lewis argued that language consists of chunks which when combined produce continuous coherent text. By chunks, Lewis was referring to everything from collocations, fixed expressions, formulaic utterances, sentences, starters, verb patterns, idioms, and catchphrases. Everything, in fact, that does not fit into the categories of either grammar or single word vocabulary. Lewis was by no means the first to describe language in these terms. His singular contribution was to argue that in order to accommodate this alternative description, it was language teaching that needed to be reformed or indeed revolutionized. This paper charts the extent to which the lexical approach of or learning language as chunks as Lewis and subsequent scholars conceived it is being applied a quarter of a century on and the research that underpins such an approach. So some key terms, chunk, an all-purpose word that embraces any formulaic sequence, lexical parse, phrasal expression, or multi-word item, cluster or bundle, any commonly occurring sequence of words, irrespective of meaning or structural completeness, collocation, two or more words that frequently occur together, corpus, the database the text typically authentic, which is digitally accessible for the purpose of calculating frequency, identifying uh, calculations, formulaic language, a sequence continuous or discontinuous of words or other meaning elements, which is or appears to be prefabricated that is stored and retrieved whole from the memory at the time of use, rather than being subject to a generation or analysis by the language grammar. Functional expression, formulaic ways of expressing specific language functions, idiom, an expression whose meaning is not the sum of its individual words. Idiom principle, the principle of language use whereby a language user has available to him or a large number of semi-preconstructed phrases that constitute single choices, even though they may appear to be analyzable in segments. This contrasts with the open choice principle, where the only restraint on a word choice is grammaticalness. Idiomasticity, the degree to which a particular wording is conventionalized in the speech community, lexical approach, an approach to language teaching that foregrounds the contribution of vocabulary, including lexical chunks to language use and acquisition, lexical phrase, one of many alternative terms to describe multi-word items, um, mutual information, a statistical measure of the strength of a collocation based on the likelihood of its individual element occurring together more frequently than would be expected by chance, an engram, a cluster defined in terms of its length, phrasal verb, a combination of a verb plus a particle, either adverb or preposition that is often idiomatic, phraseology, a general term to describe the recurring features of a language that are neither individual words nor grammatical structures. Key issues. Lewis's lexical approach was strongly, even fiercely argued, but was often sketchily supported by evidence. In the intervening years, researchers directly or indirectly have been investigating his claims with a view to answering these key questions, among others. One, to what extent does language consist of chunk? Two, how might the learning of chunks benefit language learning overall? Three, how can chunks be integrated into the second language curriculum? Four, how are chunks best learned and taught? What materials and activities might support their acquisition? This paper addresses each of these questions in turn. So I'm just going to look at uh, the first one because uh, there's a lot to get through. Research and literature review, significant findings. To what extent does language consist of chunks? In order to estimate the prop proportion of spoken or written text that is chunk-like, we first define chunk. This is easier said than done. The number of terms that are used to capture the phenomenon is bewildering. One writing listed over 50, but current practice seems to favor an uncountable umbrella term formulaic language embracing different types of multi-word units, or what most non-academic texts for teachers simply referred to as lexical chunks. These in turn can be subdivided into such overlapping categories as collocations, lexical phrases, phrasal verbs, functional expressions, idioms, and so on. What are the items in these categories have in common is that they consist of more than one word, they're conventionalized, they exhibit varying degrees of fixedness, they exhibit uh, various degrees of idiomicity, they probably learned in process as a single items or holophrases. 
Word combinations are conventionalized if they occur together with more than chance frequency. Corpus linguistics has exponentially enhanced our knowledge of what combinations of words are significantly frequent. Thus, the sequence of no way of ing can be completed with virtually any verb, but uh, only one knowing is significantly frequent. It is more than 10 times more common than the next most frequent combination, no way of telling. Moreover, according to the corpus of contemporary American English, it is relatively common across a variety of registers, spoken language, fiction, news, and academic writing. With regards to fixedness, an example of a fixed chunk is by the way of which is the discourse marker allows no variation by a way, by the way, on the way, however, allows some variation on my way. By and large is an example of a chunk that is not only fixed, but also idiomatic. It is non-compositional. Its composite meaning cannot be inferred from its individual words. By the way, on the other hand, is less idiomatic since even in its sense of marking a new direction in the discourse, its meaning is relatively easily derived from its parts. In terms of the psycholinguistic status, this is the way that they are mentally stored and accessed. There's growing evidence from eye tracking and read aloud studies that chunks are processed holistically rather than a sequence of individual words. This is attributed to frequency effects. The more often a sequence or morpheme of words is encountered, the more likely it is represented and retrieved as a single unit. However, it would be unwise to assume that what the corpus data reveals about recurring sequences necessarily in reflects the way that these sequences are mentally organized using dictation and delayed recall tasks, Schmidt found that neither their naive or their non-naive speaker informants consistently retrieve chunks as a whole units, leading them to conclude that it is unwise to take recurrence of clusters in a corpus of evidence that those clusters are also stored as formulaic sequences in the mind. Nevertheless, and regardless of how chunks are defined, their persuasiveness is a fact of life. One frequently cited estimate is that nearly 60% of spoken languages is formulaic to some degree. Bieber, using slightly different criteria, found that 45% of the words in their extensive corpus of conversational English, but only 21% academic prose, occurred in what they called bundles, recurrent expressions, regardless of their idiomaticity and regardless of their structural status. Some high frequency for word bundles in spoken English include, I don't want, I don't know what, I don't think so, I was going to, do you want to? On the other hand, they found many fewer instances of idiomatic phrases of the type, in a nutshell, a piece of cake, fall in love, or slap in the face. These tend to occur more often in fiction than in spoken language. Idiomatic expressions that do occur with high frequency in both spoken and written language are verb plus noun phrase combinations with have, make, and take, as in have a look, make sense, take time, and phrasal verbs, especially in spoken language, those with come, go, and put. A number of studies have attempted to compute the frequency of chunks compared to that of single words and have established that there are many chunks that are as frequent as or more frequent than the most frequent individual words. In one study using the 10 million word spoken section of the British National Corpus, the researchers identified the most frequently occurring collocations and found that 84 collocations qualified for inclusion in the top thousand word band, examples being, you know, I think a bit as well in fact, with an increasing number of collocations eligible for inclusion in successive bands. In a similar fashion, Martinez and Schmidt, using slightly different criteria, identified over 500 phrasal, phrasal expressions that would qualify for inclusion in a list of the top 5,000 word families, both written and spoken. Examples include, after all, as soon as, make sure, once again. Other researchers have investigated not just the frequency, but also the distribution of lexical chunks in different registers of both spoken and written text. Bieber, for example, concluded that their patterns of use are not accidental, but that they form the building blocks of discourse and often correlate with specific textual functions such as expressing the speaker, writer attitude, or foregrounding new information. As such, they represent an important indicator of the text register as well as measures of the speaker or writer's command of that register. So I'm going to skip the other sections just because there's a lot to cover. But uh, you know, there's the use in education and second language learning. So 
So there's approaches to teaching, uh, the phrasal approach, awareness raising approach, analytical approach, communicative approach, assuming that language is learned through chunking. So just look at a little here. Uh, teach chunks instead of relying on learning autonomous incidental chunk uptake owing to awareness raising alone. Select chunks for targeting not just on the basis of frequency, but also on the basis of evidence of collocation strength and teachability. Reveal non-arbitrary properties of chunks to make them more memorable. Complement in order to improve the chances of retention. Complement noticing by also encouraging elaboration of meaning and form. So here for the phrasal approach, rote learning of formulaic expressions, drilling, shadowing, jazz chants, the awareness raising approach, extensive reading and listening tasks, preferably using authentic material, chunking text, identifying possible text, and checking these against a collocation dictionary by using online corpora to check the relative frequency of word sequences, listening to extracts of authentic speech and marking a transcript into tone units in order to identify likely chunks, record keeping and frequent review, recycling chunks in learners' own text, either spoken or written, the analytical approach, targeting teaching of selected chunks, those that are driven metaphorically from a particular source domain, such as seafaring, noticing patterns of sound repetition, as in short and sweet, take a breath, use of memory training techniques such as mnemonics, frequently recycling and review. In the communicative approach, the use of survey type activities and guessing games that involve the repetition of formulaic expressions, repeating, repeating speaking tasks with different partners and or to a time limit in order to encourage chunking, scripting, rehearsing, memorizing, and performing dialogues that include formulaic expression. So key considerations. Whatever produce procedures we adapt is worth bearing in mind that chunks are really just big words and hence more, if not all of the principles of effective vocabulary teaching apply equally to the teaching of chunks as they do to the teaching of individual words. These include taking into account the distinction between teaching for production as well as for recognition, the necessity of focusing on meaning as well as on form, the importance of teaching vocabulary in context rather than isolated terms, the need for a deliberate teaching of vocabulary rather than relying on solely on incidental learning, the value of having learners make decisions about the items they are learning, adding to the principle that the more one engages with a word, the more likely the word will be remembered for later use, the importance of learners forming associations with vocabulary items in order to establish mutually reinforcing semantic networks as an aid to memory, the necessity of regular review, including spaced repetition, reviewing previously learned material at increasingly larger interviews, intervals of time, the value of having learners make their own decisions as to what they know and how to learn, they learn vocabulary, including setting their own targets and measuring their own success at meeting these. So implications for teachers. Okay, so a lot of information there. Not sure if someone wants to pop on the links in the chat because I have a lot more I want to cover. Um, so I'm going to take a break for a second. Just grab a drink and say Shema Yisrael. So links in the chat if anyone wants to hop on. Pour myself some tea. Okay, so keep it going, a lot to cover. Um,
yeah, there's a lot of material here. Like I almost want to read, you know, some of these all the way through. They're so powerful, like, uh, you know, real deep dive into chunking. Yeah, these are all long articles, really important. Um, so just trying to think here. I mean, like, there's just so much information here. Chunking is really deep. Um, Like, a lot of these are really long. So this one, back to the language. So this is a dissertation from University of Michigan, a little bit more on linguistics. So here, Nick Ellis um, from Chunking, Constructions, Chunking, and Connectionism, the Emergence of Second Language Structure. So that last paper, we're also talking about second language acquisition and uh, different theories of linguistics. So let me just read the introduction overview, and then we'll look a little bit at the chunking section. And this is long as like a 60-page paper. Constructive views of language acquisition hold that simple learning mechanisms operating in and across the human system for perception, motor action, and cognition as they expose the language, language data as a part of the communicatively rich human social environment by an organism eager to exploit the functionality of language is enough to drive the emergence of complex language representation. The various tribes of constructivism, connectionism, functional linguistics, emergentists, cognitive linguistics, construction of child language researchers, applied linguists influenced by chaos, complexity theory, and the computational linguistics who explore statistical approaches to grammar. All of these share functional development usage-based perspective on language. They emphasize the linguistic sign as a set of mappings between phon phonological forms and conceptual meaning or communicative intention. Thus, their theories of language function acquisition and neurobiology attempts to unite speakers, syntax, and semantics, the signifiers and the signifieds, they hold that structural regularities of language emerge from a learner's lifetime analysis of the distributional characteristics of the language input, and thus that the knowledge of the speaker healer here cannot be understood as grammar, but rather as a statistical ensemble of language experiences that change slightly every time a new utterance is processed. Consequently, they analyze language acquisition processes rather than final state of language acquisition device. They work within the broader remit of cognitive science seeking functional and neurobiological descriptions of the learning process, which through exposure to representative experience result in change, development, emergence of linguistic representation. Section one of this review describes cognitive linguistic theories of constructive grammar. These focus on constructions as recurrent patterns of linguistic elements that serve some well-defined linguistic function. These may be at the sentence level or below Whereas government binding theory denied constructions, viewing them as an epiphenomenon resulting from the interaction of higher level principles and parameters of lower level lexicon, cognitive linguistics and constructive grammar in particular, has brought them back to the fore, suspecting instead that as the higher level systematicities that emerge from the interactions of constructions large and small. Section two concerns the development of constructions as complex chunks, as high level schemata for abstract relations such as transitivities locatives, datives, and, or passives, and acquis acquisition sequence from formula through lower scope patterns to construction is proposed as a useful starting point to investigate the emergence of constructions and the ways in which type and token frequency affect the productivity of patterns. Section three presents the psychological leanings learning mechanisms which underpin the acquisition sequence. It describes genera of associated learning mechanisms such as chunking, which when applied to a stream of language provide a rich source of knowledge of sequential dependencies ranging from low level binary chunks like bigrams through phon phon phonotactics, lexis, and collocations up to the formulae of idioms, 
although a very basic learning mechanism, shrunking results in a hierarchical representation of structure dependency. Emergences believe that many of the rule-like regularities that we see in language emerge from the mutual interactions of the billions of associations that are acquired during language usage, but the hypothesis requiring testing some formal analysis. Section four describes how connectionism provides a means of evaluating the effectiveness of the implementations of these ideas and simulations of language acquisitions, which are run using computer models consisting of many artificial neurons connected in parallel. Two models of emergence linguistic regularity are presented in detailed illustration. Other simulations show how analysis of sequential dependencies result in grammatically useful abstract linguistic representation, the broad scope of constructionist and other distributional approaches to language acquisitions briefly outlined. The review concludes by discussing some of the limitations of work to date and provides some suggestions for future progress. If 33, if that's you, God forbid the last time I got porn bombed. So give me some sort of message, 33, if that's you, like who you are, what you want to talk about, because I don't recognize you. And, you know, last time I got porn bombed. So if you want to, uh, set, you know, like type a chat or something, um, So let's look at the chunking. So like I mentioned chess and chess studies, but the reality is, is that um, the linguistics is probably much more important than chess. It just comes from chess. A lot of the studies come from chess. But I think chunking now is much more important to linguistics. And it's just historical or for certain mechanisms of studying expertise when we get back to expertise because it's easier to measure levels of expertise in something like chess where you have like winners and losers as opposed to language where it's more difficult to define what expertise is in use of language. Chunking. What's the next letter in the sequence beginning T? You know it's more likely to be an H or a vowel than it is a Z or other consonants. You know that it couldn't be a Q, but I'll warrant you have never been taught this. What is the first word in the sentence? You are likely to plump the the or the that rather than thinks or theosophy. If the, how does it continue? With an adjacent, an adjective or a noun, you might reply, if the cat, then what? And then again, complete the cat said on the fluent native speakers, know a tremendous amount about the consequences, about the sequence of language at all grains. We know how letters tend to co co-occur, common bigrams, tigrams, and other orthographic regularities. We know the phonetic of our tongue. We know phrase structure regularities. We know thousands of concrete calculations, and we know abstract generalizations that derive from them. We have learned to chunk letters, sounds, morphemes, words, phrases, clauses, bits of co-occurring language at all levels. Psycholinguistic experiments show that we are tuned to these regularities and what we possess faster and more easily language, which accords with the expectations that have come from our unconscious analysis of serial probabilities and our lifelong history of inputs. We learned these chunks from the very beginnings of learning a second language. Ellis Lee and Reber observed people reading their first 64 sentences of foreign language. When they read, they saw the referent of each sentence. A simple action sequence involved colored geometric shapes, for example, um, a sentence uh, was accompanied by a cartoon showing a square moving on to red circles. A linguistic description of the language might include the fact that a subject-object verb language, it has an adjective noun word order, obligatory grammatical number, agreement in the form of matching suffix endings of a verb and its subject and noun in the adjective that it modifies, that the 64 sentences are all of the type uh, subject-object verb, and that the Lexus was selected from a very small set of eight words. But such explicit metalinguistic knowledge is not the stuff of early language acquisition. What did the learners make of it? So I'm actually not going to read any more of this. There's a lot to this, and it's just too much. So a lot, a lot to cover. So, you know, just uh, people want to read more about that. There's a lot of interesting things in there. And linguistic is something that I do pl plan on turning more back to. So that's the end of the, my stuff on linguistics.
Um, so I have stuff on memory and chess. So let's go into the memory. And, and then I want to hit more back to Go Bay on the you know the main theories of Crest and Epon that were pretty important. And so another article from Go Bay. Actually, I'm gonna skip this one. So you know, just to mention here's I, I read the earlier shorter article of Fernand Gobe on chunking in the education. So just because there's a lot to cover, um, I'll just share this. I'll read the uh, abstract. Chunking models offers a parsimonious explanation of how people acquire knowledge have been validated in domains such as expert behavior and the acquisition of language. In this paper, we review two computational theories based on chunking mechanism the chunking theory and the template theory, and show what insight they offer for instruction and training. The suggested implication includes the importance of perception and learning, the cost of acquiring knowledge, and the significance of segmenting and ordering instructional material, the role of the variability of the instructional material in acquiring schemata, and the importance of taking individual differences into account. So actually, I am going to... Uh, read a little bit more of this. While our understanding of learning and instruction has improved substantially during the last century, there are still a number of key questions that denote islands of ignorance. Among the most pressing of the questions one may mention, what are the mechanisms of learning? What is the exact role of feedback? To what extent does transfer exist? And how do we facilitate its presence in order to which, in which a curriculum is taught, and is the order in which a curriculum is taught important? How can instruction produce learning with understanding as opposed to only skill accretion? And how can we harness the new resources offered by advances in technology and to improve the education we provide to our children? The first thesis of this article is that the principles and mechanisms derived from research into expertise can inform research and education. By this, we do not mean to imply that training techniques used by tech experts should be imported without change into the classroom, but rather that an understanding of how experts reach high levels of performance could suggest general learning mechanisms and thus help design better teaching methods, both at high and low levels of expertise. The second thesis concerns the medium that best embodies theories of learning, in particular, when they address the acquisition of complex skills, becoming an expert or assimilating the contents of a curriculum at school, engages a number of cognitive processes that will interact with each other while the teaching environment and the subject matter uh, to be learned. Given the complexity and the dynamic character of these processes and interaction, their detailed and vertical description requires the use of theories implemented in computer programs. Alternative media are likely to be unsatisfactory. As they lose significant amount of information, verbal theories will not do, as they cannot capture the constraints provided by the learner and its environment, and mathematical theories will require too many simplifying assumptions. Okay, so 33, let me read a little bit more of this article and we talk about Freemason and we take a break. A third thesis argues that theories based on chunking mechanisms, in particular the chunking of the template theory, not only provide a powerful explanation of expert behavior, but also give critical guidance about how learning occurs in the classroom with the educational principles that can be derived from these theories, sometimes clash with the principles advocated by other theories in education. They also lead to testable predictions. This article first highlights some of the most striking phenomena in research into expertise, then it outlines two closely linked theories of expertise, the chunking theory and the template theory, and shows how they can account for many of these phenomena. Based on the analysis of mechanism underpinning these two theories, we then infer several principles that are direct relevance to education. Finally, we identify some limits in our approach and suggest directions for further research. Key phenomena of expertise. Some of the most striking phenomena characterize 
in expert behavior were first discovered by de Groot and Chase and Simon in their work on chess and later replicated by research of other domains. There are at least two reasons why chess was chosen. Its competitive nature makes it possible to precisely differentiate between skill levels, which is not the case in many domains of expertise studied in psychology, such as medicine and physics. Chess also offers a nice balance between simplicity of the rules and complexity in the space of possible games. This enables both the design of elegant experiments and fruitful cross-fertilization with mathematics and artificial intelligence. A first obvious result is that experts, by suppressing normal cognitive and physical limits, can attain performances that seem extraordinary to lay people. Among other things, experts develop mechanisms that overcome novices, limited learning rates, and memory capacities. Experts are often able to recognize the key features of a problem rapidly using perceptual cues. The perceptual expertise enables them to be highly selective in their search and to solve routine problems without exploring many alternatives. Indeed, in some domains such as firefighting or nursing, experts explore only one option. This professional eye seems to be made possible by the extensive knowledge that experts have of their domain. The present and role of such knowledge has been experimentally shown by experts' ability to memorize briefly presented material much better than novices. A further empirical generalization is that it takes a long time of intense dedication to become an expert, at least 10 years in many domains. Finally, transfer seems to be minimal from one domain of expertise to another. An extensive discussion of these results is provided by Gobe for chess and other board games, a broader coverage of expertise offered by several edited collections as well as by articles. So the chunking theory. Chase and Simon proposed their chunking theory in order to explain the phenomenon we just highlighted. Their starting point was a computer program called EPAM, Elementary Perceiver Memorizer, which postulates that learning occurs through an incremental growth of a discrimination network, giving access to long-term memory within this Network external stimuli are sorted to the appropriate chunk through a sequence of perceptual tests. Each learning process takes a definite amount of time. The chunking theory also was influenced by Perceiver, a program by Simon and Berenfeld, 1969, had developed to explain aspects of attention and perception in chess. To account for differences between novices and expert in memory tasks, Chase and Simon added assumptions about the capacity of short term memory, which they proposed was limited to seven items. They hypothesized that chess players perceive a chess position as chunks, which can be defined as groups of pieces forming perceptual and semantic units. Pointers to these chunks are placed in short-term memory, and then recall the position consists of unpacking the information contained in these chunks. Given that chess masters have acquired more and larger chunks than weaker players, they can memorize briefly presented chess positions better. These ideas were implemented in a computer program called MAP, Memory Aided Pattern Perceiver, which led to the estimates that it takes about 50,000 long-term memory chunks to reach chess master's performance in the recall task. To account for the master's ability to find good moves, without carrying out extensive search, Chase and Simon postulated that chunks are linked to suggesting for plans, moves, and other types of information. Perceptual chunks thus act as conditions to actions, and the chunking theory realizes a simple production system. Chase and Simon also propose mechanisms explaining how look-ahead search can be carried out in the mind's eye. In particular, they emphasize that recognition mechanisms occur both using information in the external board and information in the imagined positions. Thus, contrary to common misconception, the chunking theory's recognition mechanisms explain both master's ability to find moves intuitively, that is, almost instantly in routine positions, and their ability to carry out selective search when necessary. Chase and Simon's theory was able to explain a number of phenomena in chess expertise using simple mechanisms, and these mechanisms also apply at least the first approximation to other domains of expertise as well. These include expertise in arts, sports, science, and professions. However, in spite of this popularity, researchers have also identified a number of weaknesses with the theory. These weaknesses relate primarily to the emphasis on short-term memory is assumption that long-term memory encoding times are slow, even with experts. It's relative weak emphasis on high-level schematic knowledge and the fact that the computer simulations did not replicate master's performance. In recent years, the theory has been revised to remedy the shortcoming. Revisions in the original chunking theory. The data prosing problems to the chunking theory mainly come from the memory research. This has been classified under two umbrellas, domain where the explicit goal is to improve one's memory, that is mnemonics in domains where memory improvement comes as a side effect of the intrinsic goals of the domain, 
the two revisions of the chunking theory addressed each of these domains in turn. EPAM4 shows how the basic chunking mechanism supplemented with the idea of retrieval structure can account in great detail for the behavior of the uh, nemamicist in the digital span task, including the overall shape of performance improvement over three years and the way digits are temporally grouped during retrieval. Retrieval structures refer to structures that enable domain-specific material to be rapidly indexed and encoded into long-term memory. Like earlier versions of EPAM, EPAM4 is comprised of three main components, uh, short-term memory, which now consists of auditory and visual subcomponents, and long-term memory, which now includes a semantic and procedural component, and a discrimination network, which acts as an index to long-term memory. In this model, retrieval structures are schemata in semantic long-term memory and are considered as deliberately required. Acquired. Rickman fully spe uh, specify all the cognitive mechanism used in their model, as required to run computer simulation, each process is associated with a time cost, which makes it possible to derive quantitative predictions from the model about time course and behavior. Finally, Richmond clearly indicate that the aspect of their theory that are considered as fixed and those aspects that can be modified either by learning or strategies. The template theory aims to explain expert behavior in domains where memory improvement is not the explicit goal. It is implemented as a computer program called CREST. CREST, which incorporates mechanisms for perception, learning, and memory management is largely based on EPAM, although it incorporates some important extensions and improvements consistent with earlier models, the emphasis on the limits of cognition, both with respect to capacity and learning rate parameters, which are essentially those used in EPAM. Like EPAM, CREST stimulate the acquisition of knowledge as a growth of a discrimination network, which develops both as a function of the current state of the system and the input from the environment. We thus have a self-organizing system. However, learning is more sophisticated in CREST than EPAM, and the network contains action chunks in addition to perceptual chunks. While the mechanism leading to the creation of new nodes and addition of information to existing nodes were already present in the earlier model, two new mechanisms have been added to CREST. The first mechanism adds a new link between existent nodes, though this latter link may either indicate that the two nodes share some similarity or that the two nodes form a production with one node acting as the condition of the other. The second mechanism, which is perhaps the main novelty in CREST enables schemata called templates in this context to be acquired incrementally and automatically. Templates are made of two components, a core which is similar to a chunk and that encodes fixed information and slots which can encode variable information are based upon the information the nodes linked to a given node. It is assumed that information can be encoded rapidly in the slots, 250 milliseconds, which is faster than adding information to a node, two seconds, or creating a new node, eight seconds. The importance of templates is that they show how higher level structures can be built from chunks and provide mechanisms for rapid long-term memory encoding showed by experts as the concept of templates helps address two of the main criticisms leveled against the chunking theory. Further improvement is that eye movements are simulated in a more plausible fashion than the earlier perceiver map models. In particular, that which is perceived determines what is being learned and that which is being learned determines what will be perceived in the future. Hence, there is a close coupling between perception and memory which has been extensively documented in several forms of psychology, including the psychology of expert behavior. Eye movements are also important for solving problem solving as shown by Lang, Cheng, Gobet, and multiple diagrammatic representations. Finally, chunks are learned incrementally and online, which was not the case with MAP, where chunks were designed by the programmer. This enables Crest to pick up the statistical distributions of the environment naturally, a feature that turns out to be critical for stimulating expert behavior and the acquisition of language, thus by providing a more complete implementation than MAP, CREST can explore in much more detail how the constraints of the environment affect the development of expertise. Domains of application. Together, EPAM and CREST have addressed most of the weakness identified with the chunking theory. The simulations carried out with EPAM4 on the digit span task show how a model based on chunking can deliberately create and use retrieval structures that enable a rapid encoding of information. They account for a variety of results, both at the aggregate level and at the more detailed level. Of 
Crest's first domain of application was chess, where it stimulated data about perception and memory of right, a variant of Crest has also been used to explain data and problem solving. These three examples will suffice to illustrate the type of phenomenon explained by this model. So skip through a little bit of this. The role of practice and the cost of acquiring knowledge. A direct consequence of chunk-based theories is that time at task is essential to gain knowledge as each process, process in the growth of the discrimination network, creating new nodes, adding information to existing node, and crest creating lateral links is subject to a time cost. Less than learning algebra or becoming a violin virtuoso, time must be invested. Consistent with this view, it has been shown the differences in mathematical ability between Chinese, Japanese, and American children can largely be explained by the amount of time spent studying. But as noted, the proponents of deliberate practice, practice in itself is not sufficient to become an expert. Playing the piano for fun will not make one a concert pianist. Practice needs to be tailored to the goal of improvising performance. As we have seen in the previous section, Crest learns what it pays attention to. This explains why Deliberate practice and not just practice is important. In the later case, a vast number of irrelevant chunks may be acquired, which not only will improve performance, will not improve importance, but may even hinder it. The role perception acquiring knowledge. The relationship between concrete and abstract knowledge has been the topic of intense research, especially within mathematic education. A key assumption of chunk-based models is that perceptual skills anchored in concrete examples play a central role in the development of expertise and that the conceptual knowledge is later built on such perceptual skills. One of the theoretical reasons behind this claim is that perceptual cues offer an efficient way for long-term memory knowledge, both declarative and procedural, to be retrieved, and that without such cues, much long-term memory knowledge would remain inert. An additional reason is that crest eye movement provides a close link between perception learning, problem solving as shown by Lane, simulations to the acquisition of multiple representations in physics. The implications for education are clear. Means should be found to develop perceptual chunks in a given domain. However, an immediate objection is that emphasizing the acquisition of domain specific and concrete knowledge will lead to difficulties with transfer. So the question of transfer. It has been known for more than 100 years that there is transfer from one domain to another only when there is overlap between the component of the skills required in each domain. Indeed, much knowledge acquired in school does not transfer, and the same applies to the skills acquired in games and sport. For example, contrary to popular belief, there is little evidence that chess skills transfer to other, other domains. Trunk-based theories clearly indicate that the situation gets worse with high levels of expertise are reached as the acquired knowledge becomes increasingly specialized. This is because the perceptual chunks which act as the conditional part of productions becomes more selective. In addition, time spent tuning one specific skill will not be devoted to acquiring other skills. If this analysis is correct, and keeping in mind that it's difficult to predict what skills will be required two or three decades from now, the best option seems to supplement the teaching of specific knowledge with the teaching of meta heuristics that are transferable. These may include strategies about how to learn, how to direct one's attention in novel domains, and how to monitor and regulate one's limited resources, such as small short-term memory capacity and slow learning rates. Order effects in learning. A question that has received attention in recent years is the impact of the order with which the curriculum is taught. Is there an optimal order, or on the contrary, is order relevant? In the chunk-based model, where knowledge is organized hierarchically, the accretion of knowledge is determined by the current state of the system and the incoming information from the environment. With no opportunity for global reorganization of knowledge, it is possible in some learning models. Um, Gobe and Woods provides an example illustrating the effect of that bad ordering could have on such systems. If irrelevant tests are learned early on, they will affect performance in the later stage of learning. Moreover, due to the fact that chunk-based models construct new chunks using smaller chunks, as building block, inefficient chunks will recursively propagate to other parts of the network, considering that pattern recognition happens thousands of times, even with simple problems. The effect of suboptimal knowledge becomes evident. A further consequence is that useful connections, including links with potential actions between pieces of knowledge, may be missed due to the inappropriate features encoding the network. Gobin and Lane describe sim uh, simulations with Crest, showing the changes within the ordering of the learning 
set have a rather strong impact on the structure of the discrimination network and on the speed of information retrieval. By contrast, difference are not always apparent at the performance level as measured by the percentage of objects recognized. Interestingly, there are some other cognitive architectures which predict the problem sequence should not matter during instruction. While this is clearly doma domain where clean new empirical data are necessary, chunk-based models alert us to potential seriousness, uh, but other ignore element of the way most curricula is designed. Acquiring productions. Chase and Simon, 73 idea of using perceptual chunks as condition to action is now fully implemented in Crest as the acquisition of production is carried out dynamically as a function of the interaction with the environment. Crest can be classified as an adaptive production system, a formalism that has been used to describe the knowledge that students should ideally acquire. An interesting difference between the production systems used by these authors and Crest may be mentioned here. While standard systems may use a single production for a conceptual condition action pair, Crest will create many productions that encode specific perceptual features in the environment. Acquiring schemata. In spite of the central role of the concept of a schema and cognition, there are surprisingly few computational models providing mechanisms existing how schemata or templates are created. As mentioned earlier, Crest does not provide such mechanisms where template is created if a node meets specific criteria relating to its connectivity with other nodes in the discrimination network. Loosely speaking, templates are created in situations where the context presents both constant and variable information. Thus, variability during learning is predicted to foster better long-term performance. In fact, there's substantial empirical evidence supporting this hypothesis in domains such as perception, motor skills, and music. Under the assumption that schemata underpin much of the knowledge acquired in schools, a very common assumption in education research, the way schemata are created in Crest suggests some important consequences for education. Without variation, schematic cannot be created. For example, in the case of elementary mathematics presenting a narrow range of problems, will hamper the acquisition of a sufficient variety of chunks and link connecting them, and consequently, schemata are not likely to be formed. This outcome is consonant with uh, Fuzon's 1992 analysis of the condition leading to effective teaching of addition and subtraction. Note that the importance of input variability is less apparent in other models of learning and categorization, such as exemplar-based theories, declarative procedural and conceptual knowledge. ACT-R provides a very strong theoretical statement about the respective roles of declarative knowledge, knowing that, and procedural knowledge, knowing how. Knowledge is first acquired declaratively and only then transferred in procedural form. According to Gobit, ACT-R lacks not only mechanisms specifying how declarative knowledge is constructed, but also mechanisms for acquiring knowledge without a declarative stage. In Crest, there's no strict separation between non-procedural knowledge, which corresponds to chunks and templates, and procedural knowledge, which corresponds to production. As the learning of both types of knowledge occurs incrementally and implicitly, verbal knowledge is substantive non-procedural knowledge, may be instrumental in generating goals and thus direct the attention to features of the environment. The characteristic may be used when transmitting verbal instructions to students. Conceptual knowledge is tricky, term to define in cognitive psychology as researchers often use it with different meanings. In Crest, conceptual knowledge is encoded not only in templates, but also in the web of links, test links, similarity links, procedural links, characterizing the discrimination network. In particular, a node is reached by recognition, may lead to another node by following lateral links. This organization of knowledge can help us define conceptual understanding. The possession of some element of knowledge is not sufficient, uh, but it also necessary to consider the richness with which this node is indexed and the density of nodes to which the node is connected. Thus, to give sufficient basis to conceptual knowledge is necessary to acquire a richly connected network of links joining production and schemata, which are accessible through perceptual chunks, acquiring multiple representations. Recently, there's been substantial research on the role of multiple representations in edu education, although results about their efficacy have been mixed. The application of CREST, modeling and learning of multiple representations in a physics curriculum is instructive in this respect. The simulation suggests that while multiple representations can support performance in the task, they also take up considerable effort in and time from learners. In the worst case, 
the effort may be spent without any benefit. This is because having efficient representations require more than the presence of procedural knowledge associated with these representations. It also requires an efficient indexing for accessing them. In fact, learning multiple representations requires duplicating the same information in different formats. Although redundancy is certainly an important aspect in human memory and understanding, Crest draws our attention to the fact that it also has a cost in particular with respect to the time spent in learning. The use of multiple representation is only one way of many learning devices that have flourished. With the advent of modern educational technology, it may be appropriate here to comment on the atheoretical way in which many educational researchers handle the latest technological advances, showing more interest in exploiting them in understanding the learning mechanisms involved. Examples include the use of logo, hypertext, multimedia, e-learning, and virtual reality in education setting. chunk based models actually warn us against any excess and optimism in the use of new technology, as long as they do not help circumvent the key limiting constants of human cognition. In many instances, these new learning environments may present distractions that interfere with what should ideally be learned. For example, the use of hypertext turned out to be disappointing educationally, a result that should not surprise us as this technology requires students to spend an inordinate amount of time figuring out what link to select next and how to impose some structure on the entangled web of information they're navigating, each imposing a heavy load on short-term memory and attention. The role of individual differences in talent. There's vast individual differences in people its cognitive abilities, both on the novice and expert level, the thorny question concerns the origins of these differences. Do they reflect previous practice and study as proponents of deliberate practice, suggest, or do they find their basis in biological and perhaps genetic factors as champions of the talent approach? Argue, it is likely that the availability data do not allow us to reach a definite answer about this question. For example, in the case of expert behavior, we have poor measures of the environmental input over years of practice, even poor measures of individual differences at the start of this practice. In addition, it is not implausible that the road to expertise sometimes follows a chaotic path in the mathematical sense that small difference may lead to sizable qualitative differences years after. A classical illustration of this idea is Simon's 1955 mathematical model showing that the acceptance or non-acceptance of the first paper submitted by a beginning scientist may to a considerable extent determine their scientific eminence decades later. Given that too many factors are not controlled in current research, such events may remain unnoticed. Our limited understanding of the complex dynamics underlying expert behavior does not belittle the fact that individual differences are important in instruction. At the least, it has been shown in feedback tailored to individual students provides better instruction than feedback given in the classroom. What do chunk-based theories have to say about this question? While emphasizing the role of practice and study, Chase and Simon were neutral with respect to the origin of individual difference. In fact, this question has rarely been addressed within the chunk-based tradition. For example, most computer simulations were carried out on average data with fixed time and capacity measures. However, it is an interesting question as to whether these parameters could reflect individual differences. This issue was also addressed in practical class taught at the University of Nottingham, where a total of 60 students were given a standard pair association task with verbal material consistent with the literature on verbal learning. There were important individual differences in the time required to reach criterion. Students were then required to stipulate, stimulate their own performance with Crest. The modeling environment enabled them to vary both strategies and time parameters used for creating and elaborating chunks. The outcome of this exercise was the participant's performance could not be explained fully by the strategies used and that there were important differences in the parameters used by each student to model their own data. We may mention two important implications for education. First, while individual differences tend to be diluted by large amounts of practice, they play a large role in the early stages of studying a domain, which characterize much of the classroom instruction. Second, as seen earlier, taking into account individual differences may lead to better instruction because instruction can be optimized for each student, including feedback on progress, organization of material, and choice on learning strategies to be taught. This article is first discuss how chunk-based theories can provide a parsimonious account of empirical data in a number of psychological domains, including expert behavior. It is then attempted to derive some of the educational principles from these theories. We have focused our attention on EPOM4 and CREST, which offer a synthesis combining the concepts of chunking, schema, and retrieval structure. These two models highlight the role of perception and learning and the necessity of acquiring a large number of chunks. They incorporate mechanisms interacting with the environment and picking up its statistical structure. They also are able to account for a variety of empirical data 
and have made predictions that were later validated by empirical data. These theories can be considered as constructivist in that they provide mechanisms showing how knowledge is constructed and used. Analysis of the mechanisms used by chunk-based theories enable us to infer a series of implications for education, which were in some cases contrasted with those made by alternative theories. Among others, we have discussed the difficulty of transferring knowledge from one domain to another, the effect that curriculum sequence may have in learning, the conditions best suited to the acquisition of schemata, and to the computational definition from the difficult notion of conceptual understanding. We now address limits in our approach, direction for further research, and the extent which computational modeling may further help our understanding of learning and instruction. While we're able to derive several educational principles from trunk-based theories, we also recognize some limits in our approach. Learning has been simulated in several domains with our framework, but so far there's been only one domain where the acquisition of school curriculum has been modeled. We have considered cognitive feedback from teachers, but ignored the equally important motivational feedback. Indeed, although factors such as motivation, the social environment offered by peers and emotions are central to the general theory of learning, our framework has little to say about them, except that they will affect learning through attentional mechanisms and the amount of practice students will spend on the task. Finally, this article can be seen as a program of research in need of further empirical validation than as a set of well-validated principles. So far, we have used these principles for suggesting detailed practical prescriptions in only one domain, chess. These limits suggest possible directions for future work, perhaps besides the need for empirical validation. We have just mentioned the most important addition would be to provide a broader account of motivation, as suggested by Gobain Woods. Another worthwhile alley would be alley would be to develop a tutorial system directed based on chunking-based theory, where contrasting with the stress given by current computer-based tutoring systems on procedural knowledge, the importance of perceptual learning would be emphasized. Such a system could, in principle, enable the development of curricula in silico before they were used in the classroom. Broadly speaking, computation modeling has been used in two different ways in learning and instruction. Some researchers have chosen to construct computer models that stimulate, simulate the learner's behavior. Other investigators have chosen to develop tutoring system providing instruction to learners. A common benefit of both approaches is that they provide means for formulating theories, either of learning or instruction, with a great deal of precision and completeness, given the complexity of the phenomenon to explain and the fact that they evolve as a function of time and their interaction with the environment. We argue that computation modeling offers the best medium for developing theories of learning and instruction. There is simply no way that the verbal or even mathematical theories could make predictions about the success of the learner or the impact of curriculum, as this requires combining factors such as curriculum content, account of practice, individual differences, strategies used, social environments in the classroom, teacher style, to mention but a few. Although we are still far from general theory of learning and instruction, computer models have been developed that account for substantial subsets in the processes involved. In this paper, we've attempted to analyze what chunk-based theories tell us about education. One of the advantages offered by these theories is that they provide well specified learning mechanisms, including mechanisms for acquiring schemata. We have also called the more theory-led research in education, in particular with respect to new technologies. Although th further empirical validation is needed, these implications have derived from chunk-based theories may help improve the way instruction is delivered in our schools. Okay, so God forbid I'm hemorrhaging my viewers, but uh, good to get through this. Just to forward the research, put it out there even if no one other than Duvid is interested. So let's look at my last paper I have from Fernand Gobert, just because he's, you know, kind of the, the godfather of chunking theory and research and the chess studies has been doing it for decades, international master and, um, so here, the role of constraints in expert memory, Fernand Gobe. A great deal of research has been devoted to developing process models of expert memory. However, Vincente and Wang, 1998, have proposed that process theories have difficulty in explaining expert recall in domains in which memory recall is a contrived task, and that a product theory, the constraint attunement hypothesis, 
has received a significant amount of empirical support. We compare one process theory, the template theory, with the CAH complaint constraint attunement hypothesis. Chess players differently widely in skill levels were required to recall briefly presented chess positions, which were randomized in various ways, consistent with the template theory, but inconsistent with the constraint attunement theory. There was significant skill effect and condition in which both the location and distribution of the pieces were randomized. These and other results suggest that process models such as template theory can provide a, ver a viable account of expert memory in chess. So I'm not going to look at the study, but just some of the background and idea behind it. And people want to read more into it, they could look at the exact study. So ever since Piaget 1954 and Brunswick 56 and Simon 69, the environment has played an important role in psychological theories. However, while all psychologists agree that cognitive systems adapt to the structure of their environment, there are disagreements about the consequences of this on the optimal way to study cognition. On the one hand, it has been proposed that the best approach is to develop process theories preferably in the form of computer programs and compare their predictions to human data. On the other hand, it has been argued that a careful study of properties of the environment should first come before any attempt at theories about cognitive processes. Once these properties are fully understood, developing process theories become an easier, more constrained task. Recently, this debate has focused on the expertise effect in memory recall. Experts are vastly superior to non-experts in memorizing briefly presented material taken from their domain of expertise. This effect first reported about 50 years ago in chess, has been observed in many additional studies and in domains, including games, programming, and medical expertise. A number of process theories have been developed purporting to explain the cognitive mechanisms underlying this effect, including the chunking theory, the skilled memory theory, the long-term working memory theory, and the EPOM4 and template theories. In contrast, Vincenti and Wang proposed an ecological theory of expert memory, the constraint attunement theory a hypothesis that focuses more on understanding the goal relevant constraints in a domain. The CH is also a product theory of expert memory in that the functional relationship between input and output is described, but like all product theories, it is silent about the specific psychological mechanisms. In their review, uh, Vincente and Wang made a distinction between domains in which memorizing stimuli is an intrinsic task, a task that is a definite feature of that domain of expertise in domains which memorizing stimuli is a contrived task, a task that is not part of the domain of expertise. They argue that the process theories they discussed cannot provide an adequate theoretical explanation for expertise effects in memory recall for the considerable number of domains in which memory recall is a contrived task. In contrast, they noted that all but one of the results reviewed in this section were consistent with the predictions generated by the constraint attunement hypothesis thereby providing a significant amount of empirical support for the theory, and many of the results that were reviewed still could not be accounted for a posteriori by other competing theories. Vincente and Wang's analysis is further discussed by Erickson, Patel and Kinch, Simon, Gobe, and Vincente. Here we address this challenge by, in part by making a detailed comparison between one process theory, the template theory, and the CH in one domain chess. We choose template theory because it is a well-articulated process theory of expertise, and because it is discussed in detail by Vincente and Wang, we focused on chess because Vincente and Wang's review contains six chess experiments out of 10. And because, as we'll see later, they explicitly propose an experiment where the predictions of CH and TT differ. Thus, the major goal of the paper was to compare the predictions of TT and CH under experimental conditions where they make different predictions. We start by describing the CH and CT in TT. We then and argue that the theories can be disentangled by examining recall for different types of randomized chess positions. Predictions of TT are derived from a stimula simulation study. Predictions of the CAH are derived from Vincente Wang. Finally, we report a human study which tested these predictions. The constraint attunement hypothesis. The constraint attunement hypothesis, CAH, is derived from Gibson's 1969 specificity theory and Rasmussen's 1985 notion of abstraction hierarchy. It represents an outgrowth of ecological theories of cognition, which stresses the importance of the environment over internal processes. Vincent and Wang stated the CH as follows. There can be expertise effects in memory recall when there are goal-relevant constraints, relationships pertinent to the domain that experts can exploit to structure the stimuli. The more constraint available, the greater the expertise advantage can be. Fully random stimuli have no constraints. 
so no expertise advantage would be expected to realize these potential advantages. Experts must be attuned to the goal relevant constraints in question. If they do not pick up this information, then no expertise advantage is expected to define goal relevant constraints. Vincente and Wang proposed that for each particular domain, an abstraction hierarchy should be construed, constructed. If the abstraction hierarchy, in the abstraction hierarchy, there are constraints on relationship, both within and between levels of the hierarchy. For example, one important feature of the abstraction hierarchy is that levels of the hierarchy are connected by means ends relationship. Vincente and Wang claim that these types of constraints are the goal relevant constraints that experts can exploit when recalling material within their domain. Vincente and Wang sketch an abstraction hierarchy for chess. This hierarchy has five levels, board, paths, tactics, strategy, and purpose. The lowest level board consists of the number and type of pieces, as well as the physical properties of the board. For example, the number of pieces impose constraints on the possible physical configurations. The second level paths consists of the constraints resulting from the rules govern governing the movement of the pieces. The next level tactics is constrained by the meaningful and effective ways in which moves can implement goal relevant strategies. About the next level strategies, Vincent and Wang note that masters do not constrain their moves by the rules of the game or tactics alone. Rather, their actions are also highly constrained by the higher order strategic plans that they have adapted to achieve a win. Finally, the highest level purpose will constrain the strategic strategies that can be meaningfully chosen. The CIH explains expertise affects for standard chess positions in the following manner. When an expert looks at a position, he may attune the strategic configuration, thereby ruling out other strategic factors. The strategic configuration constrains tactical features of the position, which in turn will constrain the path level. The expert, but not the novice, has the capacity to attune these multiple constraints, allowing better recall. Vincent and Wang put it as follows. The link between levels define what is goal relevant for the domain, thereby allowing people who are aware of these relations to reduce the number of meaningful alternatives that need to be considered in reconstructive recall. The chunking and template theories. Simon Chase's 73 chunking theory, which is closely related to the EPOM theory of memory and perception, was the first theory to precisely specify the cognitive mechanism involved in chess memory. Chunking theory proposes that a core of expertise lies in the ability to rapidly recognize important features in the problem at hand, such as the location of the groups of pieces on the board. These features are stored internally as chunk symbols in long-term memory, having an arbitrary number of subparts and properties that can be used as knowledge units. Chunks act as access points to semantic long-term memory and the conditions of productions whose actions may be carried out internally or externally. In the case of chess expertise, perceptual mechanisms and chunking theory allow recognition of patterns of pieces on the board. These patterns suggest moves which are used to update the internal representation of the board of the mind's eye. The mind's eye acts as a relational system which stores perceptual structures. These structures, which can originate both from the external outputs, inputs from the memory stores, can be manipulated by visual, spatial, mental operations. Finally, recognition mechanisms apply both when perceiving the external position and when examining the position that are generally the mind's eye during search. A subset of chunking theory was implemented as a computer program by Simon and Gilmartin. Two weaknesses were later uncovered in chunking theory and an interference paradigm. The theory underestimates speed of encoding into long-term memory, and the theory does not relate mechanisms at the chunk level with the higher level representation that players use. The template theory of Gobate and Simon 1996 was developed to eliminate these two weaknesses while keeping the strength of the original chunking theory. Template theory is able to account both for perceptual phenomena such as players' eye movement during short presentations of unknown positions and memory phenomena such as immediate recall of positions. The theory is implemented as a computer program, crest, chunk hierarchy, and retrieval structures that offers detailed simulations of the empirical data. Finally, extension of the program plays chess by pattern recognition, recognizing chunks, elicit potential moves or sequences of move. Like chunking theory, template theory proposes that chunks are accessed by traversing a discrimination net. A discrimination net consists of a set of nodes, chunks connected by links, which together from a tree, form a tree-like structure. The nodes have tests, which can be applied to check features of the external stimuli. The outcome of each test determines which link will be taken below a node. The net is grown by 
two learning mechanisms, familiarization and discrimination, which together produce a self-organizing dynamical system. When a new object is presented to the model, it is sorted through the discrimination yet net, starting with the root mode until no further test applies. When a node is reached at the end of the process, the object is compared with the image of the node, which is the internal representation of the object. If the image under represents the object, new features are added to the image familiarization. If the information of the image and the object differ on some feature or some sub-element, a new link and new node are created below the current node of discrimination. Chunks are linked to other information stored in long-term memory, such as moves, plans, and tactical moves. Moreover, chunks that are often used in a player's practice evolve into more complex data structures, templates, which have slots allowing variable variables to be instantiated rapidly. In particular, information about piece location, piece type, and chunks can be recursively encoded into template slots. Slots are created as chunks where there is substantial variation in squares, pieces, or groups of pieces in the test links below. In addition to slots, templates create a core basically similar to the information stored in chunks. Altogether, templates typically store about 10 pieces, but the number of pieces can be much larger, more than 20 in some cases. Templates may be linked to other templates, allowing search at a higher level than moves. Template theory also proposes that the information stored in the mind's eye decays rapidly and that it needs to be updated either by inputs from the external world or by inputs from memory structures. Finally, template theory like chunking theory proposes that search is carried out by recursively applying pattern recognition processes to eternal, internal representations. Okay, so he goes into the experiment. So I just wanted to cover more of these theories. So that's the last of the gobe I'm going to learn today. Um, here is another dissertation, PhD dissertation, and this is Andrew Cook, Computational Chunking in Chess, uh, University of Birmingham, Doctor in Philosophy, 2011. Read the abstract. Adrian de Groot, the Dutch psychologist and chess master, argued that perception and memory are more important differentiators of chess expertise than the ability to look ahead in selecting a chess move. A component of expertise in chess has been attributed to the expert having knowledge of chunks, and this knowledge gives the expert the ability to focus quickly on good moves with only a moderate look ahead search. The effects of chunking in chess are widely reported in the literature. However, papers reporting the nature of chunks are largely based on inference from psychological experimentation. This thesis reports original work resulting from an extensive data mining of a large number of chessboard configurations to explore the nature of chunks within the game of chess and the associated moves played by expert chess players. This research was informed by the work of the psychology of chess and explored with software engineering techniques, employing large data sets consisting of transcripts from expert players' games. The thesis reports results from analysis of chunks throughout the game of chess explores the properties of meaningful chunks and reports the effects of the application of chunk knowledge to move searching. So just looking at the table of contents, um, there's a literature review, defining a chunk, investigating the chunk, and his creation of the computer program, um, and then his testing me mechanisms, um, what he calls clamp, and this goes back to the alpha beta search, what I mentioned is common in uh, you know, the new uh, alpha zero program in the machine learning uh, uh, chat GPT. So clamp is a more in-depth understanding of chunking and let me see if I could just look at uh, his conclusion. So 
So I'll just read his conclusion. Chump and Clamp are two programs that analyze chunk patterns from expert players' game in order to suggest a move to be played based on the board having a similar chunk constituencies. The design and function difference between Clamp and Chump uh, because each program was designed to perform a different task. Chump is a model of human memory, selecting moves using a combination of abilities to emulate human cognition. Clamp, however, is a program designed to investigate the properties of chunking in chess. Clamp allows a comparison of the effectiveness of chunking methods as the chunk parameters are varied. The size of the training set used for Clamp was substantially larger than that used for Chump. For the results obtained from Clamp, it is likely that a considerable improvement in the performance of Chump could be gained by increasing the size of the training data appropriately, despite the relatively small chunk knowledge that Chump acquires. Chump performs well, suggesting moves based on analysis of the chunks found on the board. Clamp compares the effectiveness of the proposed moves with various chunk parameters, such as chunk size, the relationship between pieces. Clamp is not designed to be a chess playing program, but instead Clamp is a tool to investigate the properties of chunks. So conclusion about chunking in chess. The research report in this thesis describes original work which seeks to gain understanding in the nature of chunks as chess pieces and they're used by skilled players within the game of chess. The results reported show that chunks are present in large numbers within the piece configurations of typical chess boards. There are many chunks that are frequently occurring within the chess game, a number of which have been isolated using crest or by clamp. A simple analysis of the number of chunks found on the chess board show that chunks can be associated with a stage of the game in terms of the number of moves prior to checkmate, the result reported investigated the connection between the skill of the players and the number of chunks used in the chess play. However, no significant correlation between player skill and the number of chunks could be found. The program Clamp Analyzer described uh, analyzes chunk in a more detail by associating chunks to the next move of a piece to the position on the chessboard, testing the moves played by chess experts with the suggested move from Clamp Analyzer consistently gave results that were better than random choice of moves, applying similar simple heuristics with extracting chunks such as building chunks from pieces that are in close proximity or restricting chunks to pieces that are defending relationships dramatically reduced the number of significant chunks that were required by clamp analyzer to suggest a move. Furthermore, selecting the size of the chunks can influence the probability of an accurate prediction of the best move. The results obtained from clamp and clamp analyzer showed that as the chunk size increased, the accuracy and like likelihood prediction improved. However, the influence of finding large chunks on the chessboard is small. Chunk size of above five piece pieces in the mid-game section were rarely repeated from one game to another. Smaller chunks with, for example, three pieces were prevalent between games. Adding additional knowledge to the chunks, such as knowledge that many chunks are made from pieces that are in close proximity, or that many of the pieces with a chunk are in defending relationships, Will have stated considerably reduce the number of chunks in the chunk library without loss of accuracy on the move likelihood prediction. A four by four square area across the board will reduce the number of chunks in the chunk library to less than 1% of the size when compared to similar analysis of the whole board area. Furthermore, considering chunks that consist only of pieces by defending relationship, the number of chunks contained within the library reduces to 0.5% compared to the number of chunks within the whole board library. We can therefore conclude that chunks of three or four pieces they're in close proximity or in defending relationship with each other are useful for calculating the likelihood of the piece to be moved. Um, reported a practical application of chunking. It has been possible to use chunking to order pieces prior to applying alpha beta search with the resulting decrease in the number of nodes search. The reduction in search width was confirmed with 1,000 chess boards, giving credence to the notion that chunking is an effective method to focus attention on the significant moves. The application of chunking in this example operates without knowledge of the rules of chess and use a chunk size of three pieces to apply a depth of four. Apply an average reduction of 50% of the number of leaf nodes was achieved. The questions this thesis aims to answer. Chunking appears even in the simplest the concept described in this thesis to yield reasonable predictive dividends with small chunk library inventories. This results obtained are consistent with psychological experiments that propose that human chess players are aware, either consciously or subconsciously, of the existence of chunks in the presence can direct an expert player to relevant moves. The research report adds additional material to the argument for chunking being an aspect of experts' cognitive processing. The question this thesis is trying to answer, however, is more complex. It isn't 
not possible to answer the question, does the utilization of chunks within a chess playing program provide a plausible model for the use of chunks by human players with an affirmative, it is not possible to draw conclusions about the cognitive processes within a human player from the experiments in this thesis. However, the thesis reports original findings and therefore makes an original contribution to knowledge regarding the nature of chunks within the chess domain and the plausibility of chunking as a mechanism for directing attention to relevant chess moves. The findings are indeed indicative taking into account of human limitations that chunking is technically a viable process for the human expert. The analysis performed in programs written were simplistic in nature, detecting chunks based on the frequency of occurrence and crude heuristics. These simple filters drastically reduce the number of chunks found without a loss in accuracy. It is possible that the advanced filtering that human experts could perform may select even fewer, but even more significant chunks. The result, even with the simple filtering, show that associating chunks with moves is a viable process, albeit with limited probability, thereby showing that knowledge of chunks can direct attention to the moves that are likely to be played. The program's clamp analyzer employs a software implementation of a simple recognition association technique. The software does not use complex search heuristics or statistical analysis, but the simple recognition of chunks and their associations with the clamp analyzer selects possible good moves. The recognition association theory is descriptive term used by Holding to describe chunking as follows. In more detail, the recognition association theory makes the assumption that chess mastery stems from knowing thousands of chess patterns. Recognition of these patterns during play is said to trigger the memory of an associated plausible move, which may then be selected or investigated by the player. The results obtained by Clamp show that this technique is a feasible method for associating chunks to move. The only caveat to Holding's definition of recognition is that Clamp's elevation Evaluation of moves is based on the recognition of many chunk patterns. Chunking is proposed to be a framework that underlies many aspects of human learning. And if Clamp models cognitive perceptual chunking, then the research report in this thesis shows that chunking is achievable with interlinked and associated memories. The advantage of using a computer program as a tool to investigate chunking is that the parameters and methods are exactly defined, as opposed to psychological experiments where the actual cognitive process is unknown. Psychological experiment may suggest that chunking is evident, but the exact cognitive process is unknown and can only be proposed by inference. Clamp, however, shows that frequent occurring configurations of three to six pieces can be used as an indicator for a move. Clamp for, thereby shows that human chess players could use a similar method to focus the attention of a chess player onto a few moves. Chunk sizes of less than seven pieces have been shown to give measurable results, which agree with Miller's 1956 hypothesis for chunking in human subjects. Indeed, chunk sizes of four less yield a positive correlation between chunk configurations and the move made, which is consistent with Cohen's paper. The positive results obtained by Clamp using chunks of four pieces or less show that Cohen's measurement for human capacity limits are viable within the domain of chess. In addition, the size of the inventory is within a plausible range when considered the capacity of a human expert. For example, a library consisting of 147,510 five-piece defensive chunk constellation offers a 15% likelihood of predicting one of the top four best moves. As mentioned above, the crude heuristic applied to the chunk library building process, such as only processing pieces that are in the close proximity or pieces that are in defensive relationship, considerably reduce the number of chunks contained within the chunk library. It is plausible that an expert chess player will acquire chunk knowledge using considerably more efficient heuristics which would reduce the inventory of chunks even further. So his recommendation for further work. So just a lot of material. I encourage people to look more at this, especially people more interested in chess. So here's one more long paper. Um, and there were just certain sections I wanted to read from this. So let's look at the role of chunking and organization in the process of recall. And I'm going to skip the experiments, maybe read about 10 pages of this. 1956, George Mayer published a set of papers in which he pointed out that while there is a limit on the number of items that can be held in the immediate memory, there does not seem to be a limit on the amount of information each of these items can be represent. For example, if there is a limit on the amount of information that can be held in immediate memory, memory, then we could remember about 10 times as many binary digits as English words. In reality, the span for digits is only slightly greater than for words. Miller suggested that 
S chunk information to single units with some single coding device representing a unit in their memory. At recall, the S decodes the code into the components they represent. A set of items would occupy one slot in short term memory if they could be coded into a single device. But if the S did not have an available code, they would occupy as many slots as there were items. As an illustration of the phenomenon, he reported an experiment by Smith in which S learned to code pairs of binary digits into two single digits when the S were then presented. Sequences of binary digits were recalled. Their recall scores were the subjects that were considerably higher than the cases prior to learning the recoding scheme. That view of categorization memory introduces four concepts, chunk, memory code, decode, and recode. Chunks have been operationally defined as behavioral sequences, which tend to occur either adjacently or in all or none mannerism. Theoretically, they can be defined as an item of information set, which are stored within the same memory code, within the code of chunk being distinct. Recoding refers to the process of learning the code for a chunk, and decoding is the process of translating the code into the information it represents. These concepts are defined in more detail below. When the information is in a response sequence, it is recoded into chunks of information which are represented in a memory by single codes. It is not unreasonable to suppose that a set of codes may be recoded into a higher order code. Furthermore, in the highest level of the code hierarchy, the entire sequence may be represented in memory by a single code. Probably the clearest case in such a hierarchy scheme is the phrase structure of a sentence, and there is at least some adjacent evidence that subjects use that structure during learning. Theoretical considerations. The theory of memory codes. The original acceptance of Miller's concept of a chunk stemmed from the fact that it agreed with our intuition about behavior that it did not from any theoretical or operational specification on the concept. Since that time, a number of different operational definitions have been used, but the major problem has been that of formulating a theoretical definition of the concept from which meaningful operational definitions could be derived. The difficulty has been that on specifying a structural characteristic of the code and that the way the information within the code is held together. Because of the difficulties with specifying the substantive properties of chunks, current theoretical formulations have emphasized their functional properties. What follows is a set of statements defining chunks, which seems to be implied by the work of the most investigators in the area. Statement one. A code is the memorial representation of the information. Statement two, if that code represents information rather than being the information, a code and the information it represents are logically distinct. This statement is most easily illustrated by the situation in which subjects store pairs of binary digits in terms of single decimal digits. If the information 0, 1 is stored as 2, then the code and the information are not the same, even though the information can be generated from the code using a translation rule. Furthermore, as noted above, the variables which influence the code acquisition and retention may not be the same as those which influence the acquisition and retention of the individual item represented by the code. Statement three, a chunk can be defined as any response set or sequence which is represented in memory by a single code. Such unitary representation in memory is the major theoretical property of chunks, and it's from this property that most of the operational definitions have been derived. That property has been attributed to chunks to explain the fact that more information can be stored in memory if it is organized, organized into chunks than if it's not so organized. Statement four, the information represented by code may, be, may either be behavior or other codes. For example, in the Miller illustrations, if the subject can recode pairs of binary digits into decimal digits, there's no reason to believe that the subject could not recode pairs of decimal digits into some other system. Statement five, the code representing a chunk in memory represents all the information in the chunk, and in the case of an ordered chunk, the code also represents the order of the information. The fact that the subjects are able to recall overtly all the information in a chunk in the correct order suggests this assumption. Statement six, the code must be completely defined by the information it represents and the information must be behaviorally defined. That is, it seems neither necessarily nor desirable to assume that a code could have properties which have no behavioral implications. Furthermore, without the property, it would be necessary to assume that subjects could recover from memory 
an empty code, and therefore it would be impossible to develop any meaningful operational definition of code recovery. Statement seven, it is assumed that all of this information in a chunk is stored in the code, and therefore it is necessary to assume that in order to recall overtly any of the information within the chunk, it is necessary to recover first recover the code from memory. Furthermore, it follows that if the code represents all the information and the code recovery is necessary for overt recall of any of the information, then the overt recall of any of the information from a chunk implies at least implicit recovery of all the information currently represented in the code. Operational definitions. The mechanisms of experiments on chunking are not as straightforward as those in many other areas of research. In particular, it's difficult to make a clear separation between the dependent and independent variables. Another a number of dependent different procedures have been adapted to induce subjects to some chunk sequences in a particular way. For example, among those that have been used are grammar, rhythm when reading sequences, verbal instructions, and physically grouping materials for subjects during study. While well, any of these procedures can be used in an attempt to induce subjects to use a particular chunking scheme, systematic variation in one of these procedures cannot be considered an independent variable. The independent variable is variation in the schemes the subjects adapt, and if the adapted schemes do not conform to the induced scheme, then the experimental variation is irrelevant to the study. The difficulty is that after the experiment is over, the operational definition of chunks must be applied to the subject response protocol to determine which value of the independent variable he represents. What adds to the problem is that in many cases, the operational definition is also the dependent measure in the study. An illustration of that problem is the work to be reported. The chunking scheme is adopted by subject, is identified by using a pattern of conditional recall probabilities, and the dependent variable is the absolute condition and probability at a chunk boundary. Meanwhile, the two functions served by operational definition are logically distinct, as the results must be stated as are our laws. Most operational definitions of chunks have stemmed from the assumption that a code is a unitary event and that the item recall depends upon prior recovery of the code from memory. Any variable which would either enhance or depress the probability of code recovery should affect all the information equally. Consequently, there should be a tendency for the information within a chunk to be recalled at an all or none manner. However, a variable that would affect the probability of recovering one code may or may not influence recovery of another code. These two effects then would imply that the information or items stored in the same code should have a greater probability of co-occurrence than do items stored in separate codes. Therefore, if for a response set, one were to determine the probability that each item occurred, given each of the other items also occurred, then the patterns of conditional probability should define the nature of the subject's chunks. If the subject must recover the code from a chunk and hence all the information in the chunk before they can recall overtly any of the information, then it's likely that not only will the members of a chunk be highly dependent behavioral events, but they should also be adjacent behavioral events. That is, if the code is recalled, then all the information that code should be given before information from another code is recalled overtly. One of the earliest attempts to define uh, chunks was the work of Bowsfield and his students on category clustering and free recall. As an example, subject might hear a list of 40 words, which contain 10 words from each of four taxonomic categories. The words are presented to the subject in random order, and the measure of the chunking clustering and the extent to which recall occurs is the category clusters. That such chunking effects do occur is quite clear, and both Cohn and Mandler, 60 and 67, provide discussions of the relationship between those data and the general consideration reviewed by Miller. A similar approach had been taken by Tolving in 62, in an attempt to measure the spontaneous chunking of completely unrelated items in a free recall list. His measure of the subjective organization is based on the tendency for a subject to recall the items in the same order on succeeding trials, even though the order of input is randomized from trial to trial. Recently, Martin, 67, has shown that when the subject hesitates in their recall of sentence materials, these hesitations tend to occur at the boundaries of major constituents. It seems reasonable to assume that the hesitations may mark the boundaries of response sequences that are stored in single codes. It has been shown that subjects can learn response sequences which conform to grammatically defined units, such as phrases, more rapidly than they learn equally probable 
and acceptable sequences which do not conform to grammatical units. Similarly, Suki in 67 had subjects learn a story from a tape recorder. Their response is an attempt to during learning. He then identified the location of the pauses and response protocols, and the subject came back on another day and learned a set of responses which either conformed to a segment bounded by hesitation of segments of equal sizes, which were not complete hesitation units. His results also indicated that the hesitation units are learned more rapidly. In addition to the above approaches, another technique has been developed with use of serial recall. Like all the other measures, is based on the assumption that in serial recall, subjects will tend to recall response chunks in all or none manner. If that is the case, then the probability that a subject will recall overtly some items from a chunk and not others should be rather low. However, if a subject recalled one chunk, he may not recall other chunks. Therefore, if the subject's learning protocol was scored for the probability that each item was wrong, given the immediate preceding item was right, the chunks that the subject used should be apparent by the fact that the probabilities would be high at a chunk boundary and low within the chunk. These probabilities have been labeled transitional error probabilities. The result of many studies during the past six years have supported the usefulness of this technique. Otherwise specify the term chunk will be used in the following discussion to refer to spans of items between trans transitional error probabilities, spikes. An operational distinction which needs to be considered is the difference between code recall and the overt recall of information from a recovered code. Cone 66 had used the overt recall at least one item from a code as evidence of code recovery. That definition would follow from the assumption that it is necessary to recover the code in order to recall any of the information within the chunk. Cone's estimate of the amount of information currently stored within the code is, is the number of items or the amount of information overtly recalled. Given at least one of the items was overtly recalled, that measure would follow from the assumption that at least one item of information has been recovered, then all the information available in the code has also been recovered. The distinction between these two measures can be illustrated using an experiment by Schul. In 67, his subjects were presented with a categorized list for free recall. They Then they learned a second list of words. Some subjects were subjected to item retroactive inhibition by having the same categories on the second list, but different items. Other subjects in the category of retroactive inhibition group had different categories in the second list. After a second learning, the item retroactive inhibition group recalled the slightly fewer first list categories than the rest control group, but many fewer items per category. The category retroactive inhibition group recalled many fewer categories than control, the control group, but the items recalled per recalled category was unaffected. In addition to Shrule study, Cone had received, reviewed several studies that indicate that variables that affect the number of recalled categories may not affect the items recovered per recalled category. It is important to note the failure to recall any information from a chunk cannot be taken as evidence that the information in the code has been lost. It's possible that a subject might not be able to retrieve a code that was stored in memory at the time of the attempted retrieval because he was unable to locate the code in his memory. Evidence for such an effect would be attained if the subject could recall several items in the chunk after being prompted. However, if the code for the chunk is completely defined by the information it contains, then the complete failure to recall any of the information from the code can be taken as evidence for failures of code recovery. Chunking schemes. Given the methods are available for identifying chunking behavior, the next problem is that of identifying methods of presenting subjects to chunk the particular ways. There are a number of techniques that have been used. One of the first was Balfield's use of categorized list, in which the concern with the extent to which the subject would use pre-learned categories as a means of chunking, Jenkins and Russell's, 52, and more recently, Kofer, used pre-experimental interim associations to set subjects from chunking in free recall and found it to be quite effective. Johnson 65 describes an experiment in which interim interitem associations were used in chunking in serial recall as well. All these techniques result in chunking effect on the very first trial, and the effect appears to be increasing with learning. Probably the most common method of presenting subjects is the use of grammatical structures. Subjects use the phrase structure of sentences as a chunking device, and most, if not all, of the measures of chunking identify the same chunks. Another quite effective task for studying chunking has been the reported by Russell, 
personal communication. The situation is basically a modified probability learning task, which consists of several levers, as opposed to the usual probability learning situation. However, it is possible for the subject to learn the task perfectly. The decoding operational model. If subjects do chunk items in a response set, and they organize the set in terms of chunk hierarchy, then the process of recall should involve a systematic decoding of the codes in the hierarchy of the information they represent. A model has been proposed for the way subjects use such a hierarchy chunking scheme during recall. The model originally was proposed to account for the way subjects generate sentences, but recent evidence indicates that the works equally well for describing the way other types of ordered sequences are generated. The decoding operational model assumed that subjects recall or generate an ordered sequence by first recalling a coding device which represents an entire sequence as a single chunk. It then moves down the chunk hierarchy, decoding each of the codes into a component, storing all but the first components in short-term memory. While the first component is further decoded into its components, the decoding step is made each time a subject extracts an item of information from a code in that the model allows for higher order chunks. A component of the code may be either the code for a lower order chunk or a non-reducible code for the response item. If when a code is decoded into its component and the first component is a non-reducible item, that item is produced overtly and the subject returns to a short-term memory and covers the most recently stored code and decodes in the same manner. This model can be represented geometrically. This model is similar to proposed by uh, Yinges in 1960 and can be formalized as the following set of postulates. Postulate one, it's possible to four a code to be recalled provided that it represents at least one item of information. Given the code must be defined by the information it represents, then there could be no code to recall if there was no information. However, it's not necessary for a code to represent all the information it should represent or all the information that it might have once represented. There might be a point early in learning where they know some, but not all of the items in one of the chunks. Also, after learning the sequence, they might selectively forget some, but not all of the information in one or many of the codes. In both these cases, the subjects would have the code for the chunks, but the code would not represent all the information it should represent. The information represented the code is of two types, order information and the item or content information. In both these cases, well, knowledge that there is a first chunk provides no specific interchunk information. It does not provide intersequence order information. That is in the same way that the knowledge that there are three positions within a chunk provides enough chunk specific information to establish a code for the chunk. So does the information that there are three positions or chunks within a sequence provided enough sequence specific information to establish a code for the sequence. Similarly, the knowledge that there is a third position within the chunk provides a chunk specific information, but does not provide any item specific information. That is to know that there is the position does not provide us with either any content or inf order information from which this item, so no code for the item would exist. Postulate two, whenever a subject recalls a code, he decodes it into the components and not the next lower level. These components can be either non-reducible codes representing response items, or they can be the codes for a lower order chunks. Postulate three, after a subject has decoded a code into its components, he holds the components in a temporary memory store, except for the component whose ultimate members have temporal priority in the sequence. That component is further decoded. Postulate four. Whenever an overt response is produced, the subject returns to his temporally memory store and recovers the code whose ultimate members have temporally priority over the other codes. That code is then decoded. Postulate five, the code is not analyzed for the information it contains until it is decoded. A code is an item that represents information, but is not the information itself. Therefore, if the subject recovers a code from memory, all he can know is that he has recovered all the information available to him. He cannot know either what or how much information he has recovered and he takes the next step of decoding the code. For example, if the subject were to recover a code for a chunk, which he knew contained three items, he should not know whether the recovered code represent all the information until he attempted to decode it into its components. In this sense, a code is viewed as an opaque container. 
Pashtut 6. Whenever a subject is uncertain regarding a decoding step, he completely terminates his response attempt. Subjects tend to withhold the response attempt if they're uncertain of any part of it. However, it is important to note that at any point in a sequence, the probability of terminating the response attempt can be a function of only those decoding decisions which the subject makes at that point. If recalling a sequence organized in this manner, the subject would first recall the code from the entire sequence and then decode it into the codes for the two major chunks. The code for the second chunk would be stored while the code for the first chunk was further decoded. With this organization, the subjects need to recover the codes for only two chunks prior to the decoding of the first chunk into its components, whereas in the other organization, three codes must be recovered after producing the members of the first chunk the subjects would recover the code for the second chunk and decode it into the codes of the two subchunks. They would then store the code in the second subchunk and decode the first into its components. The dependent variable. As noted above, chunks operationally define the item spans between um, the TP spikes and the definition is based on the assumption that chunks should be recalled in all or none manner. However, given that reason, chunks could be equally well-defined as item spans between spikes and the probability that an item after the transition was correct when the item before the transition was wrong. Furthermore, if dependency and recall were the only basis for the operational definition, then both these sources of independence should be taken into consideration. That could be done through computing a coefficient for each transition and defining chunks as item spans between spikes in the measure. It would seem clear in the general case statements would indicate the appropriate basis of the definition. While this does not take all sources of independence into consideration, the above statements do not suggest that all sources contribute equally, and there are some situations in which may not be the best measure. However, it is not appropriate in any situation which one would not expect all sources of independence to be equally affected by manipulated variables. So this paper goes on and on and on and creates a bunch of experiments and tests. So this, um, I wanted to read more of it, but you know, this paper is from 1970. So you get a little history of some of these early dives into chunking theory not related to chess, but just memory recall and of the possible mechanisms of how things are chunked and then how they're recalled and the precision of the mechanisms. And then how would you go about testing these various hypotheses? Okay, so I got two more. Um, Here's chunking and data compression in verbal short-term memory, a similar field. So yeah, Dave, thanks for being active in the chat. So this by Dennis Norris. Um, chunking and data compression in verbal short-term memory. This is 2021. Short-term verbal memory is improvised when words can be chunked into larger units. Miller, 1956, suggests that the capacity of verbal short-term memory is determined by the number of chunks that can be stored in memory rather than by the number of items or the amount of information. But how does the improvement due to chunking come about? And is memory really determined by the number of chunks? One possibility is that chunking is a form of data compression. It allows more information to be stored in the available capacity. An alternative is that chunking operates primarily by re read Reintegration chunks exist only in long-term memory and enable the corresponding items in short-term memory to be reconstructed more reliably from a degraded trace. We review the data favoring each of these views and discuss the implications of treating chunking as data compression. Contrary to Miller, we suggest that memory capacity is primarily determined both by the amount of information that can be stored, but also by the underlying representational vocabulary of the memory system. 
Given the limitations of the representations that can be stored in verbal short-term memory, chunking can sometimes allow the information capacity of short-term memory to be exploited more efficiently. The idea that verbal short-term memory capacity is strongly influenced by the number of chunks that can be held in short-term memory has become part of conventional wisdom. Miller's 1956 famous work on chunking, the magic number seven, has argued the capacity of short-term memory is a function of the number of chunks that can be short, stored and not the number of items nor the amount of information. However, one important question has received very little attention. What is a chunk? Let us assume that there is in some sense in which FBI is a chunk and that this confers a memory advantage over an unfamiliar sequence of letters such as IFB. What are the properties of the representation of the chunk that lead to superior memory? Short-term memory must represent something other than the raw sequence of letters in that chunk. So what might that be? Miller himself acknowledged that we are not very definite about what constitutes a chunk of information. One simple suggestion comes from Schifrin and Nosovsky, who defined a chunk as a pronounceable label that may be cycled within short-term memory. They went on to point out that the label must have the critical property that it can be unpacked accurately into its original constituents. That is, chunking is performed by recoding chunks to the input into a different code in short-term memory. Bauer, 1970, made a similar suggestion to account for chunking in long-term memory. The idea of chunks as verbal labels would seem to apply most directly to those instances where memory is increased by an explicit recoding strategy. For example, Miller reported an unpublished study by Smith who taught himself to chunk binary digits by recoding them into octal digits. These binary digits could be recoded into single octal digits. Here, the octal digits becomes the label of the chunk in the three binary digits. Smith could recall about 12 octal digits, and by using the recoding method, he could recall about 36 binary digits. Even more elaborate chunking schemes were reported by Erickson. After extensive training, the participant was able to recall up to 79 digits, uh, through which achieved this by making extensive use of knowledge of running times to recode the digits. Training did not increase his short-term capacity. Despite extensive practice with digits, it did not increase his memory for consonants. The improvement appeared to be entirely attributed to the development of efficient chunking strategies. In this paper, we begin by re reviewing existing suggestions about the nature of chunks in short-term memory. The simplest proposals assume that chunking is achieved by recoding Recoding schemes are examples of data compression that ca capitalize on redundancy of the input to allow more items to be stored in the available capacity. We provide an extensive discussion of the data compression and its implication for models of short-term memory. Data compression can operate on multiple levels in both memory and perception. In addition to the situation-specific forms of compression involved, say in recoding binary digits as octal digits, compression will also play a role in acquiring and developing the representations that underlie short-term memory. For example, exact form of the linguistic representation supported by short-term memory will depend on the phonetic and phonological properties of one's native language. The representations in turn will constrain the scope for further compression of chunking or chunking. The distinction, the distinctive feature of data compression schemes is that compression must change the contents of short-term memory. The compressed code must replace the original message in short-term memory. An alternative view is that the benefits of chunking might arise from what is often termed red integration. According to this proposal, chunking does not change the contents of short-term memory. Chunks exist only in long-term memory, and long-term memory representations help recover degraded information from short-term memory. The evidence suggests that both compression and red integration can play a role in short-term memory, but that it's possible to differentiate between the two. We conclude by offering a revised account of chunking, we suggest that Miller was wrong to reject the idea that the capacity of verbal short-term memory is better viewed as being determined by the amount of information that can be stored. Chunking can help make better use of the available capacity, but its efficiency depends on the degree of redundancy in the input and the nature of the representational vocabulary underlying a particular memory system. For example, a store that can only represent words will be unable to hold optimally compressed copy of the input. Sometimes this will give the impression that capacity is determined by the number of chunks that can be stored, sometimes by the number of items, and sometimes by the amount of information that can be stored. Chunking and grouping. Following Miller, we make a distinction between chunking and grouping. Whereas chunks are determined by pre-existing representations of long-term memory, grouping is determined by the perceptual structure of the input. For example, a list of digits might be grouped into threes by inserting pauses 
between the digits, and this will en enhance serial recall. But these groups need not correspond to any existing representation of short and long-term memory. In contrast, an on-group list of letters can be parsed into chunks that have pre-existing representations. However, groupings can influence the information, the formation of chunks. For example, McLean and Gregg, 67, have participants learn list of 24 letters presented in groups of between one and eight letters. The timing of pauses and spoken recall reflected the pattern of the grouping, suggesting that the groups had become chunks in long-term memory. Uh, Bauer and Wiesent, 69, and Wiesent, 72, found that learning of repeated list of digits in a HEB 61 repetition paradigm was impaired when the group grouping of the digits changed from trial to trial. Similar, Schwartz and Bryden, 71, found that the initial items in a list varied across repetitions. There was no learning, whereas there was learning if the final items varied. It seems that in order to learn a chunk, the onset of the chunk must be marked by a grouping boundary, such as the beginning of a list. In each of these studies, grouping determines which items have become chunks in long-term memory. Terminology. The term chunk is used in several different ways. The representation of FBI in long-term memory might be called a chunk. So might the representation that codes the chunk in short-term memory. A chunk in short-term short memory might be coded by a label or perhaps by a pointer to a representation in long-term memory. It might also it is also possible that the representation of a chunk in short-term memory might have the same form as the representation of the chunk in long-term memory. This is the case with red integration theories that we will discuss later. Discussions of chunking rarely pay heed to these differences. Usually the term chunk appears to be used to refer to the combination of representations of the chunk in long-term memory and short-term memory. When discussing chunking in general terms, we will use chunk in that theory-neutral sense. However, Given that our aim is to specify the nature of the chunking process in more detail when presenting our theoretical analysis, we will try to be more specific. Although a concern here is with the influence of chunking on short-term memory, the concept of chunking appears in different guises in many areas of cognition. Interesting, in a recent review of the meanings of chunk and chunking, Gobe 2016, there is no mention of chunking in short-term memory. Many models of learning assume that learning involves creating chunks that can be combined into form a hierarchy of chunks, um, suggested that it was possible to reduce a common definition of chunks as a collection of elements having strong associations with one another, but weak associations with elements within other chunks. There's a more elaborate notions of chunking and act R. Chunks are viewed as schema-like structures containing pointers which encode their content. These approaches can be seen as investigations into the structure of chunk representation and long-term memory and how they are learned. The focus in the current paper is how these representations influence storage and short-term memory. Although as suggested by uh, Badly and Hitch 74, we assume that the content of verbal short-term memory are coded phonologically. The formal information theoretical arguments we present necessarily also apply to somatic or syntactic levels of representation. Finally, when we discuss the information capacity of short-term memory, we're using it in the same information theoretical sense as Miller. If short-term memory capacity of four bits, that means that the information retrieved from short-term memory can support a decision between 16 alternatives. Those alternatives could equally well be phonological, lexical, or semantic. That is, well, the formation of the representation in short-term memory may be assumed to vary the metric determining capacity must remain the same. Some of the most important concepts, um, here you have uh, basic concepts, you have looseness compression, uh, compressed in such a way the original meshes can be fully reconstructed. The strategy of recoding binary digits as octic digits in the form of looseness compression, if the message is known to contain only binary digits. Deletion code, form a new code from a chunk by deleting redundant information. Uh, lossness compression without checking like Hoffman code, replace more frequent items with shorter codes, lossy compression, compression which does not permit the original message uh, can be fully reconstructed, and red integration, reconstructing a degraded trace in short-term memory with reference to information in long-term memory. Um, minimum description length, a metric for comparing compression methods by computing the amount of information required to represent the entire message, which may consist of a coded message and a codebook. Codebook dictionary entries in the codebook 
link the input representation to compress to support encoding and decoding and self-information. The amount of information needed to code each item in the message as a function of its probability. Does verbal short-term memory have a constant chunk capacity? Miller argued that capacity of short-term memory was not determined by the amount of information that could be held in some store. Nowadays, we stand to think of computer storage in terms of information capacity, the number of bits or bytes. How did Miller come to the conclusion that short-term memory capacity was not a function of the amount of information that could be stored? His argument was based on data from studies of Hayes in 52 and Pollock in 53, comparing memory span for different types of materials. If span were determined by the amount of information required to store the items, then items selected from a large set should take up more capacity than items selected from a small set. If a message that is known to consist only of decimal digits, the identity of each digit requires 3.3 bits of information to transmit. One of the 26 letters of the alphabet requires 4.7 bits of, and one word form a set of 1,000 words requires 9.9 .9 bits. A system of capacity of about 10 bits should therefore be able to store approximately one word, two letters of the alphabet, three decimal digits, or 10 binary digits. According to span, should be lower for decimal digits than for binary digits, lower for letters, and lower still for words. Hayes measured memory span for a list of binary digits, decimal digits, letters, letters plus digits, and words from a set of 1,000. However, Hayes found that the number of items that could be held in memory was roughly equivalent for all classes of stimulus. A similar result was reported by Pollock. All three authors took this to imply that short-term memory storage was not limited by the information capacity as measured in bits from the chunking studied by Smith. And many similar studies, we know that the span can be increased by chunking. This conclusion, therefore, was the capacity that capacity is not determined by the number of individual items that can be stored, but by the number of chunks into which the measure message could be recorded, recoded. As we will see later, this conclusion is that capacity is not determined by information, depends on the assumption that people know the set of items that they will be tested on, and that they have developed an optimal code for representing those items in the particular experiments. The possibility that capacity might be determined by the number of chunks that can be stored was addressed more directly in a series of studies by Cohen and colleagues. The main aim of these studies has been to establish whether memory capacity is limited by the number of items that can be held in memory or by the number of chunks. In these experiments, participants learned chunks comprised of different numbers of words. They were then tested on either free recall, serial recall, or forced choice recognition of lists containing different numbers of chunks. In one example, Chen and Cohen, 2009, familiarized their participants with pairs of words and with single word tested by queued recall singletons and pairs of words were both deemed to comprise a single chunk. The words presented repeatedly until participants' performance was perfect. The familiarization phase was followed by a serial recall of the list of two, four, six, eight, or 12 singletons, or four or six learned pairs. Participants performed articular suppression during list presentation. Responses were scored in terms of the number of chunks, either singleton or pairs, and they were recalled in either the correct position strict scoring or anywhere in the list lenient scoring. The data indicated that recall appeared to be a function of the number of chunks in the input, but only under articulatory suppression and with lenient scoring. With strict scoring and without articular suppression, performance was worse for longer chunks. Cohen 2012 extended this work by using a greater range of chunk sizes and list lengths and found that similar pattern of results, thus contrary to Miller's suggestion, there's little evidence that memory capacity determined solely by the number of chunks that can be stored, except under the particular combination of articular suppression and free recall scoring. Data compression. A0 infinity, good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. Data compression. Intuitive notion of chunking is that it enables us to squeeze more information into a limited memory capacity. That is, chunking is an example of data compression. Data compression is only possible when there is redundancy in the signal. In a series of studies by Cohen and colleagues, considered in more detail later, subjects learn multi-word chunks, such as brick hat, assuming that neither brick nor hat appears alone in the experiment, the chunk contains redundant information. If the list contains brick and the next word must be hat, in order to retrieve the chunk brick hat, it would be sufficient to store only brick or only hat in short-term memory. But what about the case of chunking a random sequence of binary digits by recoding them into octal? By definition, a random sequence contains no redundancy and should therefore not be compressible. The redundancy follows 
from the fact that when coding a binary sequence verbally, we use only two words out of a set of thousands of possible words in the language. For example, there are well over 2,000 monosyllabic words in English, so each monosyllabic word could code approximately 11 bits. However, a word used to represent zero or one codes only one single bit. In effect, the remaining 10 bits are redundant. In principle, we could assign a separate monosyllabic word to each possible 11-bit binary, although this might take quite some time to learn. With a memory span of six words, it should then be possible to remember a sequence of 66 binary digits. The redundancy involved in coding binary numbers using two words is analogous to using each word in the 16-bit computer code a single bit. 15 of the bits would will be completely redundant. We will return to this point later. Whether the capacity of a memory system appears to be limited by chunks or information will depend on the granularity of representations available. The larger the units of storage, the more the system will appear to have a chunk-based limit. Miller suggested since the memory spans a fixed number of chunks, we can build larger and larger chunks, each chunk containing more information than before. Instead, we will argue the benefit of chunking is that it enables us to make more and more efficient use of the available information capacity, but that capacity is fixed. The feature shared by many forms of data compression is there are two parts to the compressed data, uh, compressed representation, the compressed code itself and the code book or dictionary that can be used to translate the compressed code back into its full form. For example, because the words chunk and compressed occur frequently in the manuscript, we can compress the text by replacing all occurrences of the word with a shorter sequence of letter, perhaps CH and CO. In order to recover the original text, we must also store in the code book CH equals chunk and CO equals compression, along with the compressed sequence. We might consider the entities in the code book to be analogous to the verbal labels of chunks posed by Schifrin in Nosowski. 94, the code book enables the compressed representation chunk labels to be converted back to its original form. Note that there need not be no systematic relationship between the form of the chunks in the original message and their codes. The code for a compressed could equally well be 97. So the number of bits required to code an item is given by its self-information. And so this goes on and on gets more, let me just look at pointers here. Pointers, it has often been suggested that short-term memory might store pointers to object rather than the copies. In context of visual short-term memory, we're explicit in drawing the parallel between their ideas and the use of pointers in computer languages like C. More recently, Huang and Awe, 2018, suggested that chunks might be represented in visual short-term memory by handles defined as context-free labels. The idea of a handle is also borrowed from computer terminology. In informational term, handles are more elaborate versions of pointers that might refer to a file or some other resource rather than simply a location in memory. In computing, the most basic notion of a pointer is as a fixed size object that stores a memory address. Storing pointers is more efficient than storing copies of objects, but does not offer further opportunities for compression. <coughs> Each object requires a pointer of the same size. More generally, a pointer is simply reference, more economical way of storing information in short-term memory to the store compressed codes, as might be generated by Hoffman coding, and use them in reference objects in long-term memory via codebook. Here we'll assume that a pointer or handle in short-term memory is just a code that selects an entry from the codebook. Pointers not, not provide a way of breaking free of the constraints of the amount of information that can be stored in a given memory system. We noted earlier that to store one word for a set of 1,000 would take 9.7 bits, but all that needs to be held in the store is the information required to decide which of the 1,000 words must be remembered. No matter how long the word and the lexicon are, the function of the pointer is to select the appropriate word from the set of possible words. Pointers cannot grow without limit, while a six-bit pointer would be generally be sufficient to address each phoneme in the language, a pointer that could address any possible representation that might be present in human long-term memory would have to contain a very large number of bits indeed. Such a system would need a huge capacity. Miller suggested that we could increase the amount of information stored in memory by creating larger chunks. However, increasing the size of the chunks or the amount of information that can be encoded in the chunks does not necessarily increase the amount of information that can be stored in short-term memory. Imagine learning the context of the Bible and the works of Shakespeare's two very big chunks. 
long-term memory would need to contain all the information necessary accurately to encode the sequences of words in each. However, given that these two chunks exist in long-term memory, a sequence of these chunks can be coded in short-term memory by one bit per chunk, so long as the sequence never contains anything other than those specific chunks. Contrary to Miller's suggestion, increasing the size of the chunk does not increase the size of either of the codes and the pointers required to represent them in short-term memory or the amount of information that can be stored in short-term memory. So it goes on and on with uh, compression in comparison to short-term memory and then starts to cover some evidence. So uh, it does have some relation to Bayesian inference from red integration and Bayesian inference. Let me just look very briefly at this. The idea that chunky may be a form of data compression conforms to the information informal notion that chunks help us squeeze more information into a given amount of memory. An alternative view of chunking is that representations of chunks exist only in long-term memory, but can be used to reconstruct a degraded trace in short-term memory by a process often referred to as red integration. Red integration offers a simple explanation of the fact that, for example, words are easier to remember than non-words, or that short-term memory for high-frequency words is better than for low frequency words, but can apply equally well to chunks at all other levels. According to this view, the contents of short-term memory are not recoded into chunks on input. Chunks in long-term memory come into play only at recall and do not alter the contents of short-term memory. Information of short-term memory is degraded as a consequence of forgetting items or chunks with Pre-existing long-term memory representations can be recovered on the basis of less information than would be required to cover items with no long-term memory representation. Red integration can be achieved by treating recall from memory as a process of Bayesian inference, whereby representation of chunks in long-term memory provide the priors that can be used to interpret a degraded representation in short-term memory. According to this view, short-term memory would be a passive process whose contents remain the same regardless of whether they correspond to chunks or not. Treating memory retrieval as a process of Bayesian inference has a long history in the study of memory. From this perspective, chunks in long-term memory are considered to be hypotheses with associated priors and recall involves computing the posterior probability of those chunks given the evidence in short-term memory, the identity of more probable representations, those corresponding to chunks in long-term memory can therefore be inferred from short-term memory on the basis of less evidence than would be required for less predictable representations. For example, the letters FBI form a familiar chunk with a higher prior probability of occurring together than a random sequence of letters. Given the equivalent amount of evidence from a degraded representation of short-term memory, the letters FBI will have a higher posterior probability the fact that FBI exists as a chunk in long-term memory will therefore benefit recall from short-term memory. For a computational perspective, the use of Bayesian inference to combine different sources of evidence is the same process as, for example, combining syntax and semantics or vision and touch. We can now distinguish between three broad classes of models employing chunking or compression. So ideal observer, an ideal observer for an introduction to the concept of an ideal observer, the Geisler 2003, would take full advantage of the statistical properties of the input to produce an efficient code that maximizes the amount of information that can be short and stored in short-term memory. It would not be limited to use of any particular form of encoding. It is not restricted, for example, to phonological or lexical code. Furthermore, the form of the codes would not necessarily have any systematic relationship to the form of the input. In the idea observer model, the number of items that could be stored would be a functional length of the code as measured in bits. The ideal observer has the same properties as the idea observer model of visual short-term memory fixed code. A more plausible model of verbal short-term memory would assume that short-term memory is a fixed representational vocabulary such as phonological code. Changing that code would be assumed to happen only slowly as might be the case when learning a new language. By this account, compression can only be achieved by recoding the input using the same representational vocabulary. For example, the phonological representation of binary digits could be recoded into phonological representations of octal digits by consulting the codebook in long-term memory. 
Recall then involves consulting the code book again to decode the encoded representations back into the input representation because the underlying representation will care, but it cannot be adapted. Compression will not be optimal. In red integration, in the case of red integration, the input is not recoded. The long-term memory code comes into play only at the point of retrieval, and there is no need for a code book. Recall from short-term memory will benefit from any form of constraining information prior stored in long-term memory. For example, priors derived from semantics or associated knowledge may lead to flying bird or more readily red integrated than crying bird. Chunking and red integration are not mutually exclusive. Imagine that the binary digits 100 have been recoded into short-term memory into a phonological code for the octal digit 4. Even if the phonological code is heavily degraded, it might be consistent with 4, sure, or more. The knowledge that short-term memory should contain only octal digits will help to retrieve the correct item. Both chunking and red integration will lead to improved memory for inputs containing chunks. We assume that linguistic encoding is optimized to code spoken language efficiently, but not flexible enough to dynamically adapt to statistical properties of the input of trial by trial basis. For example, even if the input on a particular trial is the same word repeated several times, it will not be able to take advantage of this redundancy and generate a more efficient representation that can be stored more economically in short-term memory. Note that the long-term memory decoding process in the chunking and red integration schemes are different. In a slot-based model such as proposed by Cohen, the long-term decoding, long-term memory decoding might simply consist of recognizing that item is stored in a slot corresponding to a chunk in long-term memory, and that replacing that index with a full chunk to generate a response. In the case of red integration, the output from short-term memory is not different encoding of the chunk, but a degraded form of the input chunk itself. And long-term memory is used to reconstruct the degraded representation or produce a more reliable response. Okay, so that's all I'm going to read from this article. Getting a little tired, probably going to wrap up. Is there infinity? Good to see you've been a while. Um, I had thought to read this one also. Um, let me at least share the link. This was why chunking should be considered an explanation for developmental change before short-term memory capacity and processing speed. 2012, the chunking hypothesis suggests that during the repeated exposure of stimulus material, information is organized into increasingly larger chunks. Many researchers have not considered the full power of the chunking hypothesis as both a learning mechanism and as an explanation of human behavior. Indeed, in developmental psychology, there's relatively little mention of chunking and yet it can be the underlying cause of some of the mechanisms of development that have been proposed. This paper illustrates the chunking hypothesis in the domain of non-word repetition, a task that is a strong predictor of a child's language learning, a computer stimulation, simulation of non-word reputation that instantiates the chunking mechanism shows that chunking causes task behavior to improve over time, consistent with children's performance, and chunking causes perceived changes in areas such as short-term memory capacity and processing speed that are often cited as mechanisms of child development. Researchers should be cautious when considering explanations of developmental data, since chunking may be able to explain differences in performance about the need of additional mechanisms and development. So, yeah, this is more interesting in terms of memory in relationship to uh, language acquisition, first language acquisition, and all these are good articles. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't have it in me to read anymore. So let me make some final word conclusion and... you just a review because I had mentioned some interesting things. So very interesting was at the beginning, you know, I, I first, I, I, you know, to bring this back because I talked about um, quantum theories of consciousness um, in the last few weeks, you know, uh, you know, the philosophy of science and revolutions. And then last week I did a deep dive into the cognitive revolution and chunking theory is a big part of the cognitive revolution. And uh, so, 
you know, trying to tie this together. Although at the beginning I had read from uh, Ginsburg and his, uh, you know, the biggest problems in physics, and then the paper trying to tie Everett's uh, multiverse theory of uh, your relationship to Ginsburg's three main problems of physics, which was quantum measurement, the direction of time, and consciousness, or we call the, the uh, physical representation of life. And then talking about the collapse uh, you know, that time is caused by the collapse of the wave function that causes the unidirectionality of time, that once the wave function is collapsed, that that event cannot go backwards in time. And then possibility that consciousness is what causes the wave function to collapse. And we saw a lot, almost all of the theories, you know, Hamrov and Penrose, and the various theories relate a connection of consciousness to the collapse of the wave function. And so chunking theory, and then also I, like I'd done the deep dive in monism like a month ago. So, you know, chunking and monism really go hand in hand. Oh, I didn't see any literature. I'll have to look into it and see if anyone else has talked about the relationship of chunking and monism in terms of uh, like dual aspect monism or the monad as a single unit being built up through chunks and then what would it look like in terms of chunking because there's chunking theory which is basically information theory you have the cognitive uh revolution which was largely built on uh, shannon's information theory but uh, you know chunking in most form is a form of information theory but it's neural plausible in terms of uh possibly correlating to neural mechanisms Although it's unclear how much has been shown the neural mechanisms of chunking. Um, also, I read that very interesting article about um, I read the very interesting article about time in time flow and chunking the relation of time flow and why time flow seems to be going quicker as people get older and time flows slower in relation to chunking that the reason why time flows slower when you're younger is because the chunks haven't formed and as you get older and so that interesting you know, more research in that that was a recent paper and interesting like relating that to narrative identity and I talked about that in uh, you know, the danger of the e-personality and identity formation and narrative identity and role identity, that narrative identity and role identity can see, be seen as chunks. When I have my various roles or the narrative of my identity, those are, in essence, chunks. And that those chunks have already been made, time appears to flow faster. But in relation, it could also be that the wave function has collapsed less that once the chunks are made, that the wave function collapses less, and the less the wave function collapses, um, the quicker time appears to flow. So it's some, just something to think about in trying to relate some of these various things I've been uh, talking about. Um, you know, the chess studies, I might go you know more back to chess in the chess studies. So like I read some of these papers, like more deep dive into chunking theory. So we see like the long history and some of these studies in the 50s and 60s. Um, but then looking at, you know, Gobe. So this is going to lead into what I'll be coming to in the next few weeks or next few months, which will be the science of expertise. And there's a relationship between the science of expertise and chunking as expertise is trained mechanisms where the reason why someone is an expert at something is because they have so to say chunks of pre-trained knowledge if it's physical like sports or music where you know, like motor memory so chunks could be mental in terms of memory or cognitive or chunks could be physical motor patterns 
of you know that are trained through physical practice and uh and you know even like uh the baseball in terms of like slowing down like chunking like like uh, like seeing a baseball coming at you or any form of like sports expertise that the reason why people have sports expertise is through chunking and combining information together so you know it's a lot of information there are a lot of things that i'm going to be tying together and then also like the multiple truth hypothesis and so there's also forms of chunking like the long-term memory and thinking like chunks you talk about behaviorism and free will or you know also the quantum mechanics trying to put some things together looking like chunks are options in terms of like decision makings where you have a series of chunks and minimal slots and one of the chunks gets selected in the slot and that could be termed in action in terms of like okay like you're lifting up the cup and bringing it to my mouth requires multiple pieces of action however that could be chunked together that you just like okay i decided to lift up the cup and drink and that's a chunk you know as opposed to like a baby learning motion and you know so all physical activity chunking is really universal for you know, like it, it has neural plausibility in terms of likely neural mechanisms you know neurons that wire together fi fire together wi uh, wire together fire together or uh, fire together wire together so that like a baby who's first learning how to move versus uh trained movements they're chunk they've been wired together to expertise and then the the dual aspect of physical expertise and mental expertise that both would be formed in chunking. And then we look at, you know, Gobe and the, uh, the computational models, like also the chess studies of chunking, where basically they've written computer programs to model human behavior for theories of how chunking might work. And then, you know, like the, the EPOM and the CREST theory, where CREST you have a new thing like chunks where you call schemas and templates. And so also I talked about linguistics and like the Chomskyan theory where you had these structures of how things are formed, like subject, verb, object, where you have like schemas and then you put words into them, which may be how like chat GPT works as opposed to language, they're more like chunks. So it's not necessarily like, you know, like I, subject, verb, object, but things happen more in chunks. And then possibly the, the, the rules, the higher order structures are also chunks. And how does it work where you just have an informational chunk, like a phrase versus a higher order rule, which is also a chunk. And if you're going to say like a higher order rule and just a pure memory unit are both chunks how does a higher order rule take precedence or organize chunks and then you also have um you know the uh schemas and templates where you have fill in chunks um which has a lot to do with language like you know grammar um a lot of different skills where the action is 90, you know, majority of the same, but one element is interchangeable. So what does it mean to have a chunk with an interchangeable part in terms like phraseology skills? Um, and so there's experimental evidence from a psycho uh, psychometric level that certainly these schemas exist that there has to like it like it's it, it it's very likely that there's templates and schemas that have interchangeable parts and you could retrieve a structure that has an interchangeable fill in part however the exact mechanism for how that works is unclear so i mean that's where you had, like the epom4 and the crest model where you had computer programs that tried to say well how could you create a chunk and the chunk keeps on getting larger, but then the chunk has interchangeable units within it. 
And is like, are all chunk schemas or interchangeable? Is there a difference between chunks? And then you know, we talked about recall in depth of their various recall mechanisms and how recall works. You know, if you if you think of the brain like in neural mechanisms where you have like a whole bunch of neural circuits and a neural circuit could have a predetermined chunk that could contain information or of different sorts that could be motor memory or mental information. And some of them are full, some of them are templates, some of them are schemas. And then also, so you have a chunk that would be visual and auditory information. So right now, you know, all five of my senses. So you think like, oh, time's going really slow. I'm at an event and I have taste, smell, and there's different people that have memory skills like cooks. Some people could taste a dish and separate the smell and remember, you know, the ingredients and remember the meal. It's like, oh, I remember that time we met 10 years ago and we went to this restaurant and this is what we ate. So, I mean, there's the five senses, obviously, touch, smell, taste, hearing, and seeing. Um, however, in one time, all of my senses are operating at the same time. And if those chunk together into one memory unit where I have some time component, time stamp, that there's, you know, what, what would create like a time stamp in my memory that what I heard and saw and, you know, possibly taste, tasted, smelled, or felt were time stamped into the same chunk. And, you know, even just visual cues in terms of like learning information. And so like, you know, like uh, putting letters together in a worm or, or chunking. So it's all unique forms of chunking. Um, and there's interesting research into neural mechanisms. But as of now, there's no neural mechanisms for language, uh, for memory structures. That, uh, you know, what does memory look like if, your know, memory like in a computer where you could have your know, Boolean logic circuits and um, on-off switches that create information storage and information retrieval in the way the computer works that it's proposed that that could possibly exist through neural circuits. Although the evidence for it is only correlative, that there's no mechanism it's just speculation. There's only correlative. Um, I mean, you could look at memory and the neural correlates and MRI scans or various stations or lesia or amnesia studies and various things, but there's no actual mechanism known for the brain. It's just neuroplausible. However, memory is likely to be some form of chunking. And if it is in a materialist aspect, most people believe it'd be a mechanism similar to how the computer operates. Although, two possibilities. One thing, from a materialistic perspective, it's possible that the brain stores memory in a completely different way than the computer does. And it's not some form of like Boolean circuit logic and uh, you know, logic gates. Um, or you know, it could be the brain as a receiver. And even in terms like a monistic perspective of how the computer stores data, that uh, you know, the, like we just... The, you could say like the neural correlates of consciousness, you have the computer, the machine correlates of information, but whether the information is actually stored in the electrical signals or some sort of monistic element where you have a dual aspect monistic element. So that's elements I want to dive more into. So I'm going to wrap up. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, my numbers are going down. But, uh, you know, stay active, join the Discord, make some comments if people are interested in the research. I think I have another few months of research, and I'm going to have all this information out there, like the due diligence. I mean, the research is endless. But, like, you know, to, to really put out some of the things I want to put out, I have to do the due diligence. And, like, you can see today, I'm on to new theories that haven't been researched. So I'm not part of any institute or university, but like, you know, talking about the collapse of the wave function in relationship to chunking and time passing, uh, narrative identity, time slowing down, 
putting different things together and having done the due diligence to know like you know, William James and the origins of these concepts, the empirical testing to know what's the current standard state of knowledge and um, so I'm getting kind of excited and like I want to get back into writing although right now I'm not sure like you know, my audience my viewership is down so I'm not even sure if anyone's going to read what I write so I'm just going to keep up with the research I'm going to keep on doing the weekend reviews and, and uh, you know going over material I have a good few months of papers I've already looked at related to the multiple truth hypothesis and chess studies. So I might try next week to go a little bit into the science of expertise, or I might go into things related to the multiple truth hypothesis. Um, I still have things like the holographic brain, Bergson, um, I still have like theories of truth. Um, I have a lot of stuff to go over, like the least action principle. So, you know, I'll keep myself busy. We can review. I've been doing like an average of like five hours of reading papers each week on We Can Review. So, you know, if people enjoy this, I'm glad you enjoy it. You know, reach out, uh, make comments, uh, or, or you just watch the content and, uh, you know, try to timestamp it over the next few days. And I'm feeling good about my research. It's hard to show to give some direction, but I'm going to bring this back to the multiple truth hypothesis and then hopefully show how I'm going to be, you know, like interdisciplinary study in bringing divergent fields together to put together, you know, more stuff. So you have, your, you know, Duvid's weekly symposium. So Dave, you appreciate you joining Greek in review yesterday. I mean, last week. Um, and, you know, so, you know, join the chat and you know, appreciate your feedback I haven't used that. Like, I don't know if I have enough of an audience like who would read the content, but I appreciate you also you know, forward me that information and in, in the um, you know, making the uh, transcripts of the streams and even translations into other language. So I don't want to get ahead of myself. So I still have more viewership. You know, my viewership is still kind of minimal, and I still have more research. I want to perfect things, but I appreciate it. So. God bless. I'm going to sign off. I ended up not going to that engineering conference in auto tech this week. There's an engineering show this week on like from concept to manufacturer. I think I've went in past years. So, you know, different companies that manufacture for you or ideas that like, you know, from printing out circuit boards to various products. So, you know, general manufacturing conference where they have a whole bunch of companies where theoretically, you know, you could have your idea and you will be able to connect it to the companies to uh, you know, that would either produce things for you of various elements, fabrication to uh, uh, your computer, financial and uh, um, your know, engineering design and other aspects. I've went in past years. I may not go this week because, uh, you know, God forbid there's big construction on the highway to get out to the, uh, you know, Novi in my house. And then the week after is the Foam Expo, which I've went, you know, all the last few years to the Foam Expo. Although I'm feeling I may not even go to the Foam Expo because like, uh, um, you know, God forbid the construction, which, uh, you know, just makes it a hassle to for the drive. So, but tomorrow, I think I got Michael and we're going to do another introduction to Jewish prayer. So hopefully that'll be tomorrow at three. Ethan Ralph reached out to me about coming on the kill stream for a debate. I told my debate, you know, JQ, happy to do that, defend the Jewish people or have a conversation or even another topic that, you know, like multi, uh, uh, multiculturalism, immigration. I'm not sure, you know, but we'll see if that happens. If that's so, you know, I'll, I'll probably, you know, post that. And uh, so God bless. Have a great week. Signing off, you know, Church of Entropy. Blessings to her. But, uh, you know, keeping, keeping the program going solo. So God bless. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.